Author's Preface, a foreword of warning for vagabonding down the Andes, being the narrative of a journey, chiefly afoot, from Panama to Buenos Aires. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elliot Swanson. Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. Author's Preface. A Foreword of Warning. A Foreword of Warning. A few years ago, when I began looking over the map of the world again, I chanced to have just been reading Prescott's Conquest of Peru, and it was natural that my thoughts should turn to South America. My only plan at the outset was to follow, if possible, the old military highway of the Incas from Quito to Cusco. Every traveler, however, knows the tendency of a journey to grow under one's feet. This one grew with such tropical luxuriance that before it ended I had spent not eight months, but four full years, and had covered not merely the ancient Inca Empire, but all ten republics and three colonies of South America. A considerable portion of this journey was made on foot. The reader may be moved to ask why. First of all, I formed the habit of walking early in life, developing an inability to depend on others in my movements. Then, too, the route lay through many regions in which no other animal than man can make his way for extended periods. Moreover, there was the question of caste. It is one of the drawbacks of South America that a white man cannot efface himself and be an unobserved observer, as on the highways of Europe. Social lines are so sharply drawn that he who would be received in frank equality by the peon, by the great mass of the population, must live and travel much as they do. Merely to ride a horse lifts him above the communality and sets a certain barrier, akin to race prejudice, between him and the foot-going hordes among whom my chief interest lay. At best, these lines of caste are a drag on observant travel in South America. The gringo can never get completely out of his social stratum. His very color betrays him. It is always, Good morning, mister, too often with a silly, patronizing smile from the gente decente class. Among the rest, his mere appearance makes him as conspicuous as a white man among West Indians. Never can he be an inconspicuous part of the crowd, as in Europe. To get in touch with the common people requires actually living in their huts and tramping their roads. The dilettante method of approaching them, slumming, will not do. The disadvantages of the primitive means of locomotion in wild regions, such as the Andes, are obvious. But the advantages of walking over more ordinary methods of travel are no less decided. Though the means be more laborious, the mind is far sharper for facts and impressions while on foot than when lolling half asleep on a horse or in a train. The mere pleasure of looking forward to his arrival, subconsciously building up before his mind's eye a picture of his goal, complete in every detail, not to mention that of looking back upon the journey from the comfort of his own armchair, is ample reward to any true victim of wanderlust. Thousands of men, supplied with all the comforts money can buy, roam the earth from top to bottom, and are supremely bored in the process. It is the struggle, the satisfaction of physical action, the accomplishment of something greatly desired, and for a long time seemingly impossible that brings real pleasure, that makes every step forward a satisfaction, every little success in the advance and enjoyment. For after all, real travel is real labor. He who journeys only so far as he can without exertion, who shirks the difficulties, will know no more of the real joy of travel than he who lives without toil, seeking pleasure only, and finding but the cold, dead body thereof, without ever realizing the joy of life itself. As in ancient times, so it is in the Andes today. Distance cannot be covered without fatigue. On the other hand, there is the compensation of knowing completely the country through which one passes, storing away in the mind a picture of each long-anticipated spot, indelible as long as life lasts. The Andean traveler will know the pleasures as well as the drawbacks of the journey of earlier, more primitive days, the joy of evening hours when suddenly 
from the summit of the last toilsome ascent he discovers spread out in its smiling valley below the peaceful village in which he is to take his night's repose or when he perceives from afar gilded by the rays of the setting sun the towers of the famous city so long sought hours of a vivid joy that few experiences can equal thanks again to the barriers of caste he who would really know the masses of latin america should not only live with them but should dress as plainly as they do it is hard at best to get into more than superficial contact with the south american indian and to some extent his traits like his blood run through all classes the upper caste latin american is by nature a masquerader he treats a distinguished stranger as a real estate agent pilots a prospective buyer about the streets of some new berlin cleverly sidestepping the drawbacks he shows only his real self when he is not on parade before he learns that he is under observation and claps on the mask he is always instantly at hand when he wishes to show himself and he rates every man's importance by the height of his collar and the color of his spats cloaking himself in pretense accordingly he who does not wish to know the truth about a latin american country should attire himself in a frock coat a silk hat and appear with letters of introduction to the people of importance his hosts will take him in regal style along two or three of the best streets and into the show places will gild every garbage can that is likely to fall under his august eye and will shield him from all the unpleasantness of life as carefully as the guardians of the princess in the fairy tale hence the mere lack of ostentation the mere appearance of being one of the negligible masses goes far toward giving the unassigned wanderer a vast advantage in getting at the unmasked truth in avoiding false impressions over men of more brilliant mind and better powers of observation my purpose in journeying through south america was primarily to study the ways of the common people i am no more fond of the unsavory either in physical contact or on the printed page than are the rest of my fellow countrymen but every occupation has its drawbacks no traveler through interior south america with whom i have yet spoken has found conditions better than herein indicated though for some strange reason it appears to be the custom to shield readers from this to tell intimate facts only privately and to falsify public utterances by glossing over all the crudities the fact is that the man who has spent four years afield south of the rio grande and has come back to tell the tale can only shake with laughter when an exponent of the germ theory speaks explorers with millionaire fathers-in-law tell us that the out-of-the-way traveler to such a country should take with him numberless supplies from sheets to after-dinner coffee it is the best plan for those whose aim is to live in comfort or a still better plan is to remain at home far be it from me to censure the man who journeys southward for other purposes for taking with him all the comforts he can carry but he who seeks to know the people intimately must not merely tramp their trails he must become in so far as is possible physically one of them we should care little about the impressions of a european studying life in the united states who lived in his own tent and subsisted on canned goods he brought with him however much we might admire his foresight it may be argued that by following the plan i have outlined i saw only the lower class and do not report conditions among the more fortunate inhabitants yet after all the peon the indian the masses comprise nine-tenths of the population of south america there are fewer persons of pure european blood between our southern boundary and cape horn than in the state of new york and by no means all of these live in comparative comfort the well-dressed minority of latin america has often had its spokesman numerically and on the whole the condition of these is of as little importance in the general scheme of things as are the doings of our four hundred in the life of our hundred million i have therefore summed up briefly the ways of this small if conspicuous class and its ways are so monotonously alike throughout the length and breadth of latin america that this lumping together is not difficult the chief problem in any country is the status of the great mass of population the condition of the common people 
and it is to this that I have almost entirely confined myself in the ensuing pages. Have you read Blank's book on Brazantine? A noted French traveler once asked me. He says all the Brazantinos are immoral and dishonest. You and I, who have been there, know this is true. But those are things one tells to a circle of friends that one shares over a pipe at the club. Ma, in fin, ca ne se scrip, ah? It is due, I suppose, to a lack of Gallic finesse that I have never been able to grasp this point of view. Why the plain truth should be reserved for the fireside and personal friends and should be kept from one's friends of the printed page is beyond my fathoming. At any rate, I have made no attempt to follow that plan. I try not to expect everything in South America to be exactly as it is in the United States. I should, indeed, have considered that a misfortune. After all, I went south to see the Latin American as he is, not with the hope of finding him another American merely speaking another language. I have tried to judge him by his own ideals and history, fully aware that in the latter he did not have a fair shake rather than by our own. Yet the traveler cannot entirely lay aside his native point of view. That would imply that he was not convinced of the wisdom of his own way of life, and the question would arise, why not change? Neither the Latin American nor the American point of view is all right or all wrong. They are simply different. Because we criticize does not necessarily mean that we claim superiority, though I am reminded of the American resident in South America who asserted that, were he not convinced of his superiority to his neighbors, he would forthwith tie a millstone about his neck and jump in where it was deep. But the traveler who does not express his own honest opinions loses, as the Brazilians say, a splendid chance to keep silent. I have therefore set down my real heartfelt impressions. These may be false, even worthless. The reader has full right to reject them in toto, but at least they have the virtue of frankness. Moreover, South America has had its fair share of apologists. Virtually every country publishes at intervals a luxurious volume of self-praise that resembles, in its point of view, the yearbook of a high school or college class. Trade journals are constantly painting things South American in the rosiest of colors. It has been the traditional policy of certain branches of our government to cultivate Latin American friendship by a myopic disregard of all the shadows in the picture. In our own capital there exists a criminally optimistic society for the propagation of emasculated information concerning our neighbors to the south. Among distinguished strangers from our own land who have visited Latin America, there seems to have been a conspiracy to whitewash everything an agreement to have all they see or experience bathed, barbered, and manicured before permitting it to make its bow to our public. The enormous majority of descriptions of South America resemble the original about as much as a portrait resembles the sitter after a professional photographer has finished with it. I do not know what the Latin American may have been in other years. Perhaps he was the splendid fellow many make him out. I am merely telling as charitably as possible how I found him. I am not interested in winning or losing his friendship, in selling him goods, or in gaining his moral support to our governmental activities. I am interested only in giving as faithful a picture as possible of my experiences with him. There are good things, praiseworthy things in South America. If in the telling these have been overshadowed by the less laudable, it is because the latter do so overshadow in point of fact. Obviously, the experiences of four years even in Latin America cannot be crowded within the covers of a volume or two. I have therefore confined myself within certain limits. History, for instance, has been almost completely eliminated. I have taken for granted in the reader a certain basic knowledge of South America, though in the case of many even well-educated Americans, this seems to be taking much for granted. I have passed as briefly as possible over those things which are already to be found within the walls of our libraries, confining myself so far as possible to that which I have personally seen or experienced. I have, however, dipped as freely into the literature of each country 
as into the life itself, and in the few cases where I have made use of facts so acquired, I have not taken of my cramped space to acknowledge the debt in words. For similar reasons, though it may seem ingratitude, I have not taken the reader's time to thank individuals by name for personal kindnesses. They were many, but the doers know that their deeds were appreciated, without thanks being detailed here, or if they do not, it is the fate of those who lend passing assistance to world roamers to take their reward in inner satisfaction. The modern reader is prone to tire quickly of mere description, but nature is so important a factor in the Andes that it cannot be briefly passed over. Personally, I like an occasional sunset, like it so much that I sometimes go to the unrequited toil of attempting to paint one. The reader who prefers his stage bare, as in Shakespeare's day, can easily glide over those pages. If he does, without stage setting, however, and relies only on his imagination, his picture is apt to be false, for the imagination has very faulty materials from our school books and the tales of wandering Munchausens to work upon. Yet after all, even with all one's effort, it is sad how little of the splendid scenery, the atmosphere, the charm of it all, for in spite of its drawbacks, South America has charm, one can get down on paper. This was not a voyage of discovery, or rather, if there was discovery, it was only of a different stratum of life, and not of new lands. My plan was not so much to find unexplored country in the ordinary sense, as to go by hitherto unmentioned paths through inhabited and known regions, the out-of-the-way corners of familiar cities and the undescribed gathering places of mankind. In that sense, South America is still chiefly unexplored. Lastly, let me give fair warning that this is no tale of adventures. I would gladly have had it otherwise. I sought eagerly for experiences that would make the story more worth the telling. I tried my sincerest to get into trouble, all in vain. In Mexico, I marched peacefully about between two falling empires. In Guatemala, I strolled nonchalantly among Estrada Cabrera's band of hired assassins. In Honduras, I chatted with the leaders of the latest revolution. In Colombia, I met many cripples of the Civil War, but recently ended. In Ecuador, I found only peace and apathy in the very streets through which an ex-president and his henchmen had been dragged to death a few months before. In Peru all was love and brotherhood, until after I left. In the Bolivian Chaco, wild Indians wiped out a company of soldiers not a hundred miles from where I was passing in placid unconcern. In the Paraguayan capital, I sat with the man who not a year before had captained a particularly bloody coup d'etat. In Brazil, I passed through two sections virtually in anarchy, and in one of its state capitals watched a riot that came perilously near being a revolution. In Venezuela, I strolled serenely through the very ranks of revolters, mere days before the leader and many of his band were killed. Yet hardly once did I knowingly come near personal violence. The fact is that South America is atrociously safe. Dangers are mostly those of popular novelists, from the pages of travelers who succumb to the natural temptation to draw the longbow after the fashion of Marco Polo. It may be that there was a better way to have told this story than as a day-to-day -day narrative. But even at that, it could not honestly have escaped a certain monotony, for monotony is ingrained in the fiber of South America. Not to have reported the journey chronologically would have made for succinctness, but at the expense, perhaps, of truth. It may be wearisome to hear of virtually every night's stopping place, yet as the traveler through the interior must stop at almost every hut along the way, the sum total of these is a description of the whole country. If the story appears sketchy and piecemeal, it is because I have denied myself, erroneously perhaps, even the Barovian privilege of transposing or inventing enough to make a smoother and more interesting story. A book of travel cannot have something always happening. That is the privilege of fiction. The novelist can forge his materials to his liking. 
the travel writer is very limited even in opportunity to amalgamate his material being very hard and non-plastic even to transpose and combine incidents is often to falsify for what is true in one spot may never have been so a hundred miles further on the necessity of suddenly abandoning this task for other and more important duties has made it impossible to give it final polish to eliminate much that should have been eliminated and to improve much of what remains harry a frank plattsburgh new york august first nineteen seventeen End of Author's Preface, A Foreword of Warning, read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter One of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter One Up to Bogota. When we had made a stake as Canal Zone policemen, Leo Hayes and I sailed from Panama to South America. On board the Royal Mail steamer, the waist of the ship to which our tickets confined us, was a screaming pandemonium of West Indian Negroes homeward bound from canal digging, and a veritable chaos of their baggage and household goods, and gods, ranging from tin trunks to pet monkeys, from battered phonographs to plush-bound Bibles. We preempted deck space for our suitcases and sat down upon them. It chanced to be the same day on which, eight years before, I had set out on a vagabond journey around the world. Twenty-four hours after our last zone handshake, we marched down the gangplank among the little brown policemen of Cartagena, Colombia, and fought our way through a mob of dock loafers to the toy railroad train that eventually creaked away into the city. Our revolvers and cartridge belts we wore out of sight. Uniforms and nightsticks no longer figured in our equipment. But the campaign costume we had chosen, broad felt hats, Norfolk jackets, and breeches of olive drab, and the leather leggings common to the zone, were evidently more conspicuous here than we had suspected. For about us, Wherever we moved, sounded awestruck stage whispers. Psst! Policia de la Zona! The ancient city and fortress of Cartagena, and for America it is old indeed, squats on a sandy point jutting out far into the blue Caribbean, with a beach curving inland on either hand, a sea wall beside which that of Panama seems a plaything of massive, weather-tarnished, ocean-lashed stones brown-gray with age, with stern, dignified old gateways, encloses the city in a regular form. On its top is a promenade varying in width from a carriage drive to a maneuver field. Outside, on the languidly garrulous beach, little thatched huts drifted together under the coconut groves. Inside, dust-heap streets have long since lost most of the cobbled paving of their Spanish birthright. The narrow, inadequate tile sidewalks are far from continuous, and the rules of life are so lax that only the constant sweep of sea air amounts for old age amid conditions that should bring death early and often. Long before we reached our hotel, we regretted our penuriousness in scorning cabs and carriers. Not only did the weight of our suitcases double every few yards in the leaden tropical air and the labyrinthian way through the city elude us at every turn, but at least a score of ragged boys trailed respectfully but hopefully in our rear with the anticipatory manner of an opera understudy waiting in the edge of the wings for the principal to break down on the next note a generous percentage of the population crowded the doorways and children raced ahead to summon forth their families to behold what was apparently the most exciting thing that had taken place in cartagena in months evidently a caballero bearing his own material burdens was a strange sight in south america the populace stared fixedly in as impersonal a way as ruminating oxen and every few yards half-naked children evidently abetted by their elders swarmed out upon us with shrill cries of one shilling we were soon reminded that we had left behind our power as well as our emoluments the proprietress whose oily hebrew smile greeted us at the hotel door was none other than one long 
wanted on the zone on the charge of running a disorderly house. The room she had assigned us was enormous, but the furnishings were scant and thin, the beds mere strips of canvas, as befits a country of perennial midsummer. While we unpacked and shaved, a ragged brown urchin slipped in with a Barranquilla newspaper. In a characteristic burst of generosity, Hayes tossed him double the price demanded, only to discover, just after the vendor was out of reach, that the pauperous little sheet was twenty days old. It was a bunco game, so aged it had grown new again. Maria, the chambermaid, already in the sere and yellow leaf, shuffled in frequently, supremely indifferent to our scantiness of attire. Now and then several younger females of decidedly African ancestry strolled by as nonchalantly, one by one, to inquire whether we had any soiled clothes to wash, and loitered about in a manner to suggest that the question was meant to be taken figuratively. This friendliness was the general attitude of all the town. Outwardly, at least, we were shown no discourtesy, and there was little confirmation of the reputed hatred of Americans. Yet almost from the moment of our landing we noted that Colombians seemed to avoid speaking to us beyond the requirements of business or the cut-and-dried forms of their habitual politeness. Still, with only the anemic candle to flicker its pale shadows on the enclosing wall of the droning tropical night, we settled down to the conclusion that Colombia, alleged the deadly enemy of all things American and heretical, was less black than she has been painted. We reached the land of easy money. Merely to step into a bank with a five-dollar bill was to emerge with a bulging roll of five hundred dollars. We could not repress a millionaire swagger when we tossed a hundred-dollar note on the counter to pay for a pair of socks, though it quickly wilted when a few nickel pieces were tendered in change. Hayes dropped into a dingy little hole in the wall to buy a cigar, but though it was certainly the only five-dollar cigar he had ever strutted behind, he soon tossed it away in disgust. The newcomer is apt to be startled when he hears a Colombian casually mention paying ten thousand dollars for a mule, until he realizes that the speaker is really talking in cents. The Colombian notes, even those of the intrinsic value of our copper coin, are elaborately engraved, and the wonder grew how the government could afford to print them. For those who will exert themselves, even in the tropics, there is a splendid view of all Cartagena from La Bopa, a hill standing forth Gibraltar-like above the inner harbor, on its nose a massive old church and fortress combined. From it, the cruder details of the town, the startling pink and sky-blue of newer walls and balconies, fade to the general inconspicuousness of the more age-mellowed houses. The ancient red tile roofs blend artistically into the patches of green sward and the light pink of royal ponciana trees. The whole city, edged by the landward-leaning coconut palms, is framed by a sea stretching away on either hand to the world's end. The half-grown Colombian of forty in charge of La Popa and the telescope and telephone by which incoming ships are reported changed gradually from canny distrust to garrulous curiosity and invited us to inspect his entire domain. The purely academic dislike of Americans we soon found was overcome with little effort by those who addressed men of his class in their own tongue. Conversation at length drifted to the sanitation and Panama, Colombia's rebel province, as he called it. The fort keeper listened to our tales in loose-jawed wonder and summed up his opinions of such gringo superstitions with, But here we do none of those things, senores. The mosquitoes prick us every day, yet we are well. Our strange notion that disease could be carried by a mere insect was as absurd to him as was to us his own habit of relying for health on the plaster saint in the vaulted fortress church. Even in Panama, information on travel in Colombia had been almost as lacking as trustworthy reports on the interior conditions of Mars. Only once in my five months on the canal zone had I run across even an ostensible source of knowledge. He was a native of Cali, and his answers had been distinctly Latin American. Does it rain much in your country? I had asked him. Si, sí, senor. When it rains, it is wet. When it doesn't, it's dry. Is it cold? Si, sí, senor. In the cold places, it is cold, and in the hot places, it is hot. 
No hay reglas fisas. There are no fixed rules. How far is it from Cali to Popayán? Ah, it is not near, senor. Uh, about a hundred miles, perhaps? Si, sí, senor, just about that. Isn't it rather about three hundred? Pues, senor, perhaps just about that. There the matter had stood when we sailed. Once arrived in Cartagena, however, we found that a toy train left the next day for Calamar in the Magdalena, and that a second-class ticket to Honda, wherever that was, cost two thousand dollars. We had barely crammed ourselves into two seats of the little piano-box car next day when Hayes started up with a snort and thrust the morning newspaper across at me. Done into English, the item that had drawn his attention ran, Someone who merits our entire confidence informs us that yesterday there were in the city, taking photographic views of our forts and most important edifices, two foreign individuals who wore the clothing of military cut of the cloth called khaki and felt hats with wide brims. This costume, as has been described to us, is that of the Army of the United States. Can these really be American soldiers, or has a great outward similarity caused the superstitious imagination to see that which in reality does not exist? We cannot assure it. We had hardly aspired to be taken for a hostile invasion from the dreaded colossus of the North. It was characteristic of Latin American thinking processes for the paragrapher to fancy that spies, for such the term covertly dubbed us, would appear in uniform. We had yet to learn, however, that the makers of newspaper and public opinion, in so far as it exists in South America, would often rank in our own land as irresponsible and poorly trained schoolboys. The miniature train ambling away in a morning unoppressive in spite of the tropical sunshine wound through a thin jungle, sometimes climbing, more often stopping, at languorous, staring, thatched villages in a region suffering from drought but of fertile appearance. By and by the jungle gave way to what might almost have been called prairie, slightly rolling and used only for grazing. Toward noon, beyond some swampy land, we clattered into the carelessly whitewashed town of Calamar, drowsing on the sandy bank of the Magdalena, here a half-mile wide. Even before we jolted to a halt, the car filled with a struggling mob of beggars, shrill-voiced boys and tattered men, eager in their indolent tropical way for some easy errand. Such unwanted energy soon evaporated. The population was of as mongrel a mixture as the yellow dogs that slunk about in the shade of trees and house walls, and appeared to hold identically the same attitude toward life. At length, in the cool of the following evening, the Alicia began to plow her way slowly upstream. She was a three-story craft with a huge paddle wheel at the stern. Her lower deck crowded with unassorted freight, domestic animals, engines, and wood piles with deckhands, native passengers, pots and pans, and unattractive habits. Among the most conspicuous of the latter were those of an open-air den that served as the general kitchen. Twice a day a small tub of rice, boiled plantains, and some meat mystery, all cooked in a single kettle, was carried out on one of the barges alongside, where it was fallen upon not only by the lower deck passengers, but by the even darker-skinned deckhands, dressed in what had once been trousers and the wear-forever shirts so popular in the region. A few owned spoons and others a piece of coconut shell, but these were no handicap to the majority armed only with the utensils of nature. Little had we suspected the meaning of second class on the Magdalena. Luckily, the English agent of the line had been so shocked at the sight of our tickets, particularly, perhaps, in the hands of Hayes, who was in appearance the hero of any of our modern romantic novels stepping bodily forth from the cardboard of any of our popular illustrators that he had ordered the steward to overlook the color thereof and treat us as cabin passengers on the upper deck the steamer was open from stem to stern a dining table stretched along her center and the sides lined by frail box-like staterooms the little canvas cots narrow as the charpoys of india 
used alike by passengers and the unlaundered youths that passed for stewards, were dragged to any part of the craft that suited the whims of the sleeper. Our drinking water was the native Magdalena, sometimes carelessly filtered through a porous stone. There was even a shower bath, when the paddle wheel was elevating enough of the chocolate-colored river water to permit it to function, but it generally took most of the morning and all the stewards to find the misplaced key. Frequently, for days at a time, there were only two of us to occupy the cane rocking chairs that embellished the upper foredeck. Here, day after day, we watched the monotonous yellow bank unroll with infinite slowness, like a film clogged in a machine. The country, flat, considerably wooded, and characterless, stood only a few feet above the river, its soil sandy, though not without fertility, with occasional clearings and many immense spreading trees. Here and there, on the extreme edge of the stream, hung a few scattered thatched villages, all apparently engaged in the favorite occupation of doing nothing, living on the few fruits and vegetables that grew themselves, and drinking the yellow Magdalene pure. At such times there was nothing left but to while away the languid hours in perfecting our plans for the journey ahead. For once I had chanced upon a traveling companion who had actually started when the hour of departure came, and who bade fair to pursue the expedition to the bitter end. Leo Hayes had first seen the light, such as it is in Missouri, six months later than I, but had overcome that initial handicap by deflecting the sun's rays in many a varying climb. The schools had early scowled upon him, or he upon them, and he had retaliated by gathering in his own way much that the schools have never hoarded away in their impregnable warehouses. The gleaning had carried him far afield in social strata as well as physical distance, but it had left him unburdened with the bric-a-brac of life so dear to the bourgeois soul. Wasteful of money and the petty things of life, he was never wasteful of life itself. He was one of those who look at the world through a wide-angled lens. There is a breadth of vision gained in an existence varying from hobo printer and editor in our pulsating southwest to sugar estate overseer in the Guianas, from the forecastle to the Moro villages of the Philippines, that makes a formal education seem cramped and restricted by comparison. To those who did not know the canal zone in its halcyon days, a mere corporal of police demanding of himself the ability to converse intelligently a half hour on any subject from astronomy to Norse literature, from heraldry to Urdu philosophy, may seem a fantastic figure. To the experienced zoner it is commonplace. On Sunday morning the entire village of Sambrano, headed by its curate and dressed in every imaginable misfit of sun-bleached gaiety, swarmed on board and subjected us to a leisurely detailed examination that gave us the sensation of being museum exhibits. The Alicia was soon off again, and we came to the conclusion that the town was migrating en masse. A few hundred yards beyond, however, we tied up to the bank once more and waited a long hour while all Zambrano took leave of the priest. Every inhabitant under fifteen kissed his hand, which each of the women pressed fervently, some several times over, after which the men approached him in procession, padre and layman throwing an arm about each other's neck and slapping each other some seven times each between the shoulder blades. It was only the customary Colombian abrazo and the formality of seeing the curate a little way on his journey. Meanwhile, our half-Indian boy captain stood smilingly by, twisting the two tiny sprigs of mustache that gave him so striking a resemblance to a Chinese mandarin turned river pirate. He was far too good a Catholic to cut short the leave-taking, even had he guessed that anyone on board chafed at the delay. The day was much older before we crawled out into the middle of the stream again, but no man journeys up to Bogota hastily. The land of hurry was behind us. When we addressed him, the priest answered us courteously enough, then dropped the conversation in a manner to suggest that he did not care to pursue it further. Like his fellow countrymen, in general, he seemed to have no hunger for knowledge, no notion that he might learn from others. The attitude of all the upper deck passengers was as if an edict had gone forth to dislike Americans. Individually, none had any grievance against us. Collectively, 
they seemed banded together in a species of intellectual boycott which none of them vented to the extent of losing his reputation for politeness. Their manner suggested pouting children, unwilling to declare their fancied grievances and fight them out like men. There were a half dozen of us at the table that evening, with the priest in the place of honor at the head. The meal passed without a spoken word at racehorse speed. It recalled a placard I had seen in a Texas restaurant on my journey southward. Eat first, then talk and amid the opening chorus Hayes' memory harked back to a sign that once embellished a Bowery institution, soup should be seen and not heard. That we paused for speech between mouthfuls seemed to fill our companions with a mixture of disgust and amazement. It was perilous, too, for ragged barefoot waiters, more numerous than diners, hovered over us, quick to snatch away the plate of anyone who dared raise his head. How unlike the sociable meals of Spain! was this silent wolfing their own parents could not have distinguished one meal from another the soup was always of the general collection variety the two vegetables incessantly the same the beef varied from the hopelessly tough to the suspiciously tender for the system on the river steamers of the magdalena is to slaughter a steer on the lower deck the first morning of the voyage and serve it twice daily until passengers are unanimous in leaving their plates untouched then regretfully to lead another gloomy, raw-boned animal forth to slaughter. Yet no one could have complained on the score of quantity. We no longer wondered at the sallow flabbiness of those about us in spite their life in the open air. The voracious engines of the Alicia required more halting than movement. Barely had we left the faint lights of Calamara stern when we tied up for hours before a woodpile in the edge of the jungle, and never did a half-day pass without a long halt to replenish the fuel. The sight of a bamboo hut or a cluster of thatched bamboo shacks crouched in a little semicircular space gouged out of the immense forest was sure to bring a shrill scream from the whistle, and in the soft air of evening we crawled up to a tiny clearing where perhaps thirty cords of wood lay awaiting a purchaser. They were heavy slabs some three feet long, the piles separated by upright poles into divisions called burros, the conventional load perhaps of one ass. On the utter deck of the bank hung a miserable little hut, swarming with dogs and equally unwashed human beings. There were the usual endless maneuvers to a mooring, then the entire crew went ashore on the heels of the captain, armed with his measuring stick. He and the woodsman, a sturdy, bashful fellow, gave each other the customary greeting, pat on the shoulder, then stood a long time, each with a hand on the woodpile, discussing the details of the imminent financial transaction. But they could not come to terms, and at length the steamer population returned on board, and for ten minutes, and with much ringing of bells and screeching of whistles, the Alicia went through the pretense of getting under way. The woodsman held his ground, though his wood looked as if he had already held it for several years. At length we returned to the same mooring in a wash basin of boiled beef and plantains was carried ashore as a peace offering. This time we struck a bargain, and the two populations exchanged places. The countrymen of all ages and both sexes, many with evidences of loathsome diseases, one limping on a foot white with leprosy, swarmed into every corner of the craft, gazing open-mouthed at her unbelievable magnificence sitting cautiously down in the deck chairs, thrusting their fingers into the saucers of dessert that had been set out an hour or two before meal-time to give the flies fair play, passing from hand to hand anything that caught their fancy. Their protruding bellies suggested that hookworm was prevalent. The men wore over one shoulder a satchel-like pouch called a carniel, for their clothing was not such as might safely have been entrusted with their minor possessions. Meanwhile, we had taken advantage of the opportunity to stretch our legs ashore, for whatever their faults, these jungle people are not addicted to thievery. Under the edge of the forest, into the dense green depths of which we could wander a little way amid a wealth of woodland aromas and the fitful song of birds, was planted a little field of corn, the stalks a full ten feet high, even the ears in many cases well above our heads, though the jungle was thick between the rows and there was no sign of other labor than the planting. A bit of sugar cane grew as luxuriantly, and behind the hut stood a crude trapiche, or cane crusher, a mere stump and lever above a dugout trough. 
palm gourd mango and papaya trees the females of the latter heavy with fruit and the males gay with yellow blossoms suggested that the spot might have been one of the most flourishing gardens on earth had the inhabitants any other industry or desire than to roll about on the earth floors from a corner of the patch the stewards cut long reeds and made trumpets of exactly the sound of army bugles the houses of the region are very simply built four posts some six inches in diameter and rising as many feet above the ground are set in the corners of the house to be halfway between these are set four smaller upright poles giving each wall three supports along the tops of these saplings about four inches in diameter are tied with green vines after which pole rafters are raised across these six to eight inches apart are laid strips of split bamboo also tied with vines the roof is then thatched with dried banana leaves laid lengthwise with the slope of the roof those underneath secured by being bent over the bamboo strips and layer after layer of them piled on until the thatch roof is a foot or more thick two poles tied some distance apart with green vines are then thrown over the peak of the roof to keep a sudden gust of wind from lifting the shelter off the dwellers heads and their residence is ready for occupancy the deckhands each wearing on his head a grain sack split up one side stood in file behind the diminishing woodpile when his turn came each grasped the end of his sack in the right hand and held the arm at full length while the others heaped it high with cordwood as soon as he had what he considered a reasonable amount the carrier threw a rope held in his left hand over the load caught it deftly in the already burdened right and pulling it taut marched down some twenty feet of perpendicular sandy bank and across a wobbly eight-inch plank without a quiver we envied them the exercise at every landing but even to have carried a stick on board would have been not only to lose our own caste but to jeopardize that of all our fellow countrymen nothing would be more futile than to attempt to describe the tropical sunset exceeding in beauty if at all only by sunrise as it spread across this flat jungle and forest country the curving river and woodlands on into the night the languid wood loading continued lighting up in irregular patches by the lamps of the steamer and the flickering oil torches ashore long after dark as the last of the burros was disappearing the jungle dweller came on board in person and fixed upon me to figure up how much he had coming openly putting his faith in a foreigner in preference to a native there were a hundred and nineteen burros for which he was to receive fourteen cents each it totaled sixteen dollars and sixty six cents or as it sounded to him sixteen hundred and sixty six dollars and by and by the purser who would no doubt have beaten him a few hundred dollars in the manipulation but for my pencil came out of his cabin with an australian gold sovereign and an immense handful of Colombian bills. I asked the recipient how long he had worked to get the pile together, and received the expected South American answer, Ay, mucho soles, senor, many sons, which, of course, was as exact as he could be about it. Strangely enough, he resisted the wheedling of the ragged stewards to exchange his fortune for the cheap straw hats and brass rings they carried for sale, and got safely ashore with the entire handful of what in these wilds could not have been of any great practical value as we pushed off the captain announced that we had wood enough to last until the following noon one would have fancied that we had enough to last to the seventh circle and back here we could still march all night for the river was deep in spite of its great width as we sat in solitary glory on the upper deck watching the blood-red moon come up out of the jungle Hayes suddenly broke off a dissertation on the philosophy of life of Marcus Aurelius to exclaim, We ought to square off on this. If we're going to walk along the top of the Andes, we'll need all the chest expansion we've got. And suiting the action to the word, he chucked his half-smoked five-dollar cigar overboard. It was not until late next morning that I saw him light the next one. But I thought you'd sworn off, I reminded him. That's the great value of resolutions, he answered. You make them to break them and feel the genuine freedom of life. But tomorrow I'll swear off in earnest, which he did almost daily, as long as the journey lasted. Meanwhile, my birthday making a good date for it, I gave up the habit definitely myself, 
none too sure of its effect in the lofty altitudes before us. We moved at about the speed of a log raft towed by a sunfish. Whenever there was danger of our making reasonable Colombian distance, the whistle was sure to sound and we drifted inshore to tie up for hours before another woodpile. Sometimes the flat, disappointing banks of the river were sheer for miles, with unbroken stretches of swamp grass, six feet high, so dense, it did not seem that a snake could have wormed its way through it. The cerulean blue skies were equal to any of Italy, the light clouds wandering lazily across them, sometimes forming in battle array on the rim of the horizon. Here and there were considerable fields of sugar cane about a thatched village, but the last fertile territory was almost entirely virgin and uncleared. One morning a cry of, Came on! called attention to a point of sand on which lay a score of alligators, most of which slid sluggishly off into the stream as we approached. Thereafter we had only to glance along the bank to be sure of seeing several. For some days Hayes and I had made up the deck passenger list unassisted. Sitting through our meals in dignified silence with some half-dozen waiters to miss wait us, when we could get their attention, headed by the chief steward, who never tired of boasting that he had once made cigars in the shadow of Anson police station. His underlings received six dollars a month, such food as they could forage, and the right to wear what the passage of years had left of misfit cotton uniforms to be turned in at the end of the trip. They were obliged to pay for all breakages, and life was indeed slender, with only two economical gringos as passengers. The arrival of a new pasajero was in consequence, always an exciting event. Five days up in the region known as the Opon country, there appeared on board a native trapper of wild animals, who had been shot through the face by an arrow of the savage Opones, but had performed the rare feat of making his escape. Colombia includes within her confines several tribes of Indians not only uninfluenced by the government, but without an inkling of its existence. The Opones live far back along the tributaries of the Magdalena, descending them only in certain seasons and attacking any human beings they come upon. Armed with a species of arch bow, they shoot an enormous arrow with a point of iron-hard black palm barbed both ways that can neither be pushed through nor pulled out of the body of the victim. The arrow the trapper had brought with him could barely be forced into his long trunk after being broken in two, and five cruel barbs still remained after several others had been cut off and left in the body of his former companion. A few weeks before, he reported, a harmless fellow fishing somewhat back from the main river had been made the veritable pincushion of thirty-two such arrows. The trapper had it that the Opones were cannibals, asserting that a recent expedition into the Opon country had found a Colombian woman of good family who was being fattened in a cage of bamboo, but whom the savages had not yet eaten because of a suspicious sore on her leg. Gradually, low, shadowy mountains began to appear in the far blue distance, with suggestions of higher ones in the clouds behind them. On the seventh day, a long, rugged chain, the Sierra de Paraja, in the province of Santander, had grown so near that separate peaks and suggestions of villages could be picked out of the sunlit distance. Next morning, we were half surrounded by deep blue ranges, and the banks were broad natural meadows, with hundreds of cattle deep in rich green grass. Magnificent spreading trees now stood out against the sky in ranges. The nights had grown so cool that we took to sleeping in our stateroom, with barely room enough to sneeze when our cots had been dragged in. Here we began to go aground frequently, for the tendency of the Magdalena is to spread out more and more as her sandy banks kept falling into the river. At our speed, the experience was hardly hair-raising, and generally in the course of a few hours the Alicia worked herself loose again. There were almost no other watercraft except an occasional canoa, a dugout log crawling along the extreme lower edge of the forest wall. Now and then we passed large balsas, rafts of hundreds of immense cedar logs, with the Colombian flag at the prow, and the crew camped aft with mat beds, primitive kitchens, and sometimes their women, and numerous progeny. Great trees, which the captain called Siebas, rose slim and clear more than a hundred feet, to end in a parasol tuft of branches. 
Frequently a flock of parakeets screamed noisily by overhead. In places we crawled along between sheer sand banks, gigantic trees of the dense forest hanging on the brink of miniature culebra slides as the river washed under them. Higher still, the stream grew so shallow that we could march only by day, anchoring at dark. One night we tied up to the bank on an inner curve of the river, where the forest cut off the breeze completely and left us to toss in our cots until dawn. Its first glimmer of light showed that we had reached Puerto Berrio, where a little narrow gauge starts. I use the word advisedly, for it never gets there, for Medellin, the second city of Colombia, the port itself suspended whatever it was in the habit of doing to stare at us in long, silent rows from the doorways. Its male population not only wore no shirt, but did not even trouble to conceal that fact by buttoning its tattered, sun-bleached jacket. All the natives seemed obsessed with the notion that, as gringos, we could not speak Spanish. As often as we addressed one, though our Castilian vocabulary was as ample, and our pronunciation far less slovenly than his own, he refused to believe his senses until the sensation had been several times repeated. We were off again by noon. It had been raining in the highlands beyond, and the visibly rising river was half covered with patches of thick scum. Now and then it bore by on its swift, silent surface a fragment of forest snatched from somewhere above. We were now some hundreds of feet above sea level, and the forest air was fragrant and unfevered. All day long, nothing but forest trailed by. We passed timber enough in a week to supply the world for a century, and rich soil enough to feed a large section of it permanently. But only very rarely did a little bamboo hut, roofed with leaves, dot the monotony of virgin nature. The river had narrowed down to its placid, powerful stream. The weather was peerless, though an almost invisible gnat began to make life motionless. In the purple gloaming, a forest-built village of some size stood out more picturesquely than usual on the nose of a land billow jutting forth and falling sheer into the river, only to have the interminable forest swallow it up again. Yet there were signs that we were approaching somewhere or other. Hayes sat with his feet on the rail, discoursing on the relative merits of Turgenev and Galados, the point of his last cigar glowing in the darkness, when the captain passed with a package wrapped in the customary inefficiency of Latin America. Here, I used to be one, said Hayes, reaching for the bundle and rearranging it. Used to be what? I asked as he handed it back. I was walking along the street of, uh, well, I don't remember the stage setting, but it must have been in the States, and a long time ago, he began lighting a second cigar from the butt of the first. For I know I, I hadn't been to sea or in the army yet when I saw a sign in a window. Bundle wrapper wanted. I had to pass up a hundred per as outside man for a medicine faker to take it, but it was something new and... He rambled off into one of those experience sketches which, jumping erratically over the face of the globe, frequently enlivened the voyage. In the last hours of June, we bumped against the wharf of La Dorada, several hundred yards of tinware building along a sloping river front with a childish attempt at paving its main street, a forlorn pathway near the water's edge, dying away in the forest jungle on either hand. Here we took our leave of the Alicia, for cataracts make this the end of the run for steamers plying the lower Magdalena. Next afternoon, a train even more diminutive than that to Calamar, wound away in a half-circle into the forest, with now and then glimpses of hazy far-off Andean ranges, and three hours later set us down in Honda. To our surprise we found it a city, the first since Cartagena, as aged and intricate, as full of its own local color, including many blind and leprous beggars, as any town of old Spain. Piled close along the Magdalena, here a series of rocky rapids, it is divided by a gurgling tributary across which three picturesque bridges fling themselves, scores of aged stone buildings, quaint walls, and steep streets of century-old pavements give it an air reminiscent of Bruges or Nuremberg or of some of the ancient towns of Mexico. Its narrow streets are crowded with laden mules and sun-browned arrieros 
of both sexes, its patios seem primeval forests, and mountain ranges cut its horizon close off in every direction. A muleteer pointed out to us the ancient trail to Bogota, where it crossed a high red bridge and climbed steeply away to one of the natural walls of the town on the way to Facatativa, on the local plateau above. But for our baggage, we should have struck out for the capital on this route of centuries. We went on by rail in the morning. Every woman and girl in the car, not to mention Hayes, was smoking the jet-black cigars of the region. The little engine with its top-heavy smokestack consumed wood as gluttonously as the Alicia, and halted even more often to replenish its supply. Colombians fancy railroads will work the complete regeneration of their torpid country, but such as we had seen were only miniature samples of the real thing, of slight practical value even when they extended all over the republic. The natives had no notion, however, that the word train did not stand for the same tiny contraptions the world over as that to which they applied it. On all sides were enormous stadiums of mountains, not yet high but already bulking and rock-strewn. Drought had left the country desert dry, and fine sand drifted in and deposited itself upon us in shrouds as in crossing Nevada. The landscape suggested a cross between the tropics and a western prairie choking for rain, as did even the towns, with their frontiersmen disarray, their burrows, mules, and broken-down horses drooping in any patch of shade. Tattered boys and diseased loafers swarmed into the cars at every stop, drinking from the water jars, washing in the bowls of the first-class coach, making themselves completely at home without a suggestion of protest from the trainmen. Even were there laws against such actions, the languid officials would have lacked the moral courage to enforce them. The railway ended at Beltran, where we boarded the steamer Caribe, a dreary sun-baked collection of sheds and a few choking huts made up the town, completely surrounded by desert, with plenty of bushy trees, but a desert for all that. The wind that swept across the steamer at her mooring was not the cool one of the lower Magdalena, but one laden with red-hot sand that stung the cheeks like tiny insects. When the passengers had gulped their almuerzo, the dishes were piled in the alleyway where beggars and gaunt boys from the shore came to claw around in them, after which they were roughly half-washed. There is a fetching democracy about the road to Bogota. He who travels it, be he vagrant or man of wealth, must go through the same uninviting experiences. It speaks poorly of Colombians that they still endure this medieval method of travel from the outside world to their capital. Wealthy Bogotanos journey to Europe in luxurious style, once they are on the ocean. It would seem wiser for them to return steerage and gradually accustom themselves to what they must endure from the landing in their own country to the arrival in Bogota. All day long we sat in the sand-burning winds of Beltran, while barefoot and half-naked stevedores dribbled down the steep bank with all manner of cargo. There was barbed wire from Massachusetts, corrugated iron from Pittsburgh, boxed streetcar lines that clattered and crashed as they fell, and finally, though by no means last, four pianos from Germany that were rolled heels over head down the long stony bank. Although we had real cabin tickets this time, neither of us had influence enough to get a cabin. We dragged our cots out onto the open deck and, indifferent to social rules, marched through the multitude in our pajamas. This turned out to be entirely come il fall for even the son of a recent president of Colombia soon appeared similarly clad and strolled about the deck, chattering with his fellow passengers of both sexes as nonchalantly as if in full dress. We were not off until dawn, into which the volcano Ruiz, first of the long row of snow-clad fire vents of the Andes which we hoped in time to see disappear over our shoulders, thrust its aged head. Rock cliffs along the bank recalled the Lorelei. Fields of corn undulated like wind-snatched hair on the summits of rounded hills, at the base of which sweltered the banana groves of the tropics. As the sun was setting, we passed a chorro at the foot of a low range around which the river had swept in a half-circle so many centuries that its bank was a sheer rock wall, surely sixty feet high. The Caribe, with the nose of a wash-tub, panted for life against the current, 
spitting showers of live coals from her wood fires, seeming several times about to give up the attempt in despair. But she gained the calmer water above at last, and soon after dark landed us in Girardeau. We spent the 4th of July in Girardeau, not by choice, but because the train to the capital leaves only three times a week. The town swelters by day on the edge of the curving river, here hardly fifty yards wide, where for more than a mile stretches a vista of donkeys laden with kegs of water, bands of women, all more or less African in ancestry, bathing, washing, and incessantly smoking immense misshapen cigars as to even the children of both sexes that paddle stark naked about the bank in complete immunity to the blazing sun. The place seemed like the headquarters of contented poverty. At least half the inhabitants either had not enough sun-bleached garments to completely conceal their dusky skins, or had laid them away for more gala occasions. Beggars, halt, blind, misformed, and idiotic were almost as numerous as in similar towns of India. Even the less miserable inhabitants were dull, neurasthenic, utterly devoid of energy, anemic, with incessant smoking, bad food, and worse habits, given to living entirely according to their appetites, and never according to willpower and reason. It was not without misgiving that we turned our faces toward Bogota next morning. The crowd which the train from the plateau had landed the night before had been half hidden under the rugs, blankets, and overcoats they carried, and not a native of Girardeau could speak of the capital without visibly shivering, some even crossing themselves as often as they heard it mentioned. The train left at sunrise. By the rules of the line, the ferrocarril de Girardeau, we were obliged to check our baggage containing all extra clothing. For the first few hours we were surrounded by mountains, though still on a slightly rising plain between them. The land appeared fertile, and there was considerable Indian corn, yet it was surprising to find here in the capacious new world such swarms of beggars as in Egypt or India. The population along the way, increasingly Indian in blood, was extraordinarily slow-witted. In a window near us sat a commercial traveler who tossed at every one he caught sight of along the way a pictorial advertisement of an American panacea. The tail of the train was always well past them before a single one gathered his wits sufficiently to pick up the treasure. Near noon we were ourselves picked out by a mountain-climbing engine made in Schenectady, its boiler well forward and flanked by the water tanks, a small upright coal bin behind. As we began a series of switchbacks, I caught a breath of virile white man's air for the first time in half a year, and the taste of it was so delicious that the sensation reached to my tingling toes. Regularly, the vista of gouged-out valleys surrounded by rough-hewn, cool blue ranges spread to greater distances. Passengers began to turn red-nosed, to put on overcoats, blankets, rugs, ponchos, gloves, to wrap towels about their necks. To me, the temperature was delightful, but Hayes, who had been long years in the tropics, took to applying other adjectives. Now the landscape of meadows and grazing cattle, backed by towering mountains, suggested Switzerland. Beyond the one tunnel of the line, we entered an immense valley walled by row upon row of blue ranges. Higher still, the bleak stony highlands resembled a more rugged Scotland in late October, though cultivation was almost general and roads numerous. It struck us as strange that human beings could shiver and toil for a scant livelihood in such surroundings when a day's walk would bring them to a perpetual summer and nature's well-filled larder. A plant must remain where it chances to be born, but why should man also? By four the train had finished its task of lifting its breathless passengers into the thin air of Fagatativa, and scores of half-frozen barefoot children and ragged adults dismally wandered the stony streets. A policeman muffled to the ears assured us, with what seemed a suggestion of pride, that Fagatativa was even colder than Bogota for which Hayes gave fervent thanks. Evidently the heat of the tropics was yet in my blood, for I still felt comfortable. An hour later we were speeding across a broad plateau in the Ferrocarril de la Sabana, a government railroad equipped with real trains of American cars. 
All the languor and ragged indifference of the tropics seemed to have been left forever behind. The conductor was as businesslike and as light in color as any of our own land. We stopped briefly at towns boasting all the adjuncts of civilized life somehow dragged up to these lofty realms. Here was a country built from the center outwardly. The nearer we came to its capital, the further we left the world behind, the more modern and well-furnished did it become. It recalled fanciful tales of men who, toiling for weeks through unknown wildernesses, suddenly burst forth upon an unknown valley filled with all the splendors of an ancient kingdom. Yet we could not wonder why, once they had reached this lofty plateau, the discoverers had not halted and built their city, instead of marching far back across it to the foot of the enclosing range. A full thirty-five miles the train fled across the savanna, an immense plain in appearance like one of our north in early April, intersected here and there by barbed wire fences. Broad yellow fields of mustard appeared, spread, and disappeared behind us. Great droves of cattle frisked about in the autumn air as if to keep warm. Well-built country dwellings flashed by, stony and bare in setting, but embellished with huge paintings of landscapes on the walls under the veranda roofs. The sun had barely smiled upon us since noon. Now, as the day declined, I began to grow cold, bitter cold, colder than I had been since descending from the Mexican plateau seven months before, while Hayes's hat brim shook with the shivering. Our fellow passengers looked like summer excursionists, unexpectedly caught in straw hats by grim, relentless winter. Then, as evening descended, the plain came to an abrupt end, and at the very foot of a forbidding black mountain range spread a cold, smokeless city of bulking domes and towers. We had reached, at last, after eighteen days of travel, the most isolated of South American capitals. End of chapter one. Recorded by Elliot Swanson. Chapter two of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter two. The Cloistered City. Our entrance into Bogota was not exactly what we had planned or anticipated. The crowd that filled the station and its adjacent streets in honor of the thrice weekly linking with the outside world was dressed like an American city in February, except that here black was more general and choking high collars and foppish canes far more in evidence. Wherefore, seeing two men of foreign aspect, visibly shivering in their strange featherweight uniforms, descending upon them, the pulsating throng could be dispersed only with difficulty, and excited urchins raced beside the horse-car that set us down, at last, before a recommended hotel. Hayes, who was nothing if not self-conscious, as well as tropical-blooded, lost no time in putting on every wool garment his baggage contained, and dived under four blankets, vowing never to be seen again in public. We seem to have reached the very center of this incongruous civilization of the isolated fastness of the Andes. Our suite took up an entire second-story corner of the hotel. There were carpets in which our feet sank half out of sight, capacious upholstered chairs, divans in every corner, tables that might have graced a French chateau, pier-glass mirrors, gleaming chandeliers, lamps with double burners, in addition to electric lights. Our parlor, its huge windows resplendent with lace curtains, opened on a balcony overhanging the street, as did the adjoining bedroom, as richly furnished and with two old-fashioned colonial bedsteads heaped high with mattresses, their many blankets covered with glossy vicuña hides. We were far, indeed, from the frontiersman steamers of the Magdalena. When the hunger of the highlands asserted itself, we sneaked down to a luxurious dining room to find the menu and service equal to that of some traveler's palace on the Champs Elysees. The sumptuous breakfast that a maid placed beside our beds next morning was a humorous contrast to those we had endured on the Alicia. Yet all these luxuries, born to this lofty isolation by methods the most primitive known to modern days, were ours at the paltry rate of a dollar fifty a day. Truly, the cost 
of high living had not yet reached the altitude of Bogota. It was evident, however, that if we were to live here as anything but public curiosities, we must patronize a clothing store. The zone costume, so splendidly adapted to our future plans, was unfortunately original for Bogotanos, and nowhere does originality of garb cause greater furor than in the mountain cloistered capital of Colombia. When we summoned up courage to venture forth, Hayes dodged into the first tailor shop that crossed his path and instantly agreed to take whatever happened to be offered to him at any price the tailor chose to inflict, and returned to remaining in hiding for the ensuing twenty-four hours until the articles were delivered. Meanwhile, I sallied forth from a ready-made establishment, inconspicuous in a native shirt that came perilously near being born a pajama, and a heavy, temporarily black, suit of cashmere, with misgiving tightness across the trousers. On second thought, it was not surprising that this far away, a city of the Andes, should be so exacting in dress. Virtually cut off from the world, it was supremely eager to appear cosmopolitan. The result is a tailor's paradise. No one who aspires to be ranked among the gente decente ever dreams of permitting himself to be seen in public lacking any detail of the equipment, from derby to patent leathers, that make up the Bogotanos mental picture of a Parisian boulevardier. At first we took this multitude of faultlessly dressed men to mean that the city rolled in wealth. As time went on, many a dandy of fashion we had fancied a bank president or the son of some prince of finance turned out to be a side street barber or the keeper of a four by six bookstall, if not indeed without even so legitimate a source of income. It is due, no doubt, to some misinterpretation of the European fashion sheets that the main street corners were habitually blocked long before noon by men and youths in Prince Alberts who spent the greater part of the day leaning with Parisian nonchalance on silver-headed canes. The women of the better class, on the other hand, are never seen disguised as Parisians, except on rare gala occasions. At morning mass, or in their circumspect tours of shopping, they appeared swathed from head to foot in the black manto, a shawl-like thing of thin texture wound about head and body to the hips, and leaving only a bit of the face and a bare glimpse of their blue-black hair visible. To us the costume was pleasing in its simplicity. Bogotanos, however, complain that it is triste, sad, and in time we too came to have that impression, as if the sex had gone perpetually into mourning for the ways of its male relatives. The great underlying mass of the population has no requirements in the matter of dress, in general, the gente del pueblo, the men of the people, wear shoddy trousers of indeterminate hue, all the prajatas, hemp soles held in place by strips of canvas, without socks, a soiled panama always very much out of place in this climate, and, covering all else, a ruana, or native woven blanket with a hole in the center through which to thrust the head. Their women rarely wear black, but simple gowns of some light color, at least on Sundays, after which its whiteness decreases. They go commonly bareheaded, often barefooted, and always stockingless. Every scene from street to cathedral shrine is enlivened by the bare legs of women and girls, often decidedly attractive in appearance to those who have no great prejudice for the bath. To be nearer the center of activities, we had taken a room in the third story of the municipal building on the side of the palace of viceroys. Down below, lay the main plaza of Colombia. Tenerani's celebrated statue of Bolivar in its center, the still unfinished capital building, cutting it off on the right. Across the square we could look in at the door of the ancient cathedral and shake our fists at its constantly clanging bells. Beyond, much of the city spread out before us, the thatched huts of misery spilling a little way up the foot of the dismal black range that filled in the rest of the picture. The altitude of Bogota, it stands 8,630 feet above the level of the sea, seldom fails to impress itself upon the newcomer. Many travelers do not risk the sudden ascent from Hirado to the capital in a single day, but stop over between trains at a halfway town. 
During the first days I was content to march slowly a few blocks up and down her slightly inclined streets, and even then found myself with the faint third cousin of a headache, several mild attacks of nosebleed, and a soreness of all the body as if from undue pressure of the blood. Until the first effects wear away, energy is at its lowest ebb and time passes on leaden wings. The change in mood is as marked in the character of the permanent inhabitants. From the moment of his arrival, the traveler feels again that foresighted, looking to the future attitude toward life common to the temperate zone. All the light, airy, gay, and wasteful ways of Panama and the tropics fade away like the memory of some former existence, and it is easy to understand why the Bogotano is quite different in temperament from the languid inhabitants along the Magdalena. Unlike many regions of high altitude, however, Bogota is not a nervous city. There are lower places in Mexico, for instance, where the nerves seem always at attention. Here we felt serene and unexcited all day long, as in the first hours of waking from long, refreshing sleep. Except in the actual sunshine, the air was raw even at noon. The wind from off the backing range or across the savanna cut through our garments as if they were of cheesecloth. The thermometer falls much lower in other climes, but here artificial heat is unknown, and a more penetrating cold is inconceivable. By night the Bogotano wears an overcoat of the greatest obtainable thickness. He dines and goes to the theater in a temperature that would make outdoor New York in early November seem cozy and hospitable. Well-dressed men in gloves and overcoats and women in furs, walking briskly across the square below our window on their way from the electric streetcar to the theater or the Circo Keller, gave the scene quite the appearance of a similar one in an American town in the first days of winter. Yet this was July, and we were barely five degrees from the equator. Beside us lay the latest newspapers from New York, halfway to the North Pole, bristling with such items as wanted cool rooms for the summer months, for dead of heat prostration. It is a peculiar climate. Flowers of some arctic species bloom perennially, and the poorer people, inured to it from birth, seem to thrive in bare legs and summer garb. Frost is virtually unknown, not because the temperature does not warrant it, but because what would be frost elsewhere evaporates in the thin air. Once the sun has set, nothing seems quite so attractive, whatever the plans made by day, as to read for an hour huddled up in all spare clothing, then to throw open the windows and dive under as many blankets as a Minnesota farmer in January. The Bogotano does not, of course, believe in open windows. Though he scorns a fire, or has never thought to build one, he has a quaking fear of night air, against which he charges a score of diseases headed by the dreaded pneumonia of higher altitudes. Those who venture out at night habitually hold a handkerchief over mouth and nostrils. Yet at least this can be said, that nowhere is sleep, if properly tucked in, more sound and refreshing. Within a week we found ourselves acclimated, or I should say altitudinated, and took to exploring the city more thoroughly. The air was still noticeably thin, but there was still enough of it to furnish the lung fuel even for the five-mile stroll to the natural stone gateway where the highway to the east clambers away through a notch and begins the descent to Venezuela. Looking down upon it from here, the misinformed traveler might easily fancy the broad savanna, the deep sea plains of some northern clime, never guessing that forty miles to the west the world falls abruptly away into the torrid zone for Bogota is chiefly remarkable for its location. Taken somewhere else, it would be like many another city of Spanish ancestry. Its streets are singularly alike, wide, straight, a few paved in macadam, more in rough cobbles, many grass-grown, and all with a central line of flagstones worn smooth by the feet of generations of carriers. The chiefly two-story houses tow sidewalks so narrow that two can seldom pass abreast, and for those who know Spain or her former colonies there is nothing unusual in the architecture. The streets cross each other at solemn right angles, and those which do not fade away 
on the plain fetch sharply up against the rusty black range that backs the city. The system of street numbering is excellent, that of the house is clumsy, and the former is marred by the habit of the volatile government in changing familiar names as often as some new or forgotten patriot is called to its attention. Thus, the Plaza San Agustin had been the Plaza Ayacucho up to a short time before our arrival, yet before we left it had become the Plaza Sucre in honor of a new statue of that general unveiled on Colombia's Independence Day, July 20th. In like manner, the Plaza de Egipto was transformed before our very eyes into the Plaza de Massa. This weakness for honoring new heroes is characteristic of the whole country. Not only are the provinces frequently renamed, but in the short century since its independence the nation itself has basked under half a dozen titles, to wit, La Gran Colombia, Nueva Granada, Confederación Grandina, Estados Unidos de Nueva Granada, Estados Unidos de Colombia, and since 1885, República de Colombia, and there are evidences that it is not yet entirely satisfied. It is less in its material aspects than in the ways of its population that the traveler finds Bogota interesting. About every inhabitant hovers a glamour of romance. Either he has always lived in this miniature world, or he has at least once made the laborious journey up to it. The vast majority are born, live, and die here in their lofty isolation, shut away by weeks of wilderness from the outside world. Alone with its own little trials and triumphs, it seems something long ago left behind up here under the chilly stars by a receding wave of civilization. Small wonder its people consider their city the center of the universe. Those who travel a little way out into the world see nothing to compare with it. The scant minority that reach Paris are credited with fervid imaginations, if indeed the picture of what they have seen is not effaced during the long, toilsome journey back to their own beloved capital. Perhaps no other city of today is more nearly what a newly discovered one must have been to the happy explorers of earlier times. Now and then there comes upon the traveler the regret that it is not entirely cut off instead of nine-tenths so. A region fitted for the development of its own customs, had it been left to its aboriginal shipchas, might have evolved a civilization entirely its own, altogether different, and not this rather crumpled copy of familiar world capitals. Bogota is decidedly a white man's city. Indeed, there is hardly another of its size south of the Canadian border in which the percentage of pure white complexions is higher. On rare occasions, a negro who has drifted up from the hot lands below sat huddled in the main plaza in all the blankets and ranas he could borrow, but his face was sure soon to be numbered among the missing. Brunettes predominate, of course, but blondes are by no means rare. The boot black who served us now and then was a decided towhead. Red cheeks are almost the rule. Slight atmospheric pressure bringing the blood nearer to the surface no doubt largely accounts for this, but there are many other evidences of general good health. At this altitude, the violations of most of the rules of sanitation are lightly punished. The temperature, cold enough to be invigorating, yet not so cold as to require our health-menacing artificial heat, combined with its simple, placid life, make Bogota a town of plump, robust figures, particularly among the women, unmarked by the dissipation common to the males. Many of the former may frankly be termed beautiful, in spite of a widespread tendency of the sex to wear distinctly noticeable black mustaches. Unfortunately, the men of the well-to-do class are not believers in exercise or the systematic caring for the body, scorn every unnecessary physical exertion, letting themselves grow up haphazard. They are noticeably round-shouldered and hollow-chested. An American long resident in the city seriously advised us to get a hump into your shoulders so you won't attract so much attention. Even the descendants of the Chipchas that make up much of the population of the outskirts and the surrounding country have a tinge of russet in their cheeks 
and are by no means so dark as our copper-skinned aborigines. Daily they swarm into the city that was once theirs, short yet sturdy, muscular carriers and arrieros, as often female as male, pass noiselessly through the streets with the produce of their country patches. Girls barely tend old women. Many of comely features, in spite of the encrusted dirt of years, more often so brutalized by toil as to seem hardly human, dressed in matted rags, their feet and legs bare almost to the knees, plod past under burdens an American workman could not carry a hundred yards. Early in the wintry plateau mornings they set out from their chozas, cobblestone or mud hobbles thatched with the tough yellow-brown grass of the uplands, that are huddled in the mountain passes or strewn out along the wind-swept savanna, driving a bull, rarely a steer, since the former animal loses much of its belligerency at this altitude, on the back a load little lighter than that which the female driver, with a strap about her brow, carries herself. They are all but indistinguishable from the men who tramp beside them. A patchwork skirt instead of tattered trousers is almost the only difference in dress, and their manner is utterly devoid of any feminine touch. Brawny as the men, they march through all the hardships of life as sturdily and uncomplainingly as our early pioneers, asking sympathy neither by word nor look. It is a commonplace sight in Bogota to see a mere girl in years grasp the nose-ring rope of a bull and throw him to his knees, or lay hold of a cinch strap in her calloused hands and, with one foot against the animal's ribs, tighten the girth with the skill of an experienced arriero. Girls and boys alike are trained from their earliest years this life of bovine toil, never looking forward to any other. Of the existence of schools they have hardly an inkling. To them life is bounded by their cheerless hovels and the chicherias of the city, numerous as the pulcarias of Mexico. In every corner of the capital these low drinking shops abound, masquerading under such misnomers as El Nido de Amor, the love nest, and overrun by their besotted votaries of both sexes. Yet the Bogotano Indian drunk is quiet and peaceful compared with the Mexican, for chicha seems chiefly to bring drowsiness and contentment with life as it is. Ever since our arrival, Hayes and I had been threatening to patronize one of the two public bathhouses where the first-class Bogotano reputation, rumor had it, existed in the capital. But in a land where the temperature rarely reaches fifty and the floors are tiled, it takes courage, and we have been satisfying ourselves and our duty to humanity by bravely splashing a basin of icy water over our manly forms every morning on arising. By dint of strong resolutions, often repeated, to be up at six and visit one of the casas de baños, we did finally manage one morning to find ourselves wandering the streets by eight with towel and soap under our arms, and stared at by all we met. We discovered La Violetta at last, next door to a blacksmith shop. The keeper we woke up told us that we might have a cold bath, but that the sign on the front wall, hot baths at all hours, was to be taken with Bogotano meaning. A few mornings later we did actually find the other establishment open. We entered a large patio, the most striking of several buildings, within which was a round, or more exactly, an eight-sided house, and in time succeeded in arousing the place to the extent of bringing down upon us a youth hugely excited by the appearance of a crowd of two whole bathers all at one time. It turned out that each of the eight sides of the strange building was, theoretically, a bathroom of the shape of a slice of cake with a frigid tile floor and an aged porcelain tub in which a bath costs only ten dollars. At the back was a larger, though nonetheless dreary, chamber with a rejadera, or shower bath. The youth assured us that there was plenty of hot water. I won the toss and was soon stripped, but the shower was colder than the ice field bounding the pole. When I had caught my breath, I bawled my repertory of profane Spanish at the youth, who could be seen through a hole above, pottering with some sort of upright boiler and firebox, 
and now and then peering down upon me. Suddenly the water grew warm, hot, boiling, then just when I had soaked myself from crown to toe in the steam it turned as suddenly cold again, an instant later stopped entirely. My eyes tight closed, I shouted at the youth above, Es que el agua caliente se acabó, he droned. It is that the hot water has finished itself. There being no deadly weapon at hand, I turned on a tap of ice-cold water and raced to the dressing room, still half soaked. Hayes, scantily clad, was gazing fiercely at the youth through a hole in the door. Then there isn't any more hot water, he demanded. Not now, senor, but there will be soon. Good. How soon? Early tomorrow morning, senor. But I want to bathe now. Ah, you want to bathe, repeated the youth with wide-open eyes. No, you cross-eyed son of spigdom, exploded the ordinarily even-tempered ex-corporal. I came here and stripped to an undershirt that I might dance in my bare feet on this tile floor in honor of Jose Maria de la Santa Trinidad Simon Bolivar. Get up in that roof and fire her up, or... The youth was already feverishly stoking armfuls of wood under the upright boiler, and by the time I left for home, Hayes was shadowboxing to keep warm, with a fair chance of getting a bath before the day was done. As is to be expected from isolation, the Colombian capital is a deeply religious, not to say fanatical city, an infernal din of church bells of the tone of suspended pans or broken boilers makes the early morning hours hideous and continues at frequent intervals throughout the day. Here, contrary to the custom, in most centers of the Latin race, the men as well as the women go to church. College professors and literary lights of no mean ability seriously contend that the shin bone of some ancient saint in this shrine or that temple has miraculous power, but the superstition of isolation hangs particularly heavy over the uneducated masses. Of late years, the liberals and the masons have grown nearly as powerful as the conservatives and do not hesitate to express themselves freely in public, knowing that in case of attack any representative body of the population includes fellow liberals who will come to their rescue. Every public gathering is pregnant with the possibilities of an outburst between the two divisions of society. The very schoolboys talk politics, here inextricably entangled with religion, and the foreigner who wishes to hold the attention of a Colombian for a conversation of any length, must have some knowledge, or at least a plausible pretense of knowledge, of interior political questions. It was a bare three years since a Protestant missionary had been stoned by the population of Bogota, though he now held his services in peace in what, despite lack of outward signs, was really a church. Policemen armed with rifles liberally besprinkle every meeting in theater, cathedral, or public square. Shortly before our arrival, a dozen officers and citizens had been killed in a religious riot in the bullring. Were they less hump-shouldered, these policemen of Bogota might easily be taken for Irishmen, and an absent-minded American fancy himself back in the New York of a decade ago. The uniform of the day force is a copy of that of our own metropolis before the helmets were abolished. At night the scene changes. In every street, spring up officers in high caps and long capes who might have stepped directly from the arrondissements of Paris, with even the short sword in place of the daytime nightstick. There are a well-disciplined body of men, quite unlike the childish, inefficient guardians of law and disorder so familiar from the Rio Grande southward. The Bogotano officer would no sooner be seen sitting, lounging, or smoking on duty than would one in our own large cities. As in all Latin American countries, however, the chief drawback to a really efficient service is the caste system. The police are of necessity recruited from the gente del pueblo. And though they have no hesitancy in arresting one of their own class, the sight of a white collar paralyzes them with their ingrown deference to the more powerful rank of society. The result is that a well-dressed person can commit anything short of serious crime under the very eyes of the police. The officer may keep the culprit under surveillance, 
but rarely summons up courage to actually arrest him until he has definite orders from a white-collared superior. There are curious local customs in Bogota. Her small shops, for example, have a system of signs intelligible only to the initiated. A red flag announces meat for sale. A red flag with a yellow star, meat and bones. A white flag, milk. A green one, vegetables and grains. A cabbage or lettuce head thrust forth on the end of a stick marks the entrance to a cheap restaurant. A tuft of faded flowers, a chicheria. The Bogotano sees nothing incongruous in a building that announces itself a primary school above and an American bar below. On weekdays, the pedestrian slinks through many of the chief residential streets apparently unseen. On a gala Sunday afternoon, the same stroll is to run an unbroken gauntlet of feminine eyes. For then, the senoritas, who are seen, if at all, during the week, hurrying to mass, all but concealed in their mantos, don their most resplendent garb and, with cushions under their plump elbows, lean in their window embrasures, ogling and being ogled through the iron rejas. A native of Medellin, where envy of the capital and her self-seeking politicians is rife, had assured us as far away as Panama, all they do in Bogota is study and steal. We had only to glance out our windows to find basis for the first part of the assertion. The plaza below was always alive with students from the local institutions of higher learning for males marching slowly back and forth, conning the day's lessons. The fireless houses are cold and dungeon-like, particularly in the morning, and the city long ago formed the habit of studying afoot. The racial dislike of solitude and the eagerness to be seen and recognized by their fellows as devotees of learning may also have some part in a practice that many a Bogotano continues through life. It is commonplace to pass in almost any street men even past middle age, strolling along with an open book in one hand and the inevitable silver-headed cane in the other. In colonial times, Bogota won the reputation, if not the actual position, of literary capital of South America. Her speech is still the best Castilian of America, with little of that slovenliness of pronunciation so general from the Rio Grande southward. To this day the city has a considerable intellectual life, wider perhaps than it is deep. Everyone writes. He is a rare public man who has not published at least a handful of versos in his youth. Poets, writers, painters, and musical composers are more numerous than in many a far larger center of civilization. The placid isolation of life in Bogota, almost completely severed from the feverish distinctions of the modern world, makes this natural. There's nothing else to do. Then, too, lack of opportunity to compare their work with that of a wider world no doubt gives the literatos of Bogota, a self-complacency that might otherwise be slighter. The cheap local printing presses pour out a constant flood of five-cent volumes of the local poets, those same cachacos and filipchines in frock-tailed coats who lean with such Parisian grace on their canes at the principal street corners. The youth who sees his smudged likeness appear on the tissue paper cover of the weekly pamphlet sees with ill-suppressed joy at his entrance into the glorious, if crowded, ranks of the intellectualis. It is chiefly a dilettante literature, rarely of material reward and of no visible connection with life. But a considerable stream of flowery verse, languidly melancholy in its temperament and not overburdened with deep thought, flows constantly and the boiling down by time has left Bogota credited with a few works of genuine worth. A lecture was given one evening at the Jurisprudence Club on the momentous subject of the necessity of a legal revolution in Colombia. Hayes reneged at the last moment, but I accepted the invitation issued to the general public. I was the only foreigner among the hundred present, yet no American audience 
could have been more universally white of complexion. Indeed, the gathering was strikingly like a similar one in our own country, on a March evening when the furnace had broken down or the janitor gone on strike. All wore overcoats and kept constantly bundled up. The solemn whispering of the audience as it gathered, the unattractiveness of the women, all of whom had long since left youth behind, the staid mien of the men in their frock coats gave the scene the atmosphere of a meeting of highbrows in a corner of faraway New England. But there was superimposed pompous solemnity and funereal tone peculiar to the Latin American, to a race that lays more stress on the correctness of its manner than the weight of its matter. A misstatement or a palpably erroneous fact or conclusion, one felt, might pass muster, but not a slip of the urbanities of society or the incorrect knotting of a cravat. It was a lecture in the French sense. When the president had taken his place and all was arranged in faultless Parisian order, the speaker removed his neck scarf and began solemnly to read from typewritten manuscript. He was a man of forty, wearing glasses, with the perpendicular wrinkles of close study on his brow. A score of countries could have reproduced him ad libitum. He read drearily, monotonously, with a constant care never to spill over into the merely human. The discourse based itself on the narrow national patriotism common to Latin America. Yet, at times, the speaker talked plainly, admitting that Colombia is 88 percent illiterate and that half the remainder can barely read or write. The church he assailed bitterly for its shortcomings, yet never mentioned it directly. In time, as is bound to happen sooner or later in any public meeting in Colombia, he drifted into the great national grievance and whined through several pages on the wickedness of taking the rebel province of Panama away from us, a weak and helpless people. Here I caught several of the audience gazing fixedly at me, as if they fancied I had taken some active part in that debatable action. Through all the latter part of the lecture, the church bells across the way kept up a constant jangling that completely swallowed up whatever conclusions he had gained from his laborious dissertation. It was strangely as if the voice of religion and superstition were trying, by din and hubbub, to drown out that of reason and reflection, as it has since the first medicine man danced howling into the circle of elders in conference in the Stone Age. On the Panama question, the attitude of the Colombian man in the street is not exactly that of the government. A well-educated native holding a small post, though clinging to the same convictions on the taking of the rebel province as the bulk of his countrymen, expressed himself to me as follows. We ordinary citizens feel that our country should be paid for the loss of Panama and the slight to our national honor, but we hope very much that the United States will not pay our government a large sum of money in cash, as contemplated by the proposed treaty, for almost all of it would go into the pockets of the dozen politicians who hold the reins of government. Give us obras hechas, finished works, a railway from the coast to Bogota or a perfected harbor with docks and modern facilities. One day, soon after our arrival, we strolled over to the Biblioteca Nacional to begin the Colombian reading we had planned. It was a wasted effort. We brought up against a heavy colonial door bearing the announcement, suspended until further notice by order of the Ministry of Public Instruction. An American resident interpreted it to mean, oh, some of the readers have been stealing books again. And we recalled the cynical nature of Medellin. Days later, however, when we gained unofficial admission for a few moments, we found that the 5,000 volumes bequeathed by a Colombian literato, not unknown to a wider world, Rafael Pombo, who had recently died in Paris, were being catalogued. Several frock-coated pedants, were smoking innumerable cigarettes and deceiving themselves into the notion that they were at work arranging the books. But the National Library remained hermetically sealed to the public as long as we remained in the capital. It was by no means the first nor the last time 
we met a similar disappointment in South America. We had put it off a long while before we gathered courage in our woolen garments and hurried through the wintry night to Bogota's main theater. As in other restricted societies, entertainments are frequently got up here, chiefly with local talent. It is a long way to any other talent in Bogota. This one was a velada in honor of that same Rafael Pombo. Fortunately, the audience was large enough to keep the place moderately warm. Every detail, every movement, every toilettes of the distinctly good-looking, if mustached ladies in boxes and stalls, were as an exact copy as was humanly possible of similar scenes at the opera in Paris, a copy in miniature bearing the earmarks of having been taken from some novel of the boulevards. Senora La Bogotana used her lorgnette exactly as she had read of her Parisian counterpart doing, the men in faultless evening dress down to the last white eyeglass ribbon about the neck, strove to act precisely as they conceived men did on like occasions in the wider world. Again, all was burdened by the solemn artificiality of the race. One after another, six men burst genteelly upon the stage and declaimed something or other in that painful, flamboyant ranting so beloved of the Latin. All the cut-and-dried forms of cultured society were solemnly carried out. Flowers, someone had read, were always presented to the performers, and even the podgy, pompous old fellow who forgot his piece several times had solemnly thrust upon him by a stage lackey in gorgeous livery two immense wreaths of blossoms. In one matter, at least, these Bogotanos were at an advantage over the amateurs of other lands. Natural declaimers and reciters from babyhood, their tongues always eager for utterance, almost devoid of that bashfulness that works the undoing of the less fluent but perhaps deeper thinking races. They seemed seasoned actors in those points which called for strictly histrionic ability. In another theater a few nights later we saw several Spanish comedies presented by a company of local amateurs and were astonished at the excellence of the work. That of a few of the principals would have won praise on any stage. Three railways leave Bogota, though none of them get very far away. First in importance, of course, is that to Facatativa, connecting with Girardot. Another runs through the flower-decked suburb of Chapinero, Pascaro, with its cream-colored castle on a hill above a cluster of thatched mud huts, to Nemecon, a sooty adobe town of surface coal mines where the savanna is cut off on the north. Back along it, the Zapiquira, the excursionist tramps ten miles in autumn coolness, hardly realizing he is near the equator, between fields of half-grown maize, broad grassy pastures dotted with white clover, with dandelions, daisies, cowslips, and brilliant yellow smartweed, blackberry bushes here and there edge a field in which scamper plump cattle and horses. Others are confined by fence posts of stone, with four holes carefully drilled in each through which to pass the alambre de puas, barbed wire from our own land. Zapiquira is remarkable only for the bulking hill beside it, almost solid rock salt. The mouths of a score of small tunnels lie in plain sight, somewhat up the slope. The salt rocks are beaten fine, dissolved in water, evaporated, pressed, and packed into two bushel bags that are carried away by toil-stupefied women and girls with a band across their foreheads. But the excursion par excellence is that to the falls of Tekendama, the theme of at least one poem by every Bogotano writer. The unholy clatter of church bells helped me arouse Hayes one morning in time to catch the early train on the Ferrocarril del Sur. Some twenty miles out, we descended at the isolated little station of Tecandama and struck off through a region wholly unwooded and almost desert dry. As the road mounted a bit from the bare sabana, a hardy vegetation appeared here and there, a small grove of eucalypti, and a bushy natural growth thinly covering the sides of the low mountains among which we were soon winding. Before long, we fell in with the narrow Bogota River, idling placidly along, little guessing 
what a tremendous tumble it was due to get a bit later. Tradition has it that a god or an Inca, desiring to drain the lake that once covered the savanna, opened the gap through which the stream drops. By and by there appeared ahead a whirling mist cloud which grew until we found ourselves completely enveloped in a great fog out of which rose a dull, never-ending roar of indistinct location. Directed by a peasant, we descended through a rustic gate and for some yards down a field of heather and deep green grass speckled with white clover blossoms and scattered with massive protruding rocks. The face of the one of these a Bogota merchant had disfigured in impertinent American fashion with an advertisement of his superior coffee. We had reached the Niagara of the Columbia. Yet so far as seeing went, we might as well have been in our own cozy beds back at the capital. An ordinary brown stream some forty feet wide flowed down through the bulging rocks, pitched over in a short fall onto a stony ledge at our feet, then off into the mist-blinded unknown. A mere country brook in which we could dip our fingers here, a foot beyond it was forever gone. It was as if a whole world of mystery lay below and about us, yet the curtain of swirling gray mist into which the river plunged to be seen no more hid all from view. We had shivered through our lunch, finding it difficult to believe that we were five degrees from the equator in the month of July, when suddenly the wind rose, and for a moment the mist thinned until we caught a hint of an immense chasm untold depths below, then closed in again. The excursion seemed to have been a failure. We strolled on down the highway in the fog and loafed a while on the bushy hillside, but as we turned homeward the mist was wiped away as suddenly as a curtain drawn aside and all Tekinama lay before us. I slid down a steep bank to the edge of the bottomless chasm and sat down where I could remain as long as I kept my feet braced in the sod before one of the finest sights in the world, or let them slip and drop to sudden death. From the upper ledge the stream fell a sheer unbroken thousand feet in which the entire river seemed to turn to spray, and whatever was left when it struck was beaten into mist, which, rising like steam from the yawning gorge as from some immense cauldron, hid all the face of the adjacent country. Immeasurably below, a much smaller stream could be seen picking itself together again and winding its way dizzily off through a vast rock-faced canyon, on the perpendicular walls of which clung a few hardy plants and while we remained in the cold autumn world above, the river flowed away into the tropics, into the coffee country, the land of bananas, and the perpetual summer of the Magdalena, to help float Colombia down to the outer world. Of the many views of Bogota, the best is that we had at the end of our stay from the summit of Guadalupe. A bit of the backing range juts forth in two peaks, each with a little white church on its top that seemed almost sheer above the city. We climbed to the higher in something more than an hour, massed clouds breaking away now and then to flood with sunshine the ever-widening sabana and the hazy faraway mountains that seemed to cut off the world completely, and came out at last on a grassy platform where we could look down like the astonished conquistadores on all the vast plain and unlike them on the city they founded. North and south, as far as we could see, stretched the bleak, treeless range on which we stood. At our feet this fell abruptly away to the suburban huts of the city and her encircling Paseo de Bolivar. Every plaza and patio, many green with a clump of eucalypti, every window and roof tile was plainly visible. The people were so tiny we had to look for them carefully, as for insects on a carpet, before we could make them out by hundreds, crawling along the light brown streets and speckling the squares. Near the brick-walled cemetery, the disk of the bullring, filled now with the tents of the Circo Keller, seemed a canvas cover on a small, squat pail. Factories, as we understood the word, being unknown, not a fleck of smoke smudged the dull red expanse of the stoveless city. Its noises came up to us very faintly at times borne wholly away on the wind, and from this height 
Even the diabolic din of church bells sounded soft and almost musical. A recent census sets the population at 122,000. Looking down upon the city from Guadalupe, this seemed at first an underestimation, but gradually one realizes that not only are its houses low, often of a single story, but largely taken up by interior patios. Then there are more than a score of churches, innumerable chapels, eight large monasteries, several seminaries, and many residences of the church authorities. Add to this the many government buildings, and bit by bit the traveler, grown skeptical from experience with Latin American figures, begins to wonder if these are not inflated. There is not a wooden building in town. Treelessness governs the architecture, for the surrounding country is above the timber line, though the imported eucalyptus rises in groves here and there and flanks roads and railways. A distinct line divides the city from the savanna, spread out like a rich brown carpet, cut up into irregular fields by adobe wall fences, often roofed like the houses, with aged red tiles. In many places the sheen of shallow lakes recalled that the Sipa of the Chipchas built his tesaquilla here on the lower skirts of the range to escape the winter floods of the plain. Off across it were dimly seen several flat towns, and here and there the farmhouse or cluster of them in a grove of the slender Australian gum trees which merely accentuated the treelessness of the vast expanse of world. Six highways sally forth from the city to march waveringly across the plain, merely threads lost at last in the enclosing range, broken, gnarled, pitched, and tumbled into every manner of shape, bright peaks, and valleys, standing sharply forth where the sun strikes, great purple back patches marking the shadows of the clouds. Beyond all else, at times lost in clouds, at others plainly visible, lay the central range of the Cordillera, over which we must pass on our journey southward. Though more than a hundred miles away, it bulked into the sky like some vast supernatural wall, the broad snow-capped cone of Tolima piercing the heavens in the center of the picture. End of chapter 2 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 3 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 3 From Bogota Over the Quindío. The people of Bogota refused to take seriously our plan of walking to Quito. It was not merely that the Ecuadorian capital was far away. To the inhabitants of this isolated little world, it was only a name like Moscow or Lhasa. Those who had gone to school as far as geography lessons had a nebulous notion that it lay somewhere to the south, and that no sea intervened, but their imaginations could not picture two lone gringos arriving by land. To seek information was simply to waste time. The non-existent cannot be described. The best we could do was pour over a page map in a foreign atlas whereon a match, according to scale, was three hundred miles long. Quito lay nearly three match lengths distance as the crow flies, without considering the very mountainous nature of the country between. Yet the hardy conquistadores had somehow journeyed thither, and in other parts of the world we had both traveled routes that the native considered impossible. As far away as Panama, the horrors of this proposed tramp had been impressed upon me. At dinner one evening, a typical stage Englishman accent and all, and an incurable monopolist of conversation, proved to be the owner of mines in Colombia, and I managed once to cut in with a query about travel in that country. When the steamer lands you in, he began, you buy your mules ten or twelve, hire your mozos and carriers, and but I plan to walk. Walk! exploded my fellow guest. Why on earth should a man wish to walk? Uh, it keeps the girth reduced, I might have replied. It can't be done, 
dogmatized the monopolist. Absurd! Why, why a man can't travel on foot in Colombia. His social standing depends on how fine a mule he rides. If he walked, he'd be taken for a bally peon, lose his caste entirely, you know, and all that sort of thing. Horrible, I guess. Besides, you've got to have a mule train to carry your tent and bed and supplies and... Why, what on earth would you eat? Huts, I began. Huh? Of the natives? Of course, but they haven't a blessed thing to eat, you know. They live on corn cakes and beans and bananas and bread and that sort of thing. Now and then a chicken, perhaps, but you'd starve to death. And if they saw a white man coming, they'd know he had a lot of money and rob him. Bandits and that sort of thing, you know. And how are you going to cross the rivers? Swim? I tried to say, but the sentence was drowned in his cataract of words. And the mud! Why, bless me! One time a party was going along the road in Columbia, and they saw a hat, an English hat, lying in a mud hole. One of them started to kick it when a man's voice shouted, Here, stop it! That's me ballied! What on earth are you doing down there? said the party. Sitting on me mule, to be sure, said the voice. Why, bless me, I wouldn't go on foot in Columbia for all the gold in the Bank of England. It was the end of July when I tiptoed out of the American legation of Bogota, bearing at last a letter from our magnificent charge d'affaires, a splendid representative of Harvard, but not, thank God, of the United States, and carried it over to the government building opposite. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, to whom I made my way through a line of typewriters on which cigarette-clouded officials were pounding out great international matters with two fingers, was one of those rare persons who know why a man should wish to walk, though, being a Colombian, he had never dared to do so himself, and was, moreover, certain that Quito could not be reached by land. I was soon armed with a gorgeous, if misspelled, document in which the government of Colombia permitted itself to recommend Los Señores Americanos, therein named to the authorities along the way, should any such turn up. The genuine traveler sets out on a journey by tossing a toothbrush into a pocket and strolling out of town, but even Hayes had suffered somewhat from the softening of the vagabond's moral fiber that is the penalty for dallying with the bourgeois comforts of civilization. We both had the American hobo's disgust for the blanket stiff, who packs his own bed, yet the Andes offer no proper field for orthodox hoboing. The journey of unknown duration and possibilities before us was sure to have variations in climate, making extra clothing indispensable. Moreover, we could not take the photographs along the way unless we carried with us means for developing the negatives. Our first plan was to buy a donkey and drive him between us down the crest of the Andes. Among the many reasons why this fond dream could not be realized was the certainty that we should have chased the animal off his feet within a week. Observation and reflection suggested that we should do better to follow the ways of the country and hire a human beast of burden. For one thing, if the latter ran away or dropped dead, we lost nothing, except perhaps ten or twelve dollars. Hayes abandoned the plan with double regret, for with it went the hope of some day reporting the journey under the arresting title, Three Uncurried Asses in the Andes. With hundreds of animated bundles of rags trotting about the city, ready to lug anything from a load of hay to a chest of drawers for a mere five-cent piece, we were certain there would be scores of native carriers eager to see the world and to substitute a dismal and intermittent hand-to-mouth existence for a steady job. We quickly discovered, however, that we were wrong in ascribing our own temperaments to the Chibcha Indians. There was not a youth among the swarming carcadores of Bogota who had the faintest desire to see the world. The bare thought of getting out of sound of the clanging cathedral bells filled them one and all with terror. 
For the first time we had struck the basic economic fact that the South American aboriginal prefers to starve at home rather than to live in comparative opulence elsewhere. In prehistoric times, the Indians worshipped the natural phenomena about their place of birth. Each village had its cave or tree, its stone or hill, on which it depended for protection, and the dread of getting out of reach of these still courses through their primitive minds. By dint of repeated packing and throwing away, we reduced our fundamental necessities to little more than the contents of two swollen suitcases. Word of our nefarious project to contract a carrier to bear these to some far-off unknown world reached the last hovels of the suburbs. But the cargadores we approached quickly named an exorbitant wage and fled at the first opportunity. It was not a question of load, but of the road. Hayes enticed a sturdy fellow upstairs one day and pointed out our baggage on top of an enormous chest. The Indian calmly picked up, chest and all, murmuring cheerfully, mm, A little heavy, senores, but I can do it. Where to? When we suggested a long trip, however, horror crept into his eyes. Though his unemotional Indian face showed none of it, and naming an impossible fee, he slowly and silently slid backward through the door. To our surprise, a man captured late on the day before we planned to start did not show this customary fear. He proved to be a native of the Tierra Caliente, eager to get back to his tropical home, and asserted that his ability to carry four arrobas, one hundred pounds, day after day. Our baggage weighed far less than that. Why not take a contract to go with us by the month, I suggested. Como que paragan los señores? He queried reflectively. We'll pay you, I answered, setting the sum so high that Hayes, to whom money was always a minor detail, could not charge me with losing this eleventh hour opportunity, twelve hundred dollars a month and food. We could see that he fell for it at once and was merely procrastinating in hopes of getting more. That dream vanished. He announced that he must have a new hat and rana for so important a journey. We agreed to supply these. When he turned up at six in the morning ready to start, he did not turn up. When we had shivered into our clothes and gone to hang over our reja, cargadores, male and female, were already plentiful in the wintry mist-draped plaza below. Squatted inside their ruanas, or wandering aimlessly about with a rope over one shoulder. Out of regard for the proprieties, we beckoned to none but the men. It was some time before one who perhaps had not heard our plans appeared at the door. We were careful to mention only the first town, a short day's journey away, and offered fifty cents, at least twice what he averaged in daily earnings. Convinced we would give no more, he accepted. This time we took good care that he should not escape. When he had bound the load with his rope, the cargador's one indispensable possession, we put him outside and went to breakfast. On our return, we found him waiting, naturally. He prepared for the journey, not as we of the north would expect, by balancing the suitcases on opposite sides, but by slinging them both on his back the rope cutting deeply into his shoulder, and sent off bent so low, the weight chiefly on his hips, that he seemed some deformed creature shuffling along behind us. At last we were off. Marching out of the main plaza of Bogota at eight on the morning of August 1st, in our flannel shirts, even with our coats still on, we set all the capital staring as we passed. Hayes carried a Kodak in one pocket and Ramsey's Spanish grammar in the other. My own apparatus and the overflow from my suitcase swung from a shoulder in a mochila, or woven hemp, bag. Even our one-volume library, consisting of a few favorite bits of a half-dozen languages bound into a single book, 
we had been forced to pack away on the carrier's back. We had exchanged instructions to cover any unexpected outcome of the journey. Those which Hayes had handed me consisted chiefly of the command, in the event of death with boots on, do not remove boots. The morning paper that overtook us near the statues of Columbus and Isabel announced that we had left for Quito the day before, but failed to specify on foot. Readers would have taken it for a printer's error anyway. Hayes volunteered to shadow the carrier for the first day, both experienced enough to know that the pleasure of traveling together is enhanced by traveling apart. We each set our own pace, letting our moods take color from the landscape, drifting together now and then when hungry for companionship or often enough to assure ourselves of each other's welfare. Epictetus said, as the bad singer cannot sing alone, but only in a chorus, so a poor traveler cannot travel alone, but only in company. Hayes, having a mind of his own to feed on, was by virtue thereof an excellent traveling companion. At first the way was lined with houses of sun-baked mud and peopled by dull-eyed respectful Indians and haughty horsemen. A bright sun, frequently clouded over, made it just the day for tramping in full garb. The Indian crawled along so slowly that I soon forged ahead. Beyond the outskirts, the broad upland plain was cut into irregular fields by adobe walls or fences, often tile-roofed with massive adobe gate pillars. Fields of dense green Indian corn alternated with yellow stretches of ripening grain. Here and there potatoes were being planted. Masses of big red roses, of geraniums and daisies and unfamiliar flowers frequently beautified the scene. Two hours away I caught the last view of Bogota, backed by her black mist-topped range. Then the cloistered city sank forever from our sight as the road dipped down from the slightest of knolls on the all but floor-flat plain. We had not set out to rival champion pedestrians. When appetite suggested, I stretched out at the roadside with my pocket lunch, reading Swinburne the while, and scattering him page by page on the gusty winds of the savanna. Hayes and our baggage drifted languidly past. All the day we followed a massive stone highway, built by the Spaniards of colonial times, now raised well above the flanking dirt roads preferred by the soft-footed travel of today. A large stone bridge of clumsy lines lifted us over the little Funza River, which waters the Sabana, and not far beyond we entered the ancient town of Mosquiera, on the main corner of which stood a statue of the Virgin, unusual only for the fact that she was jet black of complexion as any African chief. To the South American, the color line is not always sharp, even in his picture of the afterworld. Some time later, having drifted together again, we met an ox cart headed for Bogota. The half Indian driver struck suddenly wide eyed at the sight of our strange garb, and the burden carrier behind us cried out in consternation Como? No hay más función en Bogota? We appreciated the implied compliment. He had mistaken us for performers in the Keller Circus, a little fourth-rate affair, playing in the capital. Having no doubt saved up his billetes for weeks and started for town at last with the price of admission to this wonderful function, he was quite naturally dismayed to meet what seemed to be the show trekking southward before he arrived. At three we strolled into the Cerezuela, officially named Madrid. Hayes's pedometer registered seventeen miles. In the little one-story hotel, gaping with astonishment at our appearance, we were assigned to a mat-carpeted room opening on the patio and furnished with two wooden beds exactly five feet long, with very thin reed mattresses over the board flooring that took the place of springs. In this climate there was only little gain in traveling leisurely and arriving early. Except for a few hours near noon, 
it was too cold to lounge along the way. Once arrived, we could only wander aimlessly about among stupid villagers, uncommunicative as their mud-baked walls. By dark, it had grown too wintry to sit reading with comfort, even had there been any other light than the pale flicker of a small candle. There was nothing left but to go to bed, and that had little of the pleasure the phrase suggests to American ears. When Hayes set his feet against the footboard, his lips nearly reached his miniature pillow. He complained of feeling like a victim of a trunk mystery. Some time in the night I awoke to hear him growling, No wonder these people are crooked. My own was a folding bed, in that I had to fold up to get into it. Though we were afoot at chilly six, at nine we were still seeking a cargador. The one from Bogota had fled during the darkest hours. Moreover, he had evidently spread startling reports of our plans. In a town swarming with gaunt and ragged out-of-works, we were a long time finding a man who admitted that he sometimes plied the vocation of carrier. His attitude was that of an heir to unlimited wealth, whiling away the days until he came into his own by an occasional choice and easy task. After an endless oration in which he assured us, times without number, that he was poor but honest, just the man required for our very valuable baggage, which the expensive leather boxes proved it, and which in his hands would be perfectly safe amongst the robbers that swarmed in the road ahead, providing we walked close beside him. He admitted his willingness as a special favor to accompany us to La Mesa, eighteen miles away, for the paltry sum of two hundred dollars. We offered fifty, and he left in well-feigned scorn. At the alcalde's office the official had been due only an hour or so, and naturally had not yet arrived. We spread our resplendent documents before his hump-shouldered secretary, demanding a cargador at once. That's the way the haughty traveler always did in the accounts we had read of journeys in the Andes. But Sarasuela was evidently ill-trained. The secretary stepped to the door and beckoned a few haughty rag displays nearer, suggesting in a soft voice that perhaps, as a great favor to him personally, one of them would go with los senores and carry a very light little bundlet. One by one they replied in as solemn tones as if they fancied we believed them, that they were already engaged for the day, that they had a lame knee, or a sore back, or an exacting spouse, or were in mourning for a mother's third cousin, and faded silently away. Among the last to go was our original poor but honest applicant, who paused to ask whether the offer we had made was fifty dollars paper or fifty dollars gold, because if we meant the latter, he... Just then the alcalde's perfume gladdened our nostrils, and one of the men, rounded up by a soldier, having accepted what was still an exorbitant day's wages, we were off at last. The day was bright and sunny. Behind, across the savanna, masses of white clouds hung over unseen Bogota and her distant black range. I could keep pace with rain in the face, as Hayes had dubbed our new acquisition, only by holding each foot for a second or more before setting it down. If I paused to let him get a little bit ahead, he was sure to wait for me a few yards beyond. Ten cents spent in a little wayside drunkery gave him new life, but only for a short half-hour. Once he fell in with a friend driving an empty donkey, and for a space we moved a little less slowly. Then the friend turned off towards his village, and with a groan, rain in the face, took up his burden again, and crawled snail-like behind me. Soon after we came to the edge of the world, the savanna had ended abruptly. Before us lay a great swirling white mist into which disappeared the old Spanish highway 
that led in broad, low steps down and ever down into an unseen abyss. The carrier began to tremble visibly. The year before, he confided in a choked whisper, he had been held up here by bandits who had killed and robbed his employer. Only when one of us went close in front and the other at his heels could he be induced to move forward and downward. Now and then a group of Indians, men and women as heavily burdened as their pack animals, loomed forth from the clouds and toiled slowly upward past us. An hour down we came upon a rock grotto, into which bareheaded arrieros were crawling with lighted candles. It is, explained one of them, the San Antonio once appeared here, and all caminantes stop to pray, because he aids, protects, and betters us. Are you sure? I asked, curious to hear his answer. Sure, he cried, staring at me with startled eyes. Senor, I have been arriero on this road since I was a boy, always bringing a candle for San Antonio. In all these years, I have been robbed only three times, and then I had no money. He crossed himself thrice in the intricate South American manner and sped noiselessly away into the clouds after his animals. It may have been our failure to offer tribute to the saint of the grotto that all but brought our expedition to grief thus early. The mist had thinned, and the landscape that opened out became more and more tropical. A single palm tree, then clusters of them, grew up beside me. Banana plants and clumps of bamboo, like gigantic ferns, nodded sluggishly. A spreading tree, pink with blossoms, added the needed touch of color. Suddenly I realized that my companions were not with me, and sat down to wait. A half hour passed. I strolled back along the road, then hurried upward at a sharper pace. Fully a mile up I sighted Hayes, driving the wobbly-kneed Indian before him. They had already tiptoed on the edge of an adventure. Barely had I passed from view when there had fallen in with them, one by one, four evil-faced fellows carrying sugar-cane staffs. As thirst came, each fell to peeling and munching his cane. Hayes, lost in some problem of Urdu philology, was suddenly recalled to the material world by a throat gurgling from rain in the face. He looked up to find the four wayfarers, long sheath knives in hand, still ostensibly engaged in peeling sugar cane, but closing in around him and the shivering cargador. Hayes had taken for fiction the stories of dangers on the road, and his automatic was packed away on the carrier's back. But he had been too long a soldier to betray anxiety in the face of danger. The quartet continued their innocent occupation, crowding ever closer, but had not quite summoned up courage to try their fortunes against so stern-featured a gringo when they fell in with another group of travelers, and the four gradually faded away behind. Thenceforth we took care to wear our weapons in plain sight. Rain in the face had with great difficulty been coached to his feet again. When darkness fell, he was still wheezing, slowly onward from the day's goal. The abrupt stony descent was broken now and then by sharp rises, and we stumbled and sprawled over uncounted loose stones and solid boulders. At length, white huts began to stand dimly forth from the night, the voices of unseen groups in doorways under faintly suggested thatch roofs fell silent with astonishment as we passed, and in a climate in pleasant contrast to that of nighttime Bogota, we entered the last little hotel of La Mesa. Rain in the face set down his load for the last time with a stage groan, grasped his fee after the customary plea for more, and with the parting information that he was poor but honest, raised his wreck of a straw hat and disappeared to be seen no more. Morning found us in a long town on a shelf edge overhanging a great tumbled valley, still a mile above sea level, again facing the problem of how to make our baggage get up and walk. 
When we had tramped a hot and stony half day without getting a yard farther on our journey, we returned to the hotel. Hayes stretched out and over his bed and drew out his faithful Ramsey, bent on drowning his worldly troubles in study. The first sentence that stepped forth from the page, inviting translation into Spanish, asserted, In South America are many arid regions, through which travel and transportation of baggage is difficult. Yet there are those who hold the textbooks are not closely related to practical life. Well on in the day, however, we did get two feeble youths to agree to carry a suitcase each to Girardot for a hundred and eighty dollars and third-class fare back to La Mesa. At this rate, we could soon have better afforded to build a railroad. Indeed, we had already reduced to an absurdity the experiment of trying to mix the tramp and the gentleman. A sahib, says Kim, is always tied to his baggage. It dominates every movement and is, after all, of scant value in proportion to the burden it imposes. Hire a carrier, and he is always intruding upon your dreams and meditations, and with all the expense and trouble, no article of the pack can you lay your hands on during all the day's tramp. Moreover, I am not of that kidney that can make a beast of burden of my fellow man. I soon found that a cargador toiling under my load behind me made me far more weary than to carry it myself. We decided to revert to type at the next halt and play the sahib no longer. The road, now chiefly deshecho, unmade, descended swiftly into the genuine tropics and the next afternoon we sweated into Girardot on the Magdalena, a month from the day we had left it to ascend to Bogota. For all our resolutions, however, neither of us contemplated with pleasure the prospect of turning ourselves into pack animals. We set afoot word that we would pay a high monthly wage to any lad with a stout back and no particular grade of intelligence who would consent to leave home but the youths of Girardot were even less ambitious than those of the capital. We set a time limit, advanced it, and at last fell upon our possessions with a rage of despair. What we did not succeed in throwing away we made into two bundles of the maximum weight allowed by parcel post and sent them down the Magdalena to Panama and Quito. We were forced to sacrifice even the one-volume library which did not matter, for we had found it more convenient to buy native novels and toss them away leaf by leaf, thus daily reducing our load. Moreover, we had resolved to read, thenceforth, only the literature of the country in which we were traveling. Even then there swung from our shoulders some fifteen pounds each, besides the awkward developing tank filled with films and chemicals with which we alternately burdened ourselves when we crossed the little toll bridge over the Magdalena, and leaving the department of the Cunindamarca behind, struck off into that of Tolima. An extensive plain, half desert with drought now, blazing hot and sandy, spread far away before us. At first, mud huts were frequent, and many country people passed driving drooping donkeys. Curs abounded. Here and there a leper squatted beside the trail, languidly holding out his supplicating stumps. Everywhere were the rock-hard hills of termite ants, sharp-pointed as the volcanoes of Guatemala, while trains of stinging red ones crossed the road at frequent intervals. Fields of tobacco and corn stood shriveled beneath the unclouded sun. Troops of horses and mules laden with the narcotic weed rolled into cigarros de ambalema and wrapped in dry plantain leaves, shuffled past in the dust before their shrieking and whistling arrieros bound for Girardot and modern transportation. The Camino Real, still a royal highway in spite of its condition, passed now and then through the clumsy swinging gates that marked the limits of otherwise unbounded haciendas. We met several haughty horsemen in Juanas and the conventional wealth of accoutrement, 
and once a cavalcade of men and women, the latter lurching uncomfortably back and forth on their high side saddles. The half-Indian peon dog-trotting behind them carried on his back a large chair with a sheet over it, only the squalling that accompanied him suggesting what it contained. The caste system was noticeable even here on the broad plain. When we had carriers behind us, natives afoot raised their hat, and horsemen gave us friendly greetings. Now, with our possessions on our backs, we received only frozen stares, except from an occasional peon who grunted at us as equals. A few miles beyond the Magdalena, we came to the parting of the ways. One sandy trail left south to Nieva and Popeyan, the other, with which we swung to the right, struck off for Ibaque and the Quindío Pass over the central cordillera of the Andes. We took this longer route to Quito, that we might traverse the great Cauca Valley. The pedometer registered a mere ten miles when we halted at an adobe hut that to the natives was a very fine posada. A bedraggled old woman pottered nearly two hours over a stick fire in the back yard before she brought us two fried eggs and a small dish of fried plantains as succulent as wooden chips. Our bed she prepared by throwing a reed mat on the hardest earth floor known to geography and by no means as level as the surrounding plain. My shoes and leggings did poor service as a pillow, and Hayes charged Ramsey with lack of foresight in not binding his grammar in upholstered plush. We were awakened from the first nap by the hubbub of a group of fellow travelers, nearly all women, who piled their bundles in a corner and stretched themselves out on such floor space as we had left unoccupied. Yet the ethics of the road are such in Spanish America that we felt no misgiving in leaving our unprotected possessions on a bench at the door. With the first hint of dawn, our fellow lodger stole silently away. Hayes was still abed when I struck off in a gorgeous morning across a sea of light brown bunch grass, surrounded on all sides by far off mountain ranges. Behind, blue-purple with distance, the faces of the plateau on which sits Bogota in its solitude stretched wall-like across the eastern horizon, high indeed, yet how slightly above the earth as a whole. Ahead, the snow-clad, rounded cone of Tolima stood sharply forth above a nearer range that cut off its base, while a tumbled mountain landscape beyond promised less monotonous if more laborious days to come. A native carpenter working on the new toll bridge over the brawling Coyo River assured us that he would much rather be on the road with us, but that, unfortunately, he was contracted. For a time, broken ground and rocky foothills cut down our progress. Soon we were back again on a level plain of vast extent, a bit higher than the preceding, a garden spot in fertility, though largely uncultivated, with mountains on every hand and Tolima close on the west. As I had already found in Honduras, these upland plains perfectly level, covered with grass but for a threading of faint paths, all following the same general direction, afford the finest walking in the world. Never hard, always high enough to catch a cool breeze, often shaded, generally winding enough to avoid the monotony of a straight road, they make the journey like strolling across an endless lawn or through some vast orchard. Now and then we passed a tinkling mule train, a horseman, or an Indian, short-distance pedestrian, but never a vehicle to disturb the reflective peace of a perfect tramp. Every hour or two we drifted together, generally at a hut selling huarapo, a half-fermented beverage of crude sugar and water, tasting mildly like cider and extremely thirst-quenching. Every species of pack animal appeared, mules, horses, donkeys, steers, bulls, women, children, and even men, all toiling eastward. Often a dozen horses marched in a sort of lockstep, the halter of each tied to the tail of the animal ahead. Many had one or both ears cropped short, not by some accident or gratuitous cruelty, as we first imagined,
but as a system of branding. Now and then a shifting load brought an arriero running to throw his rana over an animal's eyes, blindfolding it until it was prepared to go on again. One mule train of more than forty animals was loaded with large boxes marked Ausvergut, Antwerpen, Cologne, Buenaventura. German goods consumed in Bogota often make this roundabout journey to Panama by ship, to Buenaventura by train over the western range, and more than halfway across Colombia on pack animals, all to avoid the exorbitant rates of English owned steamers up the Magdalena. The haciendas of this region, producing chiefly tobacco, are owned by absentee landlords and managed by mayordomos. The peon laborers are paid twenty cents a day with food. Arrieros on the road average fifty cents a day and find themselves. A few of the latter pause to inquire our destination and otherwise satisfy a fathomless curiosity. Our usual answer, alcalca, always brought forth a startled, ¿Cómo? Por tierra? By land? In the Andes, the expression is used with no thought of the sea as an alternative, but as the opposite of a caballo on horseback. Occasionally, we purposely astounded an inquirer by telling the whole truth. After a speechless moment in which his face clouded over with an unspoken accusation, he usually answered that though we might perhaps fancy we were walking to Quito, we were misinformed, and hurried on after his animals without even the customary adios. Now and then we met a lone arriero, singing his troubles to the solitude, as a Colombian poet has it, and once I was overtaken by a man who cried breathlessly as soon as his voice could reach me, I visto, senor, un muchachito con un burro vacío, to which I could only reply, no, I regret to have to tell you that I have not seen a small boy with an empty donkey watched the distracted fellow race on over the horizon. We early discovered the uselessness of asking countrymen of the Andes that simple little question, how far is it to? Ramsey himself could not have catalogued all the strange answers we received, even in the first few days. A few of them ran, perhaps an hour, senor. Only an hour? No more, senor but because there is much cuesta, ascent or descent, perhaps it is two or three hours. Or the reply came, How far? On foot or on horseback, senor? Or more often, By sea or by land? Some tossing of their heads towards the sun replied, At evening prayers you are there. Or shook their heads with, No al Hassan, you will not arrive, senores. Todavía lejos, it is still far. How far, more or less, an hour or three days? Uh, between the two, senores. Three leagues, then? No, senores, much more. Sigue nomás. Just keep on going. Al otro latido, on the other little side. A la vueldita, no más. Around the little corner, no more. Arribita. A little above. No mas bajita queda. Just down below it remains. And so on, through all the gamut of misinformation. Never a simple, so many miles. Above all, it was fatal to ask a leading question. The misinformant was sure to agree with us at all cost, evidently out of mere politeness. One might fancy the ancient rulers of the Andes demanded an affirmative answer from their subjects on penalty of death, and the supposition would account for many of the stories of miraculous appearances, of place names and the like gathered by the conquistadores. At best, we were assured, no hay donde perece, there is no place to lose yourselves, and were almost sure to strike within ten minutes a misleading fork in the trail. With fifteen miles behind us, I slipped gratefully 
from under my awkward thirty pounds before one of a cluster of thatched huts called Hotel Mi Casa, on the earth floor of which two broken-legged cots were placed for us. Water to drink was doled out grudgingly. Washing was a luxury none indulged in. Hayes was busy consuming six homemade cigars called tobaccos comunes that had cost him a sum total of one cent. As we sat before the hovel, watching the sunset throw its reflections on the red cliffs of the range behind us, the day went out like an extinguished lamp, and the stars came suddenly forth in striking brilliancy. The north star of our home sky was now below the horizon, and many a long month was due to pass before we should see it again. The plateau ahead was even vaster than it seemed. I had walked hours next morning by one of the easy haphazard upland trails, and still it lay endlessly before me. Clumps of short squat trees flecked it with shadows here and there, but for the most part it was bare, alike of planting, of nature or man. Cattle grazed on every hand, and mule trains went and came frequently. In every direction stood row upon row of jagged mountain ranges, fading away into the haziest distance. They seemed of a world wholly cut off from the whispering stillness of the broad brown plain. Turning, I could see untold mile upon mile behind me. The blue central cordillera that shut off the valley of the Cauca lay piled into the sky ahead. Like a hare on a colored glass, I could make out our sharply ascending trail of the days to come, crawling upward toward the Quindio. On the rim of the mountain lap that holds Ibaque, spread about a bulking church at the base of the first great buttresses of the chain, I came upon Hayes in the shade of a leper's hut. Before the marks of his ailment came upon him, the outcast had climbed with his mules for many years back and forth over the great barrier, and something like a tear glistened in his eye as we turned our faces toward the land of his youth. The Hotel Paris, in the town below, looked a century old, with its quaint wooden rejas of colonial days to peer out through, and also in at, as a half-intoxicated Ipajeno demonstrated by thrusting his face in upon us while we were battling with the stains of travel. When I took him to task, he answered wonderingly, Why, everyone does it, senor and refused to take any hint short of a basin of water. Ibaque, capital of the province of Tolima, claims 2,300 souls. The count takes much for granted. It is a peaceful, roomy little town on a gentle grassy slope where every resident has ample space to put up his chalky little straw-roofed cottage, yet all tow the street line as if fearful of missing anything that might unexpectedly pass. Square cornered with almost wholly one-story buildings, its calles are atrociously cobbled, the few sidewalks worn perilously slippery, and barely wide enough for two feet at once. A stream of crystal clear water gurgles down each street through cobbled gutters, lulling the travel weary to sleep and furnishing a convenient means of washing photographic films. We drank less often, however, after we had strolled up to the edge of the mountain and found three none-too-handsome ladies bathing in the reservoir. On a corner of the grass-grown plaza, the nephews of Jorge Isaacs, greatest of Colombian novelists, runs a clothing store. But it was our misfortune to find them out of town. On another corner, I made my way up an aged stone stairway of one of the rare two-story buildings of Ipague to the alcalde's office. It was lined with dog-eared documents, all handwritten, each batch marked with a year, before which lounged clerks incessantly rolling cigarettes. When he had read our government paper in stage whisper, the youthful mayor at once put the town entirely at our disposal. 
I suggested schools. Senor Ministro de Instrucción Pública, he called out with long oratorical cadences. Instantly there tiptoed into the room a long, tremulous man of fifty, almost shabbily dressed, though of course with what had once been a white collar, with a pedagogical cast of countenance, and a chin barely an inch below his upper lip. He bowed low at the alcalde's orders and answered that the matter would be attended to at once. Manana. Toward ten next morning, the minister of public instruction, who had evidently laundered his collar during the night, left a long line of people waiting and set off with me. They are only teachers waiting for their appointments or salaries, he explained. We halted before a large building. The minister knocked meekly with his cane on the heavy sajuan, the door to the patio, and was finally admitted by a square-faced, muscular, unshaven priest who listened to our request at some length and at last led us to an older churchman, suave, slender, outwardly effusive, and of that perfectly polished exterior that marks the Jesuit. He was also French. When time enough had elapsed to give warning of our coming, he led the way into a room of first-grade pupils all boys of six or seven, except two full-grown Indian youths. An exceedingly young priest, giving an excellent imitation of surprise at our appearance, snapped a sort of wooden hand-clapper, and the entire class rose to their feet, bowing profoundly. Some other formality was imminent when I begged the teacher to go on with the lesson just as if I were not there. He exchanged a glance with his superior at this extraordinary gringo request, then lined the class up in military ranks and set them to reading aloud. The theme was strictly religious in nature, and most of the words of four or five syllables. As often as the clapper sounded, the boys changed to next, and read with such fluency that only the tail end of a phrase here and there was intelligible. The priest made no corrections or criticisms whatever, taught, indeed, as he might have turned a hurdy-gurdy handle. I fancied the pupils extraordinarily well trained, until I strolled down the room to the evident horror of the adults and noted that almost none of them had the book open at the page they were reading. In a higher grade room I was asked to choose the lesson, and I suggested geography. A youth passed a pointer swiftly over a wall map, spinning off a description learned by rote of the principal cities, the youthful priest lifting him back on track whenever he forgot the exact language of the original and came to a wordless halt. Little helpful hints accompanied each question. A boy stood before the map of Colombia, on which the capital was printed in enormous letters. What city did Quesada found? In 1538, asked the priest. Blank silence from the boy. The priest. Bo. Bogo. Bogota, shouted the boy. My fellow visitors smiled complacently at his wisdom. And what place is this? quizzed the teacher, pointing to a strip of land that curved like a tail up into the corner of the map. Pa? Pana, Panama, shrieked the boy, a province of Colombia which is now in rebellion, the... He was evidently going to go on with still more startling information when the all but imperceptible twitching of an eye of the Jesuit superior turned the pointer to other clients. The teacher never lost an opportunity to give a religious twist to the proceedings. A boy whose pointer hovered over the Mediterranean mumbled, and another of the cities is Nicaea. Ah, cried the priest, and what celebrated event in the history of mankind took place in Nicaea? The great council of the church in which began the youth, and rattled on as glibly as if he had been there in person. When we had turned out into the street, the shabby little minstrel became confidential, explaining that the colegio toward which we were headed 
had once held a large student body. But now, senor, owing to political changes, before the priest interfered, I had an excellent, experienced, normal graduate in charge of that first class, he sighed as we parted. And now we have that boy in a cassock. Bah! We left Ibagué by taking the wrong road and had to crawl for miles along the steep bank of a mountain stream almost back to town before we were set right. Then began one of the greatest climbs of our joint careers. Round and round, in intoxicating zigzags, went the trail, as if dizzy at the task before it, down into several gullies, until at last, finding no other means of escape, it took to clambering laboriously upward. At first the weather was hot, then gradually cooled, as far-reaching views of Ibagué and its surroundings spread out below us. The buttresses of the range ahead were enormous, as if nature, planning to build here such a mountain chain as never before, had started the outcropping supports on her most gigantic scale. Toward nine I realized that I was out of the sunshine and no longer sweating, despite the swiftness of the ascent. At ten I paused to pick wild strawberries along the way. It did not seem possible to mount much further, for there was nothing higher visible. But like Jack of the Beanstalk, I climbed on entirely out of sight, into the clouds that wholly shut off the world below. At noon, when I stretched out on a swift slope to read a few pages of Maria, immense reaches of mountains, and cloud-stenciled valleys half-hidden by masses of snow-white mist like drapery that concealed yet revealed their plump feminine forms, lay everywhere below and about me. Over all the tumbled view were scattered little huts of mountaineers, each in a setting it seemed possible to have reached only on wings. The hovel where we planned to spend the night refused us posada, and as dusk fell we faced an all but perpendicular mountain wall up the stony, half-wooded face of which the trail staggered. The few groups of men we met carried ancient rifles loosely, as if constantly ready for action. At dark I toiled to a summit to find Hayes standing before a mud rancho, arguing with crude mountaineers who would have sent us on into the night with a threadbare Spanish prevarication. Only a little further on there is another house, all ready to receive you. In its utter lack of comfort, the place resembled the mountain hamlets of northwestern Spain. The people were shy, yet once won over, kind-hearted. There is no bed, they explained, but there is perhaps a leather you can sleep on. By and by, the women called us into the kitchen for a bowl of caldo, hot water with chunks of potato and an egg dropped in, served with coarse cornbread. Then the man led the way to a cell made entirely of mud, even the bench along the wall on which he laid a hairy sun-dried cowhide. Fortunately, he returned a little later with several aged gunny sacks, a tiny girl lighting the way with a rope-like native candle, or we should not have slept even the little bit we did. Streaks of pale day were beginning to steal through the chinks in our chamber when the woman appeared with black coffee and a stony corn biscuit, and we were off for another day of stiff ups and downs. Stalking down a knee-breaking descent, I heard a shout of astonishment from Hayes ahead. What looked like an ordinary mountain stream cut across the trail at the bottom of a sharp little gully, but the water coming from the bowels of Tolima, that stood somewhere above us in the mists of morning, was almost hot. We had both been on the road in many a climb, but never before where nature was kind enough to heat a morning bath for us. We lost no time in stripping for a luxury rare to the traveler in Colombia. Not far beyond we came to the edge of the valley of the Toche. Away below, like a miniature painting, reposed a peaceful little vale wholly shut in by sheer mountain walls a thread-like stream meandering the length of it. It took us an hour to make the swift, stony descent. 
Not all get down so safely as the skeletons of a horse, a mule, their shoes still on, testified. The valley floor, watered by the rock-broiling stream, was a fertile patch of earth, and the steep mountain flanks were planted far up with little perpendicular patches of corn. All the scene seemed as far removed from the wide world as if on another sphere. A rocky trail climbed abruptly out of the valley, again from the further end, higher than ever, past rare houses, built of the red boards of a tree called Cedro, from the doors of which stared shy, half-friendly people in bedraggled tatters. The Quindío Pass lies only 11,440 feet above the sea, but that by no means represents the climbing necessary to surmount the central cordillera of the Andes. What is so called is really a long series of ranges, and no sooner did the road reach some lofty summit than it dived as swiftly and roughly down again. It was not a planned road, like the highways of the Alps, but one grown up of itself. A jaguar once wandered over the cordillera. A man followed, and today the route holds to the same course. Toiling like draft animals, gasping for breath in the rarefied air, we fancied a score of times that we had reached the summit only to see the trail take another switchback and disclose the perfidious fact that it had found another ridge to surmount. A few hundred feet above the toche began clumps, then entire forests of tall, slender wax palms, a species named by Humboldt on his journey over the Quindío. Having only a tuft of branches at the top, these were often torn off by the winds that rage down through the gullies, leaving a thing as unromantic as a telegraph pole. The valley below opened out unto half a world, dull brown with a tinge of green, below and around us. Words are hopelessly inadequate to describe this bird's-eye view of range upon range, climbing pell-mell one over the other as if in terror to escape some savage pursuer, and fading away into the dimmest misty-blue distance. The sun was low when we came out on as far-reaching a view ahead, and saw the morrow's task laid out before us in the form of a thread-like road twisting away out of sight over a great mountain barrier draped in the clouds, the Puro Quindío, or chief range at last. As night descended, we entered Volacancito, an unusually large adobe building on a bleak slope. The dining room, which was also the back corridor, was overrun by a large family, chiefly small girls, each in a single, thin, knee-high cotton garment, despite the wintry mountain air. Chickens, dogs, and gaunt, self-assertive pigs wandered everywhere without restraint. In a corner slouched a woman, sewing garments too small for the smallest child in sight. Our plea for lodging she treated with scorn. Volacancito was a posada, not a hotel. The difference between the two in Spanish America being that, in a hotel, the traveler is permitted to expect certain conveniences, while in a posada he accepts, with smiling gratitude, whatever fortune chooses to furnish him. "'We have only two guest rooms,' snapped the woman, when we persisted, as if the mere giving of the information was an unusual favor. One this senor has with his wife and baby. The others belong to the arrieros. The successful guest was an actor on his way from the Cauca to Bogota. A handsome fellow, much overdressed for such a journey, with a strikingly beautiful young wife, as we noted at a glance through the door. But there are five rooms on this side of the house, I suggested. Family rooms, shot back the woman. And this little room in the corner? Belongs to the servant, she mumbled, projecting her lips toward a slatternly young female who was at that moment pursuing a thieving pig from the dungeon-like kitchen. Anything will do, sighed Hayes, gazing abstractedly after the servant. 
but the landlady was in no mood for crude jokes. There is a fine house with rooms and beds, just four cuadros on, she lied, after a long silence. Fortunately, this was by no means my first experience with a favorite trick of the Spanish-speaking races to be rid of importunate guests, or we might have tramped all night on the mountain top in a cold and penetrating as that of January in our own land. I slipped surreptitiously from under my pack, assuming the ingratiating manner that is the last resort with the apathetic people of the Andes. We were resolved to spend the night there, though it be walking on the floor. Nothing is more fatal than to appear anxious in such situations, however, and we affected indifference and a pretense of having accepted her verdict. What fine red-cheeked little girls she had, so pretty and healthy. Indeed, they looked like Irish children. Was she not from the Cauca? She was. Ah, the magnificent Cauca, the most beautiful. She was soon lost in a panegyric of her native valley, as she shuffled from the kitchen to sewing machine and back again. Magnificent indeed, I agreed, and in only a day or two we shall be there. So what matters a night of freezing in the mountains? By the way, la senora can perhaps sell us a bit of coffee and a bite to eat before we set out to tramp all night? She grunted assent, and half hour later we were seated before a plentiful, if not epicurean, meal. Before we had finished it, she remarked casually that we might arrange ourselves in the room for the arrieros. The mule driver is seldom a pleasant bedfellow, but compared with a night out of doors, probably with rain, at more than two miles above sea level, any arrangement was welcome. We fancied lodging had first been refused us because we were foreigners. Soon after supper, we were undeceived. Out of the darkness came the sound of a horse's hoofs, and as it ceased there burst in upon us a handsome young Colombian of somewhat dissolute features in the ruana, false trouser legs, ringing cartwheel spurs, and the other hundred and one details of equipment that the rules of society require of a Colombian of the gente decente rank who travels a horse. He gave greeting in the explosive speech of his class and requested lodging. No, I, answered the woman, in the identical cold monotone she had used towards us. The newcomer began dancing on air, waving his ladylike hands on which gleamed several rings. Eloquence worthy of a world congress poured from his lips. His eyes seemed to spurt fire. No, I, repeated the landlady in the same dead voice. But, senora, it is imperative. I have a lady with me. Anything will do. Such as these rooms. Family rooms, snapped the Calcana as if reciting a learned dialogue. But your guest rooms. One this senor has with his wife and baby. The others belong to the arrieros, and also, jerking her head slightly towards us, to these two caballeros. But what am I to do? shrieked the Colombian. And a lady with me. The woman muttered a, Quien sabe? with a careless shrug of the shoulders, and continued her sewing without looking up. After a last vain oration, the Colombian dashed off angrily, his horseback garment standing out at excited angles, and rode away into the night, the way we had come, toward better luck perhaps, among the huts at the bottom of the valley. Bedtime comes at about seven in these wintry, fireless, lightless regions. The landlady, now thoroughly mollified, broke off some story of the wonders of the Cauca to say, Next to the room of the arrieros is a harness room where you can sleep alone. Many ingleses, all light-haired foreigners are Englishmen to the rural Colombian, have slept in it. Why had she not offered us this upon our arrival? Lack of confidence, probably, common to these simple people, as is the good-heartedness that can be unearthed by a few simple wiles and flatteries. The dungeon-like room was narrow, but long and high, strewn 
with the aparejo of mules and the crude implements of husbandry, with harnesses, pack saddles, and a chaos of trappings, but with space left to spread on the earth floor several tar cloth wrappings of mule loads. Moreover, the woman sent us a blanket. Later, a boy entered carrying a candle and a little round hard pillow, which he delivered with speech apologetic but diminutives, after the fashion of the country people of the Andes. Aquí tienen ustedes una amaljadita para poner la cabecita. For all these unexpected luxuries, I can hardly say we slept well. Before an hour had passed, a polar winter began to creep up through the earth floor, through the tar cloth, through our flesh and bones, and what with the aching of hips and other salient points that fitted the uneven earth poorly, the night passed in an endless series of dream fights against death in the polar seas. As my legs grew cold beyond endurance, I found a pair of zamaras, the false trouser legs of impervious cloth worn by horsemen of the region but my glee quickly evaporated, for they proved to be designed for a half-grown boy. Humboldt spent ten days in passing the Quindío. We sincerely hoped he had been better supplied with blankets, even though his journey was in the summer season. For once we felt no anger when a hoarse rooster at last greeted the first graying of the darkness. The entire night had been a half-conscious battle for the cobija that had covered us alternately. With creaking legs, I stepped out into the icy dawn and washed in a wind that cut me through as a rapier through a man of straw. It was still gray-black, and vast seas of half-seen mist lay in the bottomless chasms round about. Far away to the east, where the dawn and the warmth came from, was a triangular patch of sky low down between two ranges, and roofed with black clouds, in which the brilliant sunshine of the Tierra Caliente was already blazing red. One of the bravest acts of my life was the stripping and changing to road garb, after which we joined the family and our fellow guests, huddled under shawls and blankets, with folds of wooden cloth about their throat and over their noses. The landlady, still abed, issued orders from within to her bare-legged girls and the servant. One of these threw into the pot of boiling water a mud ball of native chocolate, swirled the mess with a stick, and served it to us with a dough-cake mixture of mashed corn and rice. It was no homeopathic food, but none lasts long in this thin, exhilarating air while climbing swift mountain flanks. When we inquired for our bill, the woman called out, that we owed twenty cents each, and bade us Godspeed to her beloved Cauca. The road was heavy and slippery with rain that had fallen during the night, the air sharp and penetrating. We had all but spent the night on the summit of the Quindío, for the highest point was but three miles beyond, though three miles of climbing without respite. Most of the world was shut off by great cloud banks, out of which came frequently the bawling of arrieros cursing their weary animals upward. Now and then we stopped on knolls above the trail to watch these Andean freight trains pass. Many of the pack animals were bulls and steers, of slight strength as such compared to the horse or mule, but the surest, if slowest, cargo beast in muddy going. The arrieros, almost without exception, wore as ruanas what had once been United States mail sacks, the stripes and lettering still clear upon them. There were several ridges so nearly alike in altitude that the exact summit might easily have been in dispute, but at last we reached the dividing line between the departments of Tolima and the Cauca, marked with a weathered, blackened post planted round about with scores of little twig crosses set up by pious arrieros and travelers. We were so completely surrounded by impenetrable swirling mist that we could see nothing whatever but the patch of cold wet ground underfoot, a few dismal dripping bushes, and here and there 
a disheveled, shivering flower of some hardy species. Not a glimpse was to be had of snow-clad Tolima that must lie piled into the mist somewhere close at hand. It was the highest either of us had ever been in the world. While we appreciated the eminence, it was no place for men gifted with profane vocabularies to linger, and we were soon legging it down the western slope out of cloudland. End of chapter 3 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 4 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 4 Along the Cauca Valley. On the Cauca side, like the French slope of the Pyrenees, the central cordillera of the Andes descends almost abruptly to the valley. As we emerged from the clouds, a brilliant sun lighted up vast landscapes of labyrinthian hills and vales, mottled with cloud shadows, bits of our road ahead, scratched here and there, on salient, sun-polished knobs and slopes far below. With noon appeared the first broad view of the rolling Cauca Valley, nestled between the central and the western ranges, a bare thousand feet above sea level still deep blue as some mountain-girdled lake. The little town of Salento, in the lap of an undulating bright green plain, rose slowly up to meet us. We marched to the alcalde's office, in a weak-kneed building of compacted clay, only to find the alcalde, like beds for travelers, out of town. A stupid clerk, in a room full of musty papers of varying antiquity, admitted that it was too bad Salento was so astrado, but made no move to decrease that backwardness. And strangers who arrive, I asked. Generally they bring their beds with them, he replied, or if not, they do the best they can. We took the hint and forcible possession of an empty room opening on the plaza. When, after a basin bath, I strolled out into the town to mention our strange exotic desire for sleeping accommodations. A dozen of the most influential citizens also admitted it was too bad, and where did we come from and where were we going? Hayes for once had better luck. Having left the mention of beds to simmer in the mind of one Sanchez, who amused himself at shopkeeping on a corner of the square, he was called over at dark and offered the use of several woolly white blankets that hung for sale from the blackened beams of the shop ceiling. Sanchez was shocked beyond measure when we started to carry them across the plaza ourselves. He called for a boy, nine responded, and the winner expressed great gratitude when we rewarded him with a ragged paper scent. We improvised seats and sat gazing out through the wooden reja. Far away on a fuzzy hillside, our road of the morning grew dim and faded out, like an unfixed photograph, and the night, lighted only by stars, quickly settled down. Out of its black immensity came a little later the jangling of tiny bells. Across the plaza filed a half a hundred boys in columns of twos, weirdly lighted by flickering torches utterly silent in their bare feet. From another direction came a similar half-seen procession of girls. The two columns joined at the door of the little bamboo church, the pagoda-like twin towers of which stood dimly forth against the background of darkness and passed within together. For an hour a weird infantile chanting in chorus sounding almost unbrokenly then the congregation filed forth again and melted away into the humid summer night. The faint silhouette of the priest showed him leaning over the reja of the second-story Casa Cural, the fitful glow of his cigarette, the only light in town, until that too died out and left only 
the brilliant tropical stars above. Beyond Salento, a rolling fertile land lay on every hand. In the great forests spreading far up the range, beside and behind us, the most conspicuous of the flora was the yarumo, a white-leaved tree that stood forth everywhere like blotches on the green landscape. The slender wax palm of the eastern slope had not passed the crest. The dense green uplands of the valley were still all but covered with virgin forests. It set us reflecting what might have been the mayflower turned southward and peopled this land of rich soil and unrivaled climate instead of that bleak, rigorous country we had left behind. Or would this peerless climate have made us, too, salientinos? At the hut, where we paid two cents for great bowls of creamy milk, there was a decision to make. One branch of the trail led to Perriera, the other to Filandia. We tossed a coin. It fell tails, and we struck off to the left by a soft dirt road. Filandia was a quaint old place, with a wonderful gingerbread church on a hilltop that rolled languidly away on all sides to far-off mountain ridges. The town seemed never to have seen a foreigner before. Perhaps travelers hitherto had all gone by way of Parriera. When I attempted to take a picture, the entire population, men, women, and the very babies, crowded so close around me that I could not fight them back to a focal distance. By the next afternoon we were in quite a different country, down in the tropics again, with coffee trees, bananas, and endless lanes of bamboo, that giant fern, as useful as it is beautiful, which nature so unkindly denied the north. It was not a temperature for the preserving of undeveloped films, and I paused with the tank beside the first clear stream. The sun gave out before I had more than hung the strips to dry. Drops of rain began to fall, and night came on apace. I pushed on, grasping a wet film in either hand. To my dismay the road turned to a narrow path through thick weeds, thigh-high, and for a long five miles with eighteen already in my legs and thirty pounds straining from my shoulders. I tramped swiftly forward, striving to hold the films out of the reach of the weeds. The natives, blacker and blacker as we descended, stared with amazement from their little bamboo shelters along the train to see a strange being scurry by, holding high above his head two black strips like Tibetan prayer sheets. Small wonder they crossed themselves in superstitious awe. The night had grown completely in about me when Hayes hailed me from an unseen doorway. He had already bespoken supper and engaged a room with a bed of split bamboo and a quilted straw mattress. For me was brought what a hard-earned candle proved to be a canvas cot made of a U.S. mail sack. In the dining room was a lounging chair of the same material. Where did you get it? I asked the woolly-haired host. What fine strong cloth! Oh, the government always has plenty of that to sell, he replied placidly. The same damp, pulsating jungle fenced us in all the next morning. Far ahead, across the heat-steaming spread of the Cauca Valley, the jagged blue line of the western cordillera that cuts it off from the Pacific stretched to north and south as far as the eye could command in some places five ranges visible one behind the other. At noon, suddenly topping a jungled knoll, we caught sight of the long-sought town of Cartago. Reddish with the hue of its roof tiles in the center of town, dying away in whitish and straw-colored lines of outskirt hovels. It was hours later that we reached the level of the valley floor and strolled in heavy grass through a bamboo-built suburb into the weedy central plaza. With a populous graveyard before the keel of the Mayflower was laid, Cartago 
has not yet advanced to what any mushroom town of our west can boast at the age of three months. Negroes were everywhere, though there was no sharp color line, and pure whites were rare. The Cauca is to Colombia what our South is to the United States. In colonial times, slaves were imported in large numbers up the Atrato River, and to this day the shiftless, happy-go-lucky African lolls in his ragged cabins, speaking a Spanish it was hard to believe was not English, so exactly did their slovenly, lazy-tongued drawl resemble that of our southern states. The hotel advertised, Camaridad, prontitude, is mero, comfort, promptness, and specklessness. The three things, above all others, a South American hotel is surest not to have. There is never an office in these hotels of the Andes. A peanut vendor somewhere up the street is manager, and all the town assists, while the traveler makes his bargain, if indeed it does not gather en masse to watch his ablutions. The rooms are commonly stark empty and are furnished to order as one selects a chicken on the hoof for the evening meal. We had to implore each and every requisite, from cots to water, separately and individually, several times over, before they were supplied. When we insisted on two towels, the young but toothless landlady, muttering something about the curious ways of los gringos, tore an aged sheet in two, and as long as we remained made us feel that guests were an unmitigated nuisance. Among the luxuries of the town was wheat bread. When we demanded it with our meals, a six-foot boy of polished jet-black skin and little other covering was sent wandering down to market with a bushel basket on his arm, and in the course of the afternoon came slouching back with three tiny buns lost in the bottom of it. But for all the slovenliness of its habits, antiquarians would have found Cartajo's hotel interesting. The barnyard patio, into which we flung our wash water, formed the parquet or stalls of the village theater. At the back of it was an open tile-roofed building of split bamboo floor and sides, violently painted, forming a stage quite similar to that of Shakespeare's day. A score of bottles hung by the neck, like corpses, at some medieval wholesale hanging, fringed the outer edge of the platform, the ends or dripping of what had been tallow candles showing that they had served as proscenium footlights. The second-story veranda, our dining room, was marked with the numbers of boxes around its three sides, from the unspeakable kitchens to the even more unmentionable servants' quarters. When plays were given, the masses stood in the yard below, and the well-to-do looked on from their chairs along the veranda. Unfortunately, histrionic talent seemed to have completely died out in Cartajo. Only the languid tinkling of a tiple, or native guitar, marked the long evenings in which we watched the golden moon rise over the bit of mossy old red roof and the tops of two lazily swaying palm trees framed by our balcony window. If my knowledge of Cartajo is meager, it is because I spent most of my days there in mailing a notebook. The post office was the lower story of a compressed mud building cornering on the plaza. When I first made my appearance, its heavy wooden doors, studded with immense spike heads, were securely bolted. Is the Correro closed today? I asked a lounger by. Si, senor. The mail only came in yesterday, but you can knock, and perhaps... Knocking brought no result. An hour or more later I tried again with no better luck. Early the next afternoon, however, I found my way in by an inner door of the patio, though the place was still officially closed. The two rooms looked much like a garret of long standing, but by no means like a post office scattered everywhere over floor and baked mud window seats on decrepit chairs and crippled tables lay fat mail bags all stout and new from the chief countries of the globe the outgoing colombian correspondence was already packed 
in aged grain sacks. Pieces of mail of all size lay tumbled and littered over the entire two rooms. Fully half of it was from the United States, particularly pamphlets and packages from patent medicine houses. Four middle-aged men, dressed in great dignity and in Cartago's most correct attire, with gloves and canes on chairs beside them, were seated around a table smoking cigarettes. I handed one of them the wrapped notebook. It passed slowly from hand to hand, each feeling it over, not so much out of curiosity, though that was by no means lacking, as absent-mindedly striving to bring his attention down to it. Then all four fell to perusing a postal union rate sheet, but found everything except the information needed. Finally, one rose and referred the matter respectfully to a man, evidently a superior, seated in state at a corner table. The rate was found to be one peso for each fifty grams. The official turned back and wandered for some time at random about the two rooms, fingering the parcel over and over and scratching his head in vain in effort to recall what he had set out to find. He discovered it at last an ancient postal scale. Tried it, found it too small, tried another, and spent an ample five minutes juggling with the odds and ends that served as weights before he computed the balance. Then he drifted languidly back to his companions in inefficiency, and opened his mouth to speak, closed it again, and rambled once more across the room to the scales. He had forgotten the weight. This time he took no chances, but announced the figures aloud, and wrote them on the parcel, 320 grams. Those who do not know the South American will have difficulty in believing that the division of this by 50, without troubling for fractions, presented a real problem. All four began penciling long lines of figures on as many sheets of paper. Several minutes passed before one of them ventured to show his result. The others compared, and, amid a sage shaking of heads, one announced solemnly, Seven cents, senor, while the rest gazed dreamily at me out of the tops of their eyes as if wondering whether I should weather the shock of so great an expense. And registered seventeen cents, I added, for I did not care to have the part lie a month or two about the earth floor of Cartajo's post office, or find its final resting place in the back yard. When the suggestion had penetrated, one of the quartet sat down to enter the grave transaction in a large ledger. I still needed a two-cent stamp. The oldest of the four shuffled to the opposite side of the table, sat down, adjusted his legs, and slowly pulled out a drawer stuffed with every manner of rubbish, tobacco, rolled cigarettes, half-empty files of patent medicine, everything that may come by mail, and finally dug up a battered pasteboard box that had once held number 60 American thread. From this he fished out a small sheet of two peso stamps, carefully tore one off at the perforations, first on one side, then on the other, put the sheet back in the thread box, the thread box back in the drawer, carefully closed the latter, and handed me the stamp. I tossed before him a silver ten-cent piece. He opened the drawer again, clawed out of a far corner a wad of those ragged, germ-infested one-cent bills indigenous to Colombia, laid out eight of them, counted them a second time, sat staring at them a long minute while his attention went on furlough, asked one of his colleagues to count them, which the latter did twice, at the same vertiginous speed, and finally pushed them towards me with a hesitative movement, as if he were sure he were losing somewhere in the transaction, but could not exactly figure out where. Meanwhile, he of the ledger rose from dotting the last I of an entry that stretched in nicely shaded copybook letters entirely across the double page, begged me to do him the honor to be seated, dipped the clumsy steel pen into the dusty inkwell, and with a wealth of politeness requested me to sign. 
When I had done so, he gazed long and dreamily at the signature, longer still at space in general, and finally put the parcel carefully away in a drawer with neither stamp nor mark of identification upon it. But, I protested, do you give no receipt for registered mail? Great excitement arose among the officials and the half dozen persons waiting ostensibly to buy a one-cent stamp. A long conference ensued. It is, senor, said the postmaster himself, rising and turning to me with regal courtesy, that no blank receipts have been sent from Bogota yet this year. However, he called aside the custodian of the precious letter and gave him long whispered instructions. The latter hunted up a sheet of foolscap, stamped it carefully with the official seal, and wrote out with long legal flourishes, for penmanship is still an art in Colombia, a receipt for the parcel. This he tore off and carried across to the postmaster, who, carefully preparing another pen, signed it with his full name, not forgetting the elaborate rubrica beneath it. Then he read it carefully over once more, seemed dissatisfied with something, and finally called the attention of the writer to the rough edge he had left in tearing off the paper, instructing him to lay it under a ruler and trim it with a sharp knife. The subordinate did so, and at last delivered to me a memento I still have in my possession. To one unacquainted with Latin American ways, the episode may seem overdrawn. I have told it, however, without exaggeration. From the moment I handed over the parcel until I emerged, receipt in hand, there had elapsed one hour and twenty minutes. Nor is such a scene unusual. From the Rio Grande southward, government offices are filled with just such human driftwood, and it is common experience to see several staid and pompous men in frock coats spend more than an hour doing what an average American boy would accomplish in two minutes. Swinging due south next morning through the perpetual summer of the flat grass carpeted Cauca Valley, we fell in with a straggling band of nearly a hundred youths. They were conscripts recruited under the new military law of Colombia. Antioqueños, chosen by lot to make up the quota of the province of Antioquia, bound south from Medellin for six months' compulsory service. The majority were crude-minded countrymen. Some, dressed in the wrecks of European suits, were undeveloped boys of the towns, hobbling painfully along on bruised and blistered feet, bare except for their cloth alparjatas. Among the latter was one Policarpo, a devil-may-care young fellow of high intelligence and considerable education, who had a very clear notion of the weak spots in his native land though no inkling of a workable remedy. Another carried a tiple, as well as a pleasing baritone voice, and struck up at every opportunity the languidly mournful music of the region. The highway now was a series of interwoven cross-country paths, fording smaller streams, crossing the larger on little bamboo bridges with faded thatched roofs. It was hot, yet not of the oppressive heat our most northern states know in midsummer. All along the way were flowers of many colors and broad vistas of greenest grass stretched far across the slightly rolling plains wherever wood and jungle did not choke it out. Bands of butterflies, often of the most gorgeous hues, flickered here and there across the face of the landscape. Insects hummed contentedly, and lizards scuttled away through the fallen leaves. Singing birds of many kinds abounded. Flocks of little parrots, brilliant green in color, flitted in and out of the bamboo groves, shrieking noisily at their games. Here and there, quinchas, fences of split bamboo of basket-like weave, shut in a little cultivated patch, and all day long the distant blue western cordillera, 
with its wrinkled folds and prominences stretching endlessly north and south, seemed to cut off the Cauca like a world apart. Then for a space there were no habitations, except an abandoned hut or two and the ruins of several raised ones. The recruits murmured something about an epidemic, but none appeared to know anything definite concerning it. At length we descended through a shallow valley, and from then on locusts, called Chapu in the Cauca, rose in vast clouds as we advanced, covering the ground before us and veiling all the landscape as with a great screen, new myriads rising at every step, until they struck us incessantly in the face and filled our ears with a sound as of some great waterfall at a distance. In Bogota, we had wondered to find an important government department entitled Comisión para la Extinción de la Langosta. Now it seemed small indeed to cope with the problem. At intervals, cactus hedges bounded the way, an organ cactus of desert land stretched forth its stiff arms into the brilliant sky. The Cauca was suffering one of its periodical droughts and the accompanying scourge of locusts, after which it would bloom again like a tropical garden. The recruits so monopolized accommodations at the village of Naranjo, which had not the remnant of an orange tree to explain its name, that we had to share a room with three none-too-white natives who permitted no ventilation whatever. At four they rose to light candles and feed their mules, and sat vociferously discussing nothing at all until daybreak. They spent more time harnessing themselves than their animals, for the Colombian never dreams of riding anything less than the complete outfit demanded by local convention, a wide-brimmed Panama hat, sombrero de junco, or the finer hippiapas, he calls it, covered his head, over his usual clothing, which must include coat, vest, cravat, gloves, and white collar, no matter how far he may be from civilization, nor what the temperature. He wears a ruana, a garment similar to the sarape of Mexico, or the poncho. In the vicinity of Bogota, this is of heavy wool and dark in color. In the Cauca, it is the ruana de hilo, of light-colored cotton, generally gay with stripes. Beneath this, the horseman wears samarras, ample false trouser legs held together by strips front and back, and leggings at the bottom. Sometimes these are of sun-dried cowhide or goat skins, shaggy with long white hair, reminiscent of the chaps of our cowboys. Far more common are those of tela de calco, rubber cloth, consisting of two thicknesses of canvas and rubber woven into an impenetrable yet flexible material nearly an eighth of an inch thick. Then comes his chilenas, huge wheel-like spurs, his rejo, or lariat of twisted rawhide hanging from his wrist, his alforjas, or leather saddlebags between his legs, his cuchucos, a long, soft leather pouch arched over the cantel of his saddle like a cavalryman's blanket roll, his long, shoe-shaped stirrups, and usually a parasol or umbrella hanging at his side, if, indeed, it does not shade him when he rides. No Colombian caballero who aspires to retain his rank as such would venture to mount a horse while lacking any item of this equipment. One trembles to think what might happen to a cacano needing to ride instantly for a doctor who could not lay hands on his samaras, who had mislaid his gloves. The Cauca was now a broad, dry, treeless region without streams, though little humped bridges lifted us across the waterless beds of what would be at other seasons, and which still retains the name of river in local parlance. Arrieros of this section put red bands about the brows of their horses and mules, perhaps only for the purpose of identification 
but giving the animals the coy appearance of coquettish girls. As we advanced, the long drought grew more and more in evidence. Across the sun-cracked valley floor lay scattered the bleached bones of scores of cattle that had died of thirst. Policarpo and I, falling behind, were in danger of suffering the same fate. For the band of recruits, just like another locust horde, drank the world ahead wholly dry. The rare hovels and amateur shops along the way were prepared to feed and minister to the thirst of only the customary few daily travelers, not to ninety-four of us that suddenly descended upon them out of the north without warning. Hayes and I were forced to stride on past the sponge-like avalanche of humanity for self-preservation. Here and there we got huge glasses of chicha, the favorite native beverage, at a cent or two each. So many travelers have pictured the making of this by toothless old women chewing yucca and spitting it into a tub to ferment, that the impression should be corrected at the outset. That custom does exist, but it is found only among the untamed tribes of the upper reaches of the Amazon, scarcely trodden by one in ten thousand South American travelers. All down the great Andean chain this nectar of the Incas is made chiefly of maize, though also of other grains, berries, and of almost any vegetable matter that will ferment, by just as agreeable processes as other cooking operations of the same region. The notion of cleanliness is, at best, rudimentary among the country people of South America, yet the brewing of chicha certainly compares favorably with the ways of our average cider mill. A well-made chicha, indeed, resembles somewhat in taste the best cider, and is the surest thirst quencher I have yet encountered, distinctly superior in this respect to beer. Many were the chicha recipes I gathered along the Andes. For the interest of those who wish to temper a hot summer day with an excellent heritage from the ancient Inca civilization, let me translate the most common one. Chicha de Morocho Take hard, ripe corn. Morocho is one of the several excellent species of maize that, like certain grades of the potato, has never been carried from its original Andean habitat to the rest of the world. Shell and boil for two hours. Let it cool, then grind or crush under a stone, sprinkling from time to time with some of the water in which it has been boiled. Keep the mass in a well-covered jar. As it is kneaded, mix with water, one soup spoonful of the prepared mass to one liter of the boiling water. Add cloves, a very little vanilla, and as much sugar or rapadura as is considered necessary. Mix with an equal amount of cold water and place in jars to ferment. Once fermented, it is ready to serve. We reached Sarsal beyond a blistered red-hot plain soon after noon, with nineteen miles already behind us. It was thus we would always have arrived, the day's work done early in the afternoon, to wash, eat, and loaf a while on the canvas cots of our cell-bare room, then to loll in rawhide chairs on the broad tiled floor veranda before our door, reading the literature of the country, languidly watching the afternoon shower, and taking a stroll in the evening for exercise. In the Andes, however, the itinerary is subjected to a haphazard arrangement of stopping places that make so ideal a plan impossible. We gave orders for dinner and supper upon our arrival. The ignorant, good-hearted old landlord literally hung over us as we ate, fingering our dishes and even our food. The place might, with entire justice, have advertised personal services. At two, we finished a heavy dinner. At three-thirty, our host waddled in to announce that the large supper we had ordered was ready. We managed to plead off until five, but for that concession were obliged to eat the meal cold as an abandoned hope. A heavy rain during the night, our coming seemed to have broken the long drought, 
made the going lead heavy for the first few hours, until the blazing sun had dried up the gumbo mud. A richer region appeared as we advanced. Once or twice it seemed as if the central and western ranges were about to join hands and cut us off, but the unmade road always found a way through with, at most, an occasional dip or a slight winding climb. During the hot afternoon we picked up a recruit straggler, complaining of fever. The entire company was scattered for miles along the valley, as often panting in a patch of shade as hobbling forward on their blistered, light-shod feet. Magnificent trees stood out here and there across the rich bottomlands. Often the way led through dense huatales, bamboo groves that waved their gigantic plumes lazily in the summer air. Here and there the vegetation vaulted entirely over a river, into which filtered only a few rays of sun, as though the roof of an abandoned ruin. Occasionally we came upon a chakra, a little farm with a tiny thatched hut, faded with age, its floor of trampled earth surrounded by coffee bushes, papaya, chirimoya, and other fruit trees of the tropics, the sometimes recently whitewashed dwelling, furnished only with a few crude leather stools, a wooden bench, a lame table, and a few cantaros and dishes of native pottery. Pigs and chickens treated the family with perfect equality. Under the trees meditated old donkeys, broken down by a lifetime of toil under heartless drivers. We were indeed approaching the scene of Maria in all its photographic detail. We prepared to leave Tulula early, but we reckoned without our host, who was a half-negro of nasty temper and stupid wit and no faith in gold coin. Hayes offered him a five-dollar gold piece in payment of our bill, but he demanded paper of the country. We had none left, and a mulatto boy was sent out to exchange the scorned yellow metal. An hour elapsed without second sight of him. When another had drifted into the past, a search party was organized. Investigation showed that the emissary had tried to change the coin in a couple of shops and had then faded away. It was nearly noon when he reappeared, the coin still clenched in his hand. He had fallen into a game with other boys and forgotten his errand. We took the task upon ourselves. One after another drowsy wandering shopkeeper looked the coin over as a great curiosity and handed it back, announcing that Changing would be muy trabajoso, very laborious, for the speaker, but that we could get it changed en todas partes, anywhere, which, as usual, meant nowhere. At last a merchant suggested that it would be changed wherever we bought anything. We called this bluff by picking out a notebook on his shelves, and had heaped up before us nearly five hundred dollars in ragged billetes de pays, of chiefly one and five peso notes. The wad was burdensome, but to be caught on the road in the Andes without small money is often to go hungry, if not indeed thirsty. This particular shopkeeper prided himself on a knowledge of geography and the affairs of the exterior, the outside world, above the average of his fellow townsmen. As we turned away, he called after us, By the way, do los senores come from New York or from the United States? It was a subtle distinction we had not to that moment recognized. The ancient city of Buja, one of the largest in the Cauca Valley, was already familiar to us from the pages of Maria. But seeing it is too often disillusionment in these cities of the Andes, particularly to those in which the imagination has already dwelt. To have seen one long, cobbled, unswept street of Buja was to have seen them all. Checkerboard in plan, the monotonous line of its continuous house walls, all standing close to the street in strict right dress, broken here and there by a massive sajuan, stretched away out of sight in both directions. At first glimpse, 
it seemed unduly modest in claiming only 10,000 inhabitants, when we found that every dwelling had a patio and a garden of its own within, we realized that a one-story Andean town is by no means so large as it looks. The place was stagnant as a frog pond, its main plaza a splendid study in still life. Yet Buja was old before Boston was founded, and is favored with a soil and climate superior to the best of New England. In a region where fruit should have been unlimited, the only shop that offered any for sale was slightly stocked with a few green samples. The old woman who kept it bestirred herself to finger over several of her wares and advised us to come back manana or the day after that when they had time to ripen. Perhaps it is unjust to expect of Buja the energy and movement of a white man's town. At least it has unrivaled evenings in which, after the sun has set gloriously over the western range, the traveler can lean over the parapet of the massive old Spanish bridge of many arches, how the Spaniards built to stay, yet stayed not. Watching a half-moon rise and listening to the chatter of the shallow, diamond-clear little Guadalajara de las Piedras that flanks the town on the south. Buja is a holy city. Far above all else bulks a modern Gothic church of real bricks, and bricks transported from overseas are not cheap, called de los milagros, filled with more religious trophies than any Hindu temple. We were accosted in the nave by a long, unshaven priest who inquired our desires with a brusque que se le ofrece that plainly revealed his knowledge that we were not of the faithful. His familiarity with the outside world was on a par with that of most Colombians. When we answered his question of nationality by announcing ourselves Americans, he replied complacently, Ah, yes, Englishmen. Finding unheeded his strong hint to leave, he at length led the way up a ladder to a cell above and back of the altar. Here he lighted a candle and fell on his knees before the miraculous crucifix, the figure of which was smeared with red paint to simulate blood. Pilgrims flocked to Buja from hundreds of miles around. To the Bujeños themselves, however, their miracle seems to offer little more than a means of easy income. Through the hawking of crucifixes and holy lithographs to their pious visitors. Like Pure, Benares, or Lourdes, the holy city is more holy at a distance than to those who loll through life in its shadows, and it was only at El Sarrito, a day's march beyond, that we heard the story of the Milagroso de Buja in all its details. In a faintly lighted corridor we sat with three old women, the natural authorities on such subjects, who told the tale in low, awed voices, their eyes glowing in the night with the miracle of it, their tongues breaking in frequently with, uh, ¿Qué le parece? What do you think of that? As the miraculous recital proceeded, Long years ago, more than two centuries, when Buja was nothing but a row of thatched casitas on the bank of the babbling Guadalajara de las Piedras, a very poor and pious woman used to come every day to wash clothes at the river brink. The clothes of others, that is, for you must know that she had long been trying to get together sixty cents to buy a crucifix to set up in her hut where she had nothing whatever to pray to. At last she economized the sixty cents and was toiling away on the bank of the Guadalajara, dreaming of the joy of setting up the crucifix in a casita on the morrow, when a poor lame man of Buja came by and told her he owed sixty cents to a rich caballero and would be put in prison for debt if he did not pay it that very night. The poor washerwoman drew from within her garments the silver she had so carefully hidden away and gave it to the lame man to pay his debt. The next day, 
or three days later, here a great dispute arose among our informants, as the poor woman was washing and praying that she might some day gather together another sixty cents, there floated squarely into her open hands and mixed itself up with the garments of others she was washing, a caita, a little box in which there was only a simple little cross, the spokeswoman said. But she, having that moment to step into the shop, to sell two corn and cheese biscuits, the others assured us in hoarse whispers that this version was entirely erroneous. It was not a simple cross, but a crucifix with a Cristo attached, just exactly the same as you see today in El Milagroso de Buja, only very tiny, chiquitito, in fact. This momentous point in Buja's history I am forced to leave unsettled reporting merely that what I heard half whispered in the dark corridors of El Cerrito. The woman took this cross or crucifix home and set it up on the wall of her casita. To her surprise and alarm, the crucifix or cross began to grow. ¿Qué le parece? It grew even during the night, and the noises of its stretching kept her awake. When it had grown to twice its original size, she became so alarmed that she went and told the village curate. The padre scoffed at her story, saying such things were not possible nowadays, O oh ye of little faith, for miracles were no longer done. But when she showed him the thing, lo, it was even then growing. So the priest took it away with him, as priests will, and still it grew. It grew until it reached the size you see it today in El Milagroso, De Buja. Then the padre had an intimation from the Blessed Virgin that a church should be built on the spot where the Caita had been found, and he called all the people together to build it. They put the miracle behind the altar, and there it remained more than two hundred years in the church which is today the carpenter shop beside El Milagroso. Then, in 1902, the great temple of bricks was raised, for it had long been that those who would worship and be cured by the miraculous one could not get into the old church. And the Milagroso was moved to the new temple as easily as if it were a mere image of wood, though all the world well knows that it moves only when it wishes. And, if it does not, all the horses in the Cauca cannot stir it. And is it true that El Milagroso has cured many invalids? I asked. All three exploded in the Colombian manner of expressing great worldwide truths, such as, Es Buja, larger than Tulua? Is it colder in Zarzal than in El Cerrito? Why? But from an embarrassment of proofs of the miraculous power of the Milagroso de Buja, I have space only for this. A woman of Sonson had been bedridden with rheumatism for twenty years. At last, when they had grown large enough, her sons carried her to Buja and placed her in a chair before El Milagroso. As she prayed, she leaned forward and touched the toe of the miraculous one, whereupon she at once rose up from her chair perfectly well and walked home to Sanson, many miles away. That everyone in the Calca Valley knows, for it happened only the other year. And also put in another of the old women, bent on rounding out the story, El Milagroso can turn a woman young and beautiful again back to the day of her marriage and the age of fifteen. Eh? began Hayes, sitting up. Then why? But, no, the question would be unkind. It is too personal. It was in El Cerrito that we first began inquiries about Jorge Isaacs. Those who have sought information of Carlisle and Chelsea, or of Goethe in Frankfurt, will be surprised to know that the people of El Cerrito had heard of the author of Maria. Though the corner chicha seller and his neighbors spoke of him with something of the scorn active men of the world 
always feel for men of letters, even though they were not averse to basking in the sunshine of his fame. Someone led us to the little bridge below which the village gossips and washes its scanty clothes and pointed away to the east. Far across the valley on the lower skirts of the central range, we could see plainly the Novella Casa, the story house, a mere white speck on the distant mountain flank. There were few spots in Colombia to which I had looked forward with more interest than this scene of South America's greatest novel and the lifelong home of its author. With the first graying of the night I was astir, and we went off by sunrise across a grass-grown trail at right angles to our route to Ecuador. Several times this seemed to lose its way and split up in hopeless indecision. But the house of my father's, gleaming steadily on the skirt hem of the central range, piloted us forward. The only building to be seen, except those on the floor of the plain, it stood just high enough to gaze out across the great valley, a single evergreen tree, slender as a church spire, close beside it. The sun shot down its rays as if bent on setting on fire all that foliage of the trees did not defend from its rage. When we came to the edge of the plain, broken by ravines in which we separated in an attempt to keep together, there was nothing left but to strike an unmarked course for the goal. My own soon plunged down into a gully hundreds of feet deep, thick in jungle, a stream, the Sabaletas of Maria, monologuing at its bottom. I wandered long beside it before I could tear my way across, and longer still before I found the suggestion of a path by which to climb out again. Beyond were slightly sloping brown fields with grazing herds and immense black rocks protruding from the soil, and behind the indistinct prairie-like valley, majestic and silent, stretched mile upon mile to the deep blue wall of the western cordillera. Over the crest of the Andes, above, hung like an immense veil dense masses of fog from which the winds of the Sierra above snatched rags of clouds that floated lazily away to the westward. Then, all at once, the modest little white house appeared close at hand, in a grove of evergreens, backed by the Yerumo dotted mountain flank. I climbed a stone wall, and mounting through another brown field, pushed open a heavy rustic gate to find myself at last at the home of Maria. A woman of olive complexion, with streaming hair, for in this corner of the Cauca, far from the royal highways, travelers, to say nothing of foreigners, are rare, indeed, watched me in speechless amazement as, dripping with twelve miles of struggle, I mounted the steps of the house. On the veranda I was met by a veritable delegation of women and children, headed by a man who announced himself as Camilo Duran, haciendado, entirely at my service. The family was one of the well-to-do farmer class of the Cauca, a bit awkward, yet proud of their rank in society, lightly clad in rural dress, and decidedly excited at the extraordinary event of a visit by a foreigner from far off Europe or America, who presented a document from the Alcalde of Bogota, signed by none other than the nephew of that same Don Jorge, for whom their home was famous. A wide-eyed negro boy, whom one might have taken for Juan Angel in person, his woolly head protruded through the crown of what had long since been a native straw hat, came running with a chair. As I sat down in the cool corridor, surrounded by the admiring family, Duran called for glasses and a bottle, and just then Hayes's head appeared above the stone fence of the inner corral and as always leisurely legs brought him up to the steps to be introduced as that very Leo Ice, whom the valued communication from Bogota mentioned when read by natives. The Agardiente, which was ardent water, indeed arrived a moment later, and when Duran had drunk our health and we his, 
we turned to look about us. Would we see La Novela Casa? We would indeed, and rising entered it. The story house was a more modest dwelling than the imagination pictures during the reading of Maria, but then all the Cauca and its ways and people are simple and unassuming to the American point of view. Typical of the hacienda houses of the region, it was of one story, arranged with due regard for the natural resources and the needs of the place and climate. Built of stone and adobe, it gave evidence of being periodically disguised under a coating of whitewash. The long, deep veranda, flanked by two-corner rooms, and like them floored with what the French call dais, dull red tiles that remained cool even at the Calca noonday. Its thick walls were shaded by a low projecting tile roof. Over the entrance, a genuine Latin American touch, had been painted in what Hayes referred to as boxcar letters, the information, Aquí, canto, y yo ro, Jorge Isaacs. Here sang and wept George Isaacs. The main hall or parlor took up the entire depth of the house from the front to the back veranda, the corridor de la montaña of the novel, and was fitted with heavy handmade furniture of which an immense dining table of rough-hewn construction formed the center. Flanking this chief chamber were the half-dozen private rooms of the family. That, at the right-hand corner of the house, encroaching on the front corridor, had been the room of Ephraim, the hero, and of the novelist himself. Back of it came the sewing room, the writer's picture of which was so photographic that we were almost startled not to find Maria and Emma and her mother busy with their sewing. At the back, across the main hall, stood the oratorio, a small chapel with the same image of the Virgin, perhaps before which Maria had so often prayed in vain for a happy life. Behind the back veranda stood a wing, barely connected with the house proper, with the kitchen, hive-shaped, clay-baked ovens, and staring wide eyes of negro servants of all sizes that seemed gargoyle-like ornaments of the smoke-streaked and blackened place. The entire dwelling was as densely inhabited as a New York tenement. Beside the dozen boys and girls of olive tint and several women of the Duran family, servants and negroes swarmed, and piccaninnies peered from every opening and corner. The way led through the sewing room across the now weedy garden to the Pila de Maria, a crystal clear pool in the bed of the arroyo that sprang from rock to rock down the swift, light wooded gorge at the foot of which the story house is situated. Maria, with her unbound tresses, was no longer here. Instead, several dark skinned boys snatched their garments as we approached and sought quick shelter. The Pila was a rock-walled basin of sandy bottom some four feet deep and as many times higher than the less romantic bathtub of civilization, constantly renewed by the stream that wanders languidly away across the valley of the Calpa. Because of the dip of the garden, the Pila is out of sight from the house, but from his corner room Ephraim could, even as the novelist has pictured, see the girls as they return from their morning dip pausing to pick a flower here and there along the way. Duran gave us leave to take a plunge, but though few things would have been more welcome after our dripping climb from El Cerrito, it would have seemed something verging on sacrilege, something like smoking a cigar with our feet on Juliet's balcony, to have profaned with our dusty, prosaic, vagabond forms the pool about which seemed still to flip, the spirit of adorable Maria. According to the people of the region, Colombia's chief novel is little more than the autobiography of its author, polished into the ideal love story in vogue a half century ago. Isaacs, like the hero Ephraim, was the son of an English Jew, born in Jamaica, who came to Colombia as a young man, married and embraced Christianity. Like Ephraim, the author had a sister, Emma, 
in real life the recently deceased wife of a doctor of Popayan. Carlos, who first offered his hand to Maria, still lived on his hacienda a few miles out across the valley. Juan Angel, the slave boy of Efrain, was said to be still living in Cali, an old, old man. The bear and tiger hunting, the country weddings, the simple and patriarchal household, the life and scenes of the Cauca, had all been things of reality, deftly lifted into the realms of the imagination by the hero author. Even the evil stroke of fortune that had befallen the family on that dismal night in the hacienda of the valley was no storybook tale, but a stern fact that had left the novelist without patrimony and brought into the hands of strangers the house of my father. We took our leave in the early afternoon, drifting down through the sloping meadows past the great black rock to which Maria used to climb to watch for the return of Ephraim from the valley, which here spreads out in all its rich expanse, majestic and silent, to the dim western cordillera. Hayes, long lost in meditation, broke it at last to announce that he had found the end of his wanderings, that he would return to the zone to earn a new stake and come back to end his days as the owner of the novella casa. He was given to catching such enthusiasms to have them die during the succeeding night. It was indeed the most splendid spot in all the magnificent Cauca Valley, this simple dwelling set where it could see and be seen from untold leagues away, from the very crest of the western range, yet never standing forth boldly and conspicuously, framed modestly among its evergreens just a little way up the first easy slope of the Andean range it piles into the clouds behind it, it seemed as unassuming and removed from the hubbub of the modern world as gentle Maria herself. All the day our eyes were drawn back to it at frequent intervals. As long as the light lasted, it stood forth plainly in this clear air, though it shrunk to a house in miniature, then to a mere speck on the skirt hem of the central range. All the hot afternoon we plodded onward. Some miles after falling in with the Camino Real again, we passed La Manuelita, the hacienda of the valley, where Isaac's father had set up a sugar factory while the son was still a student in Bogota, and where took place, both in the novel and real life, that pathetic scene that marked the ruin of the family. Today the estate is the property of a Russian-American, and its products are known throughout all Colombia. Beyond the little Amiame River, the way led through a forest of bamboo then across a monotonous and dusty despoblado. The great Cordillera Occidental, now like a badly wrinkled garment of sepia-brown hue, drew ever nearer as did a line of bright green trees marking the course of the Cauca River. The central range all but faded away in the east, leaving a broad expanse of fertile country longing for the plow. Further on, a broken bridge or two adorned a waterless stream and an occasional ox cart, the first thing on wheels we had seen since crossing the Magdalena, crawled by in the sand. The aftercurse of African slavery was everywhere in evidence. In little cabins thrown together from jungle rubbish lounged swarms of ragged humanity, black or half black in color. Yet somehow they seemed less lazy than in our own land, perhaps because the activity of their few lighter neighbors gave less contrast. Swift tropical night was spreading its cloak over all the Calca when we sighted the sharp church spire of Palmira, where we were soon housed in the well-named Hotel Oasis. In mid-afternoon of the day following, we broke out suddenly on the bank of the Calca River. A barca, or ferry, moored to wires that sagged from shore to shore, set us across, and with sunset we plodded into Cali. Our arrival was well timed. The chief commercial city of the Cauca Valley was in fate. 
From end to end, on the Sunday morrow of our entrance, the place was crowded with happy, rather dusky, throngs and gay with the chiefly yellow flag of the nation and the bishop's banner and mitre. For on that day the ancient church of Cali became a cathedral, and one of her sons, a bishop, dividing a territory ruled over for centuries by the chief ecclesiastic of Popeyan. The name of the Hijo de Cali, about to don the purple, blazed forth from the facade of the church in enormous electric letters, like that of some Broadway star, and by sunset fully half the visible population was reeling drunk in honor of the honor that had finally fallen upon their native town. What you don't look for in Cali you won't find, runs a local proverb, which is a Colombian way of saying that its shops offer for sale anything man may desire. In a small and Colombian sense this is true, except on those frequent occasions when the stock is exhausted. Connected with the Pacific port of Buenaventura by seven hours muleback and four hours rail, it was hard to realize that we were again only four days from a zone police station. The place is more or less in constant connection with the outside world. But the transportation facilities of the country are so lax that the merchants of Cali are accustomed to announcing the receipt of a shipment from Europe or America with a sarcastic placard. Por fin llegaron! At last they have arrived. The city's role is chiefly that of distributing center for the vast territory about it and behind it, and on the heels of this first announcement appears on the chief shop fronts the information of interest only to arrieros and the owners of mule trains, Ay carga para, there is a load for this or that town of the interior. Life in Cali is largely governed by placards as if she had but recently discovered the art of printing, and were making the most of it, hardly an establishment, but is adorned with its set of rules. Among those of our hotel were two of purely Latin American tone. Correct dress is required of anyone presenting himself in the salons of this establishment. All political or religious discussion is absolutely prohibited. Among the orders to the sepultero of the local cemetery were several that reflected the customs of the place. 1. Receive no corpse without a ticket from the priest. 2. Keep three or four graves ready dug for bodies that may present themselves. 3. Make each adult grave one and a half meters deep and one wide. Relatives may, upon request, have it dug deeper. Four. Remove no bodies without the permission of an inspector or a priest. Why was man whose enjoyment surely would be so much greater denied the power of sailing freely out over the earth as the birds circled away across the great valley of the Calca, tinged to sepia in the oblique rays of the setting sun? When I reached the modest height that stands so directly over Kali that I could count every dull red tile of its roofs, the little river racing over its rocks below was still alive with bathers and laundresses. A breeze from off the mountains lifted the drooping leaves of the palm trees of the city. Beyond lay a view of the entire Cauca Valley, clear across to the now hazy central chain of the Andes, the dot that to whoever has known Maria will ever remain the house of my fathers plainly in sight, as were many of the scenes, back to Cartajo, and on over the range toward Bogotá, that I should never again see, except in imagination. If only this magnificent valley, climate and all, were in our land. Or no, it is better as it is. For then there would be spread out here in the sunset a great colorless stretch of plowed fields, factories sooting the peerless Cauca heavens with their strident industry. There these velvety hillsides would be covered with the gaudy vias of the more successful of an acquisitive race. 
a great, ugly American city of broken and distressing skyline without a single dull red roof would cover the most featureless, because the most practical, part of the valley, utterly destroying the beauty of a landscape which nature is still left to decorate in her own inimitable fashion. End of chapter 4 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 5, Part 1 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson Chapter 5, Part 1 Down the Andes to Quito From Cali, a broad road still fresh with early morning, led forth to the southeast, skirting some foothills of the western cordillera, really a meadow bounded by two cactus hedges and interwoven with an intricate network of paths like tracks of some great railway terminal, it was excellent for tramping. Birds sang merrily in the branches of the scattered trees. A telegraph wire sagged southward from bamboo pole to pole. Groups of ragged women balancing easily on their heads a machete, a coiled rope, and a rolled straw mat were already off to gather Kali's daily firewood. Others we met market-bound, bearing, likewise on their heads, loads of a large leaf that serves as wrapping paper in the shops of the town. Here passed a man leading two pigs, except on those frequent occasions when the leadership was reversed, there a haughty horseman, and beyond mule after donkey, laden with everything from milk to alfalfa. We strode lightly forward this time, for the developing tank had been turned over to a drummer from Chicago bound to Ecuador by sea. Before long the character of the country began to change, with the promise of mountains to climb far ahead in the hazy day after tomorrow. Mud holes appeared, streams without bridges, though often with stepping stones or the trunk of a bamboo thrown across them, grew frequent, and the sky took to muttering ominously far off to the eastward. A strong young river, bright yellow in color and flecked with spume, sped by beneath the first roofed bridge, with news of last night's storm somewhere up in the Cordillera. Before the day was done, we had several times to strip to the waist to ford torrents that had decorated themselves with leaves and flowers and the branches of trees snatched along the way. Next morning the foothills began to crowd in upon the trail, now a haphazard hunted thing scurrying in and out over lomas and knolls and even higher hills, from the tops of which we several times caught what we fancied was the last view of the great Cauca Valley behind us. Slowly the mountains themselves closed in. We waded a river, toiled up a long slope, and came out far above a beautiful little vale, completely boxed in by perpendicular hillsides. Only two houses were to be seen on its grassy floor, spotted with scores of grazing cattle. Over it, several hundred feet above, hung a broad column of locusts, surely a mile long, moving slowly northward with a humming whirr that we could plainly hear far beyond, and shading the country beneath like some enormous veil. Beyond we descended again to the Calca River. Here there was no ferry, or rather it was out of order. Tons of merchandise lay heaped along the bank, while cursing arrieros chased their snorting mules into the stream. The negro who set us across in a long dugout collected five billetes each for the service, but this was evidently exorbitant, for the woman of his own color, who went with us, paid only four green plantains for herself, a piccaninny, and her load. Luckily we had a long draft of chicha fuerte before facing the notorious 
Subida de Hawache on the third day, for the stories we had long heard of this fearsome climb had not been exaggerated. High above anything we had seen since passing the Quindio, we came out suddenly on a platform on the edge of one of those bottomless ravines that abound in the Andes, a mighty hole in the earth, blue with the very depths of it. Just across, at the same height, hung in plain sight the wavering trail we could only reach by undoing all the climbing of days past and doing it all over again in one single task. Hour after hour we descended a mountainside so sheer that the struggle against gravity was like a battle with some hardy wrestler, only to face at the bottom what seemed the full unbroken wall of the Andes, the red trail zigzagging into the very sky above. All the blazing afternoon we climbed incessantly to gain at evening a height equal to that of the morning, only a few miles further south. A task that would have seemed impossible a month earlier struck us now as amply rewarded by the indescribable panorama of mountains that spread away from the summit in every direction. For once the trail held for a time the advantage it had gained, passing through Buenos Aires and Morales, two row towns of thick adobe walls. Though still in the tropics, we were now in the temperate zone. Oaks abounded, and the weather was like that of our northern states in early autumn. The population was still dark in color, but Negroes had faded away with the open-work architecture of the Cauca. For the first time since descending from the plateau of Bogota, we met full-blooded Indians. They were of the Guajiro tribe. Dull brown of color, sturdy, thick-legged fellows, in white pajama-like garments, reaching only to the knees. All, male or female, young or old, greeted us in a sing-song as we passed. On the last of August, four days from Cali, we pushed more swiftly forward, for we were nearing the famous old city of Popayan, a forced march dipping down through a mighty gully and panting upward through the swirling dust brought us at noon to the dry and wind-swept hilltop village of Cajihibo. The population was almost entirely Indian, and the dusty central square swarmed with the Saturday market. Guajiros of both sexes and all ages flocked into town from scores of miles around, sat with their bits of produce, under woven reed shelters or in the open glare of the equatorial sun. Some had already exchanged their wares for the weekly chicha debauch and staggered around maudlin and red-eyed or lay tumbled in noisome corners. The village priest, the only visible resident of European blood, wandered in and out among the hawkers with a mochila on the end of a rod over one shoulder gazing away across the sepia hills and the distant blue ranges as if his mind were utterly detached from this world the padre paused before each hawker turned his back and punched him or more often her with the end of the stick until a contribution to the parochial larder had been dropped into the sack the sun set amid cornfields wrapped itself in grayish-purple clouds in the crimsoning west, and still Popeyan was leagues away. We plodded on into the night. There is, however, a sort of reflected light in these high altitudes where the very mountains seem low hills, a sense of being on top of the world, with the sun just out of sight around the curve of the earth. Fires, evidently of Indians, burning off their chakras, dotted the night on several sides of us. The road grew broader and took on that atrocious cobbling which follows the Spaniard everywhere, growing worse as it approaches a town. Now it stumbled down to a river, across a long stone bridge of the massive type 
of long ago and into a two-row village. For a time, we imagined we saw at last the lights of the famous city. It was mere illusion. Not only did we tramp another foot-sore hour, but when we did finally arrive, there were no lights. The place had grown up about us in the dark before we realized that we were no longer in the open country. The pedometer registered thirty-five miles, and our feet and appetites several times that, when we halted, undecided, in what some sixth sense told us was the central plaza. Most famous of all the cities from Bogota to Quito, boasting itself a cradle of savants, long the capital of a large section of Spain's American colonies and still that of the great department of the Cauca, Popayan had seemed to promise at least the lesser comforts of civilization. For days we had slept on tables and mud benches, wrapped in the fond hope of making up here for the cold, hungry nights on the trail. We had even feared there might be difficulty in choosing from a plethora of accommodations, and had gravely set down somewhere to the north the name of the Hotel Colon as of about the grade of luxury fitted to our fortunes. It was to laugh. Though it was barely eight in the evening, Popayan was as dead as a graveyard at midnight, and darker. Later we learned that the famous city does have lights, a few street-corner kerosene lamps that burn out within an hour, unless a puff of wind blows them out first. Having been a city, in the Spanish sense, only 376 years, it was too much to expect the place to have learned already of the existence of electricity. We hobbled over slippery cobblestones along monotonous two-story streets and in and out of dimly seen thatched suburbs for what seemed hours before we caught sight of a man emerging from a candle-lighted barber shop. Hotel? he ruminated, as if striving to recall a word he had heard somewhere long ago. You want a hotel? No, you spiggity dolt, growled Hayes in English, nursing his blistered feet by standing on one at a time. We only asked that because we want to know who won the pennant this year. Hotel? went on the musing. Popayanejo, unheeding. Ah, uh, where do you come from, and where are you going? You will be Italianos? Alemanes? No, we're Chinamen, I snapped, and looking for a hotel. Pues, senor Chino, he replied, cleverly returning the sarcasm. There is no hotel in Bopeyan, but if you go down this street for quadras in this direction and three in that and knock at the door of the second house beyond the fountain you may find them willing to give you lodging they were not however nor were those to whom they in turn directed us a long hour more we winced along the uneven slippery streets of popayan begging for a bite to eat and a plank to lie on as in any Indian village, only to be turned away from some of the most distressing holes ever man offered to sleep in on a wager. But the Spanish-speaking races have a proverb that Perro, que anda, hueso, encuentra. And we stumbled finally upon a billiard room in which several young bloods of the town were upholding their reputation as night hawks. One senor Fulano, cigarette maker by profession, when he was sober enough, and dope fiend by habit, as were several of his companions, took us in charge and led the way uncertainly to a cubbyhole of a room in his barn-like ancestral home. 
There, my dreams of the comforts of Popayan forever shattered, I resigned myself to sleep once more on a wooden table posing as a bed. Hayes was little more fortunate, for though he drew an aged divan, he fell asleep quite literally several times before he abandoned himself to the floor which fate seemed bent on forcing him to occupy. In the morning, Fulano's garrulous old mother made more formal arrangements for our housing. She did not pretend to run a hotel, though she had no hesitancy in charging hotel rates, but she served two greasy meals a day to several clerks from government offices and, out of charity, seated us with them. But alas, however easily he may spend the day, the Latin American leads a hard life at night. In a huge and all but empty front room was an enormous bedstead of vice-regal days, but this, too, was wooden-floored, and the diaphanous straw mat that did duty as mattress had had all life crushed out of it years before. Nor did the single blanket have much influence over the penetrating mountain air of the early morning. The deep window embrasures were built with steps for the use of occupants who would engage in the favorite popianejo pastime of gazing out through the reja, but no provision whatever had been made for another convenience essential to all well-regulated households. In this respect, the house was on a par with all the rest of the famous city. Founded by Ben al -Khassar, in the Spanish sense of having a scribe record under a name bristling with references to the saints, which, as usual, failed to stick, an Indian town ruled over by a warlike cacique named Payan, the capital of the Cauca, has, according to its latest census, 4,326 men and 5,890 women, a disproportion that is reflected in its customs. If its own assertion is to be taken at par, it is notable for its fine climate and its illustrious sons. Of the climate, there can be little criticism. Just how illustrious its sons might have been in a wider world, no one who has come to see where and how they live can be blamed for wondering. Of them all, the town is evidently most proud of Caldas, a statue of whom adorns the central plaza. The tobacco-chewing savant who discovered how to determine altitude by boiling water. No one who has cooked his eggs in the Andes is long in making the same discovery, and who taught the revolted colonials how to make gunpowder, only to be shot in Bogota for his pains. So aged is the town that it has not a red roof left. All are faded to a time-dull maroon. The place bristles with ancient religious edifices, mementos of its importance in colonial days. Hardly a block is there without its huge church of cavernous and dilapidated interior. The silent, grass-grown little Universidad del Calca of the aspect of some bent and toothless old man, is famous now only for its age, though in its dotage it fondly fancies itself still one of the principal seats of learning in the new world. Over its unadorned main door may still be read a crumbled inscription, Initium Sapiente Timor Domini. Summer vacation had left it uninhabited, but there was evidence of practical training in at least one respect. The beds of its dormitory were narrow wooden boxes, some five feet long. If Papillon is dead by night, little more can be said of it by day. Language shopkeeping is almost its only visible industry, and the population seems to live on what they sell to one another. The ways of its merchants are typical of those 
in all the somnolent towns of the Andes. With few exceptions, they treat the prospective purchaser in a manner that seems to say, Buy at this price, or go away and let me alone. I want to read last week's newspaper, finish my cigarette, and daydream, and I don't want you here in my store disturbing my meditations. Too often in the shops, the manana habit prevails, in that it is always the next place that has what you are looking for. The mortality of white ones being high on Andean trails, I entered a tienda to ask, Do you sell blue handkerchiefs, senor? Shopkeeper, recovering from what was really asleep, though ostensibly awake, Ah, uh, buenos dias, senor. Como esta usted? Como esta la familia? Uh, the senor which is, uh, uh, what was it the senor requested? The chances always are that he has heard the question in his dreams, and, if given time, will recall it. Handkerchiefs, is it not, senor? Blue handkerchiefs, please. Ah, uh, como, para que cosa? What for, for instance? This question, which is seldom lacking, being ignored, the shopkeeper turned to let his eyes wander dreamily over his shelves, striving in vain to bring his attention down to the matter in hand. Finally he took a stick from a corner and fished from an upper shelf a paper-wrapped bundle. Opened, it disclosed a half a dozen pairs of faded red socks made in Germany. But I said, shopkeeper, suddenly, but not unexpectedly, without a pause between the questions, where do you come from and where are you going? The traveler answers according to his character and mood. Meanwhile, the merchant, had fished down a bundle of red handkerchiefs. I said blue, senor. Uh, but this is blue, a beautiful uh, ultramarine blue. Mero stay, just look. And he held it up to the reflected sunlight that streamed in at the only opening to the shop, the doorway. No, senor, I want blue. Shopkeeper, dreamily. Uh, senor, no, I, there are none, but uh, you can find them uh, in those partes, anywhere. You are French, perhaps, senor. Perhaps here I caught sight of a bundle of blue handkerchiefs in plain view on a lower shelf and pointed them out. How much? Shopkeeper. Te, uh, fifteen pesos, senor. You must take me for a tourist or a gringo. I'll give you five. Very well, senor. Muchas gracias. Buenos dias. Adios, pues. Or perhaps the stranger wishes to visit some local celebrity and pauses in a shop door to ask, Can you tell me where Dr. Medrano lives? You mean Dr. Medrano de Pisco y Miel? That is the only Dr. Medrano in town, as the merchant well knows, but the matter must be clothed in all customary formality. His house is a second door beyond that of uh, Dr. Enrique Castro Peleo, senor? Yes, but I'm a stranger in town, and I don't know where Don Enrique lives. You don't know? You don't know where Dr. Enrique Castro y Peleo lives? Why, why, everyone in town knows the house of Dr. Enrique. Why, just ask anywhere. They can tell you uh, in todas partes. Anyone can tell you. This happy-go-lucky way of life is not without its advantages. Having occasion to cash a traveler's check, I dropped in upon a native merchant, who played at being a banker. After the usual extended formalities, he took the check and looked it over, 
with puzzled expression, for he knew no English. As a banker, you are, of course, familiar with the system of traveler's checks, I put in. No, senor, I have never before seen one. Well, it's just as good as money and... Oh, of course, he replied hastily. Since the senor offers it, how much you want for it? Only its face value, ten dollars in American money. I shall be pleased to take it. Uh, how much is that in money of our country? Only a thousand pesos, senor, I replied, disdaining the temptation to multiply by ten. Muy bien, senor, he replied, making out an order to his cashier for that amount, tucked the check away in a drawer. Uh, it's not good unless I sign it, I suggested. Ah, no, he asked producing it again for that purpose? A thousand thanks. Pues adios, senor. Until we meet again. So, unlimited is the faith in ingleses in these regions that he had no hesitancy in accepting from a stranger a check which he would not have dreamed of cashing for one of his fellow townsmen without ample proof of its value. One evening, three men in frock coats and the manner of prime ministers dropped in upon us and announced themselves editors of the newspaper Sursum. They had only an hour or two to spare, however, and by the time the introductory formalities were over, they bowed themselves out with the information that they would come and tertuliar interview us manana. Two days later I chanced to meet one of them again. Did you say Sursum is published every week, I asked, having had no visual evidence of its existence since our arrival. Oh, yes, indeed, cried the editor, rolling another cigarette. Every week? Ah, that is, last week it did not appear, that is true. And the week before the editor-in-chief was al campo, and the week before that he was very busy as his sister was getting married, but uh, it is sure to come out next week, or if not, then the week after, and I myself am coming to interview you. Manana. It was in Popayan that we found coca leaves for sale for the first time, and met Indians whose cheeks were disfigured by a cut of them. Long before the white man appeared on his shores, the Indian of the Andes, unacquainted, with the tobacco of his North American brother, was addicted to this habit. The leaves, from which is extracted the cocaine of modern days, are plucked from a shrub not unlike the orange in appearance that grows down in the edge of the hot lands to the east of the Andean chain. Once dried, they are packed in huge bales or crude baskets made on the spot and sold in the marketplaces by old women weigh out the desired amount in clumsy homemade scales or in handfuls by eye measure. The Indians thrust the leaves one by one into their mouths, and as they become moistened, add a bit of lime or ashes, dipped with what looks like an enlarged toothpick from a tiny calabash, which, with a leather pouch for the leaves themselves, constitutes the most indispensable article of the aboriginal equipment. How harmful the habit may be, it is hard to gauge. Its devotees are, it is true, languid of manner and slow of intellect, but they show no great contrast in this particular from the gente decente, their neighbors who rarely indulge in the leaves, except on some long and wearisome journey. So marked is this languor in Popeyan that as in most Andean towns, brawls are rare, despite the half-anarchy that reigns. Youths, merry with liquor or its equivalent, race their horses up and down the roughly cobbled streets, forcing them to Capriole until Hayes took to cursing his loss of police powers. Street women may, though few find it necessary, ply their profession as openly as vegetable hawkers. Even when a dispute grows noisy, there is no interference. 
a policeman may wander up in curiosity, like any other bystander, but he is almost sure to find that the contender is some authority, or a second cousin of the alcalde, or a grandson of the bishop, or wears a white collar, and wanders away again, lest he get himself into trouble. So we remained in Popayan, until it had dwindled from the romantic city of the past our imaginations had pictured to the miserable reality, though in after years, veiled by the haze of memory, its charm and romance may return, and one evening asked to have our coffee served at a reasonable hour in the morning. Siempre se van a cried our hostess, when we appeared in road guard the next morning. You are really going today? It was not so much that she was striving to cover her failure to have the coffee ready. Her Latin American mind could not conceive of so definite a resolution about living the night. Why you not remain until tomorrow and rest? She rambled on. An hour later, she stood staring after us from a doorway, an act in no way conspicuous, since all that section of Popayan was similarly engaged. The entire town had expressed its sympathy that we must go all alone and so laboriously, tan trabajoso, over the wild mountains and valleys to, well, wherever we were bound, for not a single popayanejo took seriously our assertion that we really hoped to reach Ecuador. Pasto was said to be something like a week distant by land, and the route very dangerous, though from what source was not clear. For the first hazy hour a good road led gradually upwards, but like an incorrigible small boy getting out of sight of home, its good behavior ceased at the hilltop where we caught the last view of the cradle of savants. Evermore winding and broken across ravines and streams, with bridges and without them, now and then seeming to drop completely out of the world about us, only to gather its forces again far below and scramble to even greater heights over a saddle of a mountain wall beyond, from the summit of which the trail of twenty-four hours before stood forth as clearly as across an alleyway between tenement houses it struggled uncertainly southward day by day at the hamlet of dolores amid rugged and tumbled mountains piled into the sky on every hand we came to a parting of the ways and had the choice of continuing by the temperate or the torrid zone one route went into the Patia Valley, hotter than Panama, reputed the abode of raging fevers and the breeding place of those swarms of locusts that devastate the Cauca. The other way, by way of Los Pueblos, lay cool and high with frequent towns, though it was two days longer and much more broken and mountainous. We chose the temperate zone. The way turned back for a time almost the way we had come, then climbed until a whole new world opened out beyond, towering peaks, piercing the clouds, and strangely shaped masses of earth lying heaped up tumultuously on every hand. For once the trail showed unusual intelligence in clinging to the top of the ridge, fighting its own natural tendency to pitch down into the mighty valleys on either side and the constant struggle of the ridge to throw it off, like an ill-tempered bronco its rider. We were following, now, what the Colombian calls a cuchillo, a knife, treading the very edge of its blade. Along it, miserable mud huts were numerous, and every Indian we met had a cheek distorted and his teeth and lips discolored by coca cud. It struck us as strange, that even bad habits have their local habitat, and that the magnificent mountain scenery gave the dwellers no inspiration to better their conditions. Evidently the region held foreigners in great fear. As often as we paused to ask for lodging, 
some transparent excuse was trumped up to get rid of us. The naivete of the inhabitants was amusing. At one village hut, two women met our plea for posada with, No, senores, los maridos no están. The husbands are out. We are not interested in the husbands, but in a place to sleep. Yes, but the husbands will be out all night, and they would make themselves very ugly. Se pondrían muy bravos. Further on, my companion tried his luck again. Two plump girls, not unattractive in appearance, bade him enter. Could they give us posada? Uh, they thought so. Mother usually did. But she was out just then. All right, said Hayes, sitting down. I'll wait for her. Some time had passed when it occurred to him to ask, When will Mother be back? Oh, perhaps in a week, answered the innocent damsels. She went to Maharas with a little corn. It was as useless to try and get a meal without the loss of several hours as to hope to eat it without the entire village squatted around us. Either there was nothing to cook, or no pan to cook it in, until the woman next door had baked tomorrow's cornbread, or the stick fire in the backyard refused to burn, or some other insurmountable drawback developed. Hayes constantly labored under the delusion that money could expedite matters and was given to drawing forth his worldly wealth in one wad to flourish it before the languorous cook and incidentally all the gaping town. The result was often a doubled or trebled price, if not an inducement for some of the village louts to lay an ambush for us somewhere up the trail, but never an earlier meal. If they could stir up their lethargy to serve us at all, it would be only at their own good leisure, whatever the price. Many a time there occurred a scene similar to that in San Miguel. Hayes shook a fifty-dollar billete in the face of a bedraggled Indian woman who had perhaps never seen so large a sum at one time, offering it all if she would prepare a meal at once. She would not. But after long argument served coffee corn cakes and eggs which might easily rank as a meal in the andes and collected a bill of seven cents for days at a time we tramped aguas arriba the trail of the andes are fond of this means of crossing a mountain range high above it we caught the gorge of a river and wound up stream in and out along the towering wall that shut us in. It was no mountain-flanking road of easy gradient, such as abound in the Alps, but one that had chiefly built itself, so that all day long we climbed and descended stony buttresses of the range, until they grew like the constant nagging of a querulous old woman, the gorge of the brawling river far below. Here and there a hut and clearing hung on the opposite mountain wall, or above us in places where plows were useless. The Indians cultivated their farms by burning off a bit of the swift slope, threw a brush fence around it, dropped their seeds into carelessly dug holes, and sat back to wait for whatever nature chose to send them. At length, in the course of days, the trail, having kept the same general level, the diminished river rose to meet it. For hours more, the path jumped back and forth across the ever smaller stream until this had dwindled to a mere brook racing down a rocky gorge from its birthplace up under the snows. Then, when there was nothing else left for it, the trail girded up its loins and scrambled alone up out of the valley and over the backing range. Far above I could make out the rough-hewn wooden cross that marked the summit, masses of clouds scurrying past it as if pursued by some enemy beyond. 
Once I passed a half-wild Indian girl with a baby on her back, who ran away down an unmarked breakneck place in a way to suggest she had taken me for the fiend in person. No doubt the resemblance was striking. Higher still, two or three groups of the same tribe came down at a queer little dog trot, the heavy loads on their backs supported by a shawl knotted around their shoulders, the plump breasts of the women undulating under their dirty one-piece garments. In mid-morning we stood at last on the summit of the famous Ahorcado, the Hanged Man Range, so named from some episode of the conquest, a knife-edge indeed, where the god of the winds seemed to have his chief warehouse. For once the view was entirely free from mist. To the east the V-shaped valley up which we had come lay far below, twisting away to the left to be lost at last between hazy mountain chains. There were many more farmers here than in the rich and level Calca Valley, either because the government is too far distant to drive them out by its exactions, or because the Indian is in his element among these lofty ranges. On every hand the steep mountain sides were flecked with little farms of all possible shapes, colored by green or ripening grain or corn, a tiny hut in the center of each patch, minute with distance, but as clearly visible as if only a few yards away. To the west lay a pandemonium of mighty valleys, pitched and tumbled peaks, gigantic sawtooth ranges seen and suggested into the utmost distance but one could not stand long in so icy a wind to admire even such a scene a few yards below the road forked one branch stumbling headlong down into that chaotic jumble of wooded hills and valleys the other striking off through the forest along the flank of the range a mistake at that height might mean hours or even days of extra toil. We chose at random and trusted the luck. The soft, almost level road plunged away through a dense green forest, as truly bearded with moss as any in our north, yet rich with parasites and ferns. Great oaks littered the ground with acorns. I drew ahead and marched on through utter solitude, the stillness broken only by the cold wind from the south, immense vistas of dense wooded Andes now and then opening out through a break in the treetops. Where the forest began to give way, my misgivings were set at rest by a group of dull-eyed Indians of both sexes, their mouths stained with coca leaves, plodding upward in single file, still maudlin with the firewater that marked the vicinity of the town. All wore heavy, cream-colored felt hats, and bore varying burdens, the women carrying the heavier loads, in addition a baby slung across their breasts by a claw knotted behind the neck. Not far beyond I burst out suddenly upon a full view of al Mahuer, almost directly below, perched astride a narrow ridge between two mountains, serene in its precarious seat, despite the ravaging wind that seemed constantly threatening to blow it off into oblivion. Then, as suddenly, it disappeared, and I was almost within the town before I caught sight of it again. Here we caught one Barbara Diaz, red-handed, in the act of feeding her swarming family, and refused to be driven away. Lodging, however, seemed unattainable. A woman seated on her earth floor before an American sewing machine run by hand, carelessly admitted that she had a room to rent before she thought to say further on. But on second thought she decided that it would be muy trabajoso to prepare it for us. In other words, very tiresome to get up from the floor and produce a key. The alcalde was out of town. The one woman who owned a vacant little shop asserted, with an air of finality, that her husband was not at home. I turned to the court of last appeal, the village priest. He was a long, unshaven, but pleasant fellow of forty, educated in the seminary of Popeyan, 
occupying with a discreet but attractive young housekeeper. The second best building in town, the best being the mud church adjoining. His well-stocked library, in Latin and Spanish, with a few volumes in French and English, was a feast for the eyes in these bookless wilds. During our long chat, the good padre asserted that all the Indians for a hundred miles around were good and faithful Catholics, and that most all of them could read and write. He had long planned to learn English, but had such a fearful lot of work to do, so many masses to say every day, and confessions without rest. He took down a book and requested me to read some English aloud, just to hear how it sounds. Casually, somewhere during the interview, I brought in a brief reference to lodging, and the padre forthwith sent across the plaza a small boy who soon returned and led us to the same woman who had last turned us away. Now that the padre ordered, she had no hesitancy in overlooking the absence of her husband. The lodging cost us nothing, which was exactly what it was worth. It was the usual mud cavern, with a floor of trodden earth, cold as a dungeon, in contrast to the blazing sunshine outside, and having once been a shop, was all but filled with a dust-carpeted counter and yawning shelves curtained and draped with cobwebs. Hayes drew the counter, but I found room to stow myself away on one of the higher shelves, though with neither mattress nor covering and a wind as off the Antarctic ice sweeping at express speed across the thin cochillo between two bottomless Andean gullies, we did not look forward to darkness with pleasure. The only water supply of Almaguer attached to the world only by the royal highway at either end, was a little wooden spout projecting from the hillside. The estanquillo had no lack of aguardiente, however, and, as to washing, Almaguer avoids what would otherwise be a difficulty by never having formed the habit. The making of candles is its chief industry. A bluish wax is gathered from a laurel tree which abounds in the region, and even the acting alcalde spent the evening making candles by dipping pieces of string again and again into a bowl of molten wax. That worthy was also village schoolmaster and purveyor of patent medicines to Al Majer, a lank, ungainly man in a habitual lack of shave with a handkerchief knotted about his neck like a Liverpool warp rat. Before the sun had set, he had given us a score of commissions, chiefly in the patent medicine line, to be fulfilled when we returned to the Europe. Then he fell to talking of a Mr. Edison and his inventions. For some time we fancied the personage in question was some local celebrity, and not until the patent medicine schoolmaster Alcalde had turned the conversation to a Mr. Frank Lean, who was also, it seemed, a great gringo electrician, and answered to the surname of Benjamin, did we catch the drift of his monologue. He had brought up the subject, it turned out, because he had long been curious to know whether the Mistars Frank Lean and Edison often met to plan their work together, or whether, as so often happened among the great men of Almaguer, they were unfortunately rivals and enemies. It is always a long time night in this Andean land of no lights and little covering. The reedless evenings seemed interminable. Small wonder the inhabitants are ignorant and priest-ridden when they can only sit and gossip after the sun goes down. The traveler eats supper, if it is to be had, takes a walk, talks a while, with someone, if he is gifted with the medieval art of conversation, comes home, sits around for a while on the earth floor or an adobe block, thinks over his past history and future plans, if any, wishes he smoked, and finally deciding to go to bed, looks at his tin watch to find 
it is almost seven. In Almajuer there were none of these drawbacks, for as I lay abed on my upper shelf, the laurel candle gave sufficient flicker by which to make out the dimly printed pages of a Bogotá masterpiece, so long as I kept wide enough awake to balance the candlestick on my forehead. It is not far from Almajuer to its twin city of Bolivar, yet they are far apart. On the map, one could stroll over in an hour or two, pausing for a nap on the way. So could one in real life, but for a single drawback, the lack of a bridge. Both towns, the largest between Popayan and Pasto, lie at about the same 7,500 feet above the level of the sea, but between them is a gash in the earth which does not reach to the infernal regions simply and only because these are not situated where ancient and some modern theologians fancied them. For days now there had been a persistent rumor of salteadores, highway robbers, reputed experts in the art of shooting travelers in the back from any of the countless hiding places along the trail. Every town, in turn, asserted that its own region was eminently safe. The danger was always in the next one. Each traveler we met, and they were never alone, carried a rifle or a musket. Once, at an awkward defile, we suddenly caught sight of an ugly-looking group of ruffians on a knoll above, and our back muscles twitched reflexively until we had climbed out of range. The fact that our own weapons hung in plain sight may have been the cause of their inaction. Again, in San Lorenzo, of especially evil repute, several shifty-eyed fellows showed great interest in our movements. When we took the opportunity to oil our sidearms and demonstrate their quick action, however, the group assured us that the robbers never troubled foreigners and faded gradually away. The danger, if it existed, was multiplied by the fact that we were forced to canvass the town until we had changed our money into silver. We were about to enter the half-autonomous department of Nariño, southernmost of Colombia, where the paper bills of the central government have never been accepted. Yet the department has no money of its own. Silver coins of whatever origin have a fixed worth according to the size rather than face value, and those with holes in them are losing nothing thereby. Pieces of the weight of our silver dollar were known as fuertes valued at thirty-six cents. Our quarter, or an English shilling, was accepted as dos reales, seven cents. Among the hodgepodge of coins that came into my possession was the two peseta piece of old Spain dated 1794 under the profile of Charles the Fourth. The shopkeeper with whom I spent it valued at two reales, because it was somewhat smaller than a four-real piece, but after an argument accepted it at four. The twenty dollars we each gathered made a sackful nearly as heavy as all the rest of our baggage. The landscape, too, had changed. Instead of the hot, dry, repulsive ranges behind, we were again in deep green woods and fields, the trail climbing from bamboo-clad valleys where rain-cold mountain streams so clear we could not see the water but only the bottom of the bed to wind-swept oaken heights. In places there were slight outcroppings of coal, then a lung-bursting road rick-racked for hours up a wall-like mountainside. Now and then, when we were ready to drop from exhaustion, bringing us out on a little level space, like landing on an endless stairway, then scrambling up on still steeper heights. When at last we stood on the blade edge of the Cuchillo de Bateros, dividing autonomous Nariño from the rest of Colombia, Bolivar, two days behind, lay as plainly in sight as a house across the street. The immense peak beside it sunk to an insignificant knoll. To the west we could look down into the misty valley of the Patia and wondered whether we would not have done better to have taken its more level route for all of its fevers. 
At dusk we came out on a headland and saw so directly below that a false step would have pitched us, or rather our mangled remains, down into its very plaza, the mathematically regular town of San Pablo, in the floor-flat river bottom of the Rio Mayo, with rich meadows stretching east and west to the rocky mountain walls that boxed them in. The descent was so steep that we could only hold our own by wedging our toes into the shale and keeping our thigh muscles taut as brake rods so swift that the trail often split to bits from its own momentum. In the town we were startled to have the first boy we met admit that Posada could be had. His own mother had a room to rent. He had laid aside the hat he was weaving and picked up a bunch of enormous keys stepping toward an adobe building across the street. But at that moment, a patched and barefoot man rushed down upon us, likewise offering us posada in a startling burst of eloquence. For a time, it looked as if for once, instead of having to fight for lodgings, lodgings were going to fight for us. We settled the dispute by the simple expedient of asking each his price. One real, answered the boy, defiantly. In my oficina de peluqueria, said the man, haughtily, it will cost you nothing. Moreover, foreigners always lodge there. Behind his bravado, he seemed so nearly on the point of weeping that we should no doubt have chosen his office of barbering, even had there been no such gulf between the rival prices. He thanked us for the favor, and producing from somewhere about his person an enormous key, unlocked one of those unruly shop doors indigenous to rural South America, above which projected a shingle bearing on one side the information that we were about to enter Peluqueria Civica, and on the other the name of our host, Santiago Munoz. The keyhole was of the shape of a swan. Others in the town, as throughout Nariño, had the form of a man, a horse, a goose, and a dozen more as curious. These homemade doors of Andean villages, be it said in passing, never fit easily. Their huge clumsy locks have always some idiosyncrasy of their own, so that by the time the traveler learns to unlock the door of his lodging, Without native assistance, he's ready to move on. This one gave admittance to the usual whitewashed mud den with a tile floor, furnished as a Colombian barber shop, which means that it was chiefly empty and by no means immaculate, with two wooden benches, three tin basins, and an empty water pitcher, a homemade or San Pablo made chair, a lame table littered with newspapers from a year to three months old, a scanty supply of open razors, strops, Florida water, soap, and brushes scattered promiscuously, a couple of once-white gowns of Mother Hubbard form for customers, and, in one corner, a heap of human hair, black and coarse. Then there were the luxuries of a clumsy candlestick with six inches of candle and a lace curtain worked with red and blue flowers, to cut off the gaze of the curious, except those bold enough, frankly, to push it aside and stare in upon us. Santiago gave us full possession, key and all. We tossed a coin to decide which of us should burden himself with the latter, and informed us that a woman next door to the church sometimes supplied meals to travelers. The benches were barely a foot wide, but they were of soft wood, and we were so delighted to find accommodations plentiful that I was about to make a similar suggestion when Hayes yawned. Let's hang over here tomorrow. Late next morning the barber wandered in upon us. Last year, he began, another meester. In the Andes the word is used as a common noun to designate not only Americans, but Europeans and even Spaniards. Stopped here. You perhaps know him. His name was Giuseppe. We doubted it. 
Surely you must know him, persisted the barber. He was a foreigner also. As he talked, Santiago kept fingering a crumpled letter. Bit by bit, he half betrayed, half admitted, that he gave free lodging to estranjeros because he wished to keep on good terms with the outside world in general, and in particular because he was seeking some means of sending six dollars to that strange town beyond the national boundaries from which all foreigners came. When he had explained himself at length, he turned the letter over to us. It was in correct Spanish, mimeographed to resemble a typewritten personal communication, and told in several pages of flowery language what I can perhaps condense within reasonable limits. Chirological College of California Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, Cal, U.S.A. Muy Señor Mio, with great pleasure, we send you a pamphlet on secret force, because we know that it contains information which will be of vast importance to you, as a means of being able to obtain that secret knowledge of the human character and of personal influence permitting you, in a moment, to know and understand the life of all other persons, to know their desires and their intentions, their habits and deficiencies, their plans, and all that can be prejudicial to you. Following our system, you can read the character of your neighbors as an open book. If you possess the system, Natahara, there will be no one who can deceive you. By means of it, you can know beforehand, under all circumstances, all that others intend to do, and can direct them to your own entire satisfaction. By means of the system Natahara, you can know exactly how much progress, how much love, how much health, and how much happiness the future has in store for you, and if it does not reserve for you as much as you desire, you can change its course to suit your ambitions. Never in the present century, or those past, has a more potent knowledge been given to the world. It teaches precisely when and how to use the magic force by means of which one obtains the realization of all desires. It makes them masters of destiny. I dare not tell you all the advantages of this knowledge but I assure you it is what you need, and that your life convert itself into a true success. I beg you to read The Secret Force, letter by letter, and to send at once for the system Natahara. Remember that sending to you of the system for a mere six dollars is only a special offer that we make, and if you wish to have the privilege of being the first in your locality to possess these great secrets you ought to send this very day. Without further particulars, I take great pleasure in signing myself, your grateful and affectionate servant, sign A. Victor Segno, President per sec, dictated to number one, S. There was no doubt that Santiago had followed the injunction to read the pamphlet letter by letter. Thanks to his Colombian schooling, that was the only way he could read it. But how was he to send the mere six dollars to Inspiration Point without his fellow townsmen knowing it, and perhaps forestalling his opportunity to be the first in his locality to possess the powerful secret? There is no postal order system between Colombia and the United States. He dared not send the cash, even if so large an amount of Nariño silver could be enclosed in a parcel the post would carry. So he had hidden away the letter and lain in wait for the rare foreigners that drift into San Pablo. While we read it, he sat on one of our beds, nervously fingering his toes. When we had finished, he begged us to find some way of sending the money, imploring us on our hopes of eternity, not to whisper a word of the secret to his fellow townsmen. We promised to think the matter over. 
When are you going to open the shop this morning? asked Hayes, as our host turned toward the door. Oh, I shall not trouble to open today, said the barber in a weary voice, and wandered away with the air of a man who sees no need of common toil when he is on the point of becoming the dictator of fate in all his locality. We hatched a scheme against his return. If we fancied he might forget the matter, we were deceived. Nothing else seemed to be weighing on his mind when he turned up again in the evening, dejected and worried. To have tried to explain the truth to him would have been only to convince him that we were agents of some rival house, sent down here purposely to ruin his chances of imposing his will upon San Pablo. If you feel you must have this system, I began, I'll tell you what I'll do. I have some money in a bank in the Estados Unidos, and I will give you a personal check for six dollars that you can mail to the Curological College. Magnifico! cried the barber, instantly transformed from the depths of gloom to the summit of glee. A thousand thanks! That will be six hundred dollars in billetes of Colombia. I, I will get it at once. It will be simpler, I suggested, to wait until you hear the check has arrived, then send it to me. Naturally, I am running no risk in trusting one of the chief men of San Pablo. Anyway, it would only be in payment for our magnificent lodgings. The Colombian rarely needs much urging to accept a favor, and his formal protests soon died away. I sat down to write the check. The Fake Bank, 920 West 110th Street, New York, USA. Pay to the order of the Chirological College of Los Angeles, Cal, the sum of six dollars. Signed, Baron Munchausen. The barber carefully folded the valuable document and hid it away in his garments, promising to send it at the first opportunity in a plain envelope, unregistered. For, he explained, confiding to us, a nationwide secret, the post office officials always steal any letter they think has money in it, and to register it makes them sure it has. The plan was cruel, but we could think of no other. No doubt Santiago waited many anxious months for the arrival of the system, certainly no longer than he would have if he had managed to send real money. Meanwhile, as Latin American enthusiasm shrinks rapidly, it may be that he grew resigned to his failure to become the dictator of San Pablo, and took up again the shaving of its swarthy faces and the cutting of its coarse black hair. Every house of San Pablo is a factory of Panama hats. The straw is furnished by the toquilla plant a reed somewhat resembling the sugar cane in appearance, which grows in large quantities in the valley of the Patia. If left to itself, the plant at length blossoms or leaves out in the form of a fan-shaped fern. Once it has reached this stage, it is no longer useful to the weaver of hats. For his purposes, the leaves must be nipped in the bud, so to speak, gathered while still in the stalk. The green layers that would but for this premature end, have expanded later into leaves, are spread out and cut into narrow strips with a comb-shaped knife. The finer the cuttings, the more expensive the hat. Between the material of a two-dollar and a fifty-dollar Panama, there is no difference whatever except in the width of the strips. Boiled and laid out in the sun and wind, these curl tightly together. They are then bleached white in a sulfur oven and sold to the weaver in the form of tufts not unlike the broom straw or a bunch of prairie grass the patilla produces also a much heavier leaf called mokora from which not only coarse hats but hammocks are twisted the weaving of the panama begins at the crown and the edge of the brim is still unfinished with protruding straws when turned over to the wholesale dealer Packed one inside the other in bales a yard long, they are carried on muleback to Pasto, 
There, more skillful workmen bind in and trim the edges. They are then placed in large mud ovens of beehive shape in which quantities of sulfur are burned. Next, they are laid out in the backyard of the establishment with chickens, dogs, and other fauna common to the dwelling of the Andes, wandering over them, be it said in passing, to bleach in the sun. They are rubbed with starch to give them a false whiteness, and finally, men and boys pound and pound them on blocks with heavy wooden mallets as if bent on their utter destruction, tossing them aside at last, folded and beaten flat, in the form in which they appear eventually in the show windows of our own land. The best can be woven only morning or evening, or when the moon is full and bright, the humidity of the air being then just sufficient to give the fiber the required flexibility. The local names for the entire process are tejar, the task of the weaver, azocar, the drawing together and trimming of the protruding straws, Asufrar, the baking over burning sulfur. Banyar en leche de asufre, washing in a sulfur bath. Limpiar con trapo, scrubbing with rags dipped in starch. Masatier, beating with mallets. Darle forma, pressing the hat tightly over a wooden form to give it the final shape, after which it is folded and ready for shipment. The complete process, from buying to shipping, cost the wholesale dealer about a dollar a dozen. Virtually every inhabitant of San Pablo is, from childhood, an expert weaver of hats. We had only to glance in at a door to be almost sure to find the entire family, large and small, so engaged. They squatted on their earth floors, leaned in their doorways, wandered the streets, incessantly weaving hats. They gossiped and quarreled, they grew vociferous in political discussion, and still they went on weaving. They shouted across the plaza to the two misters that were the guests of Santiago, the barber, a uh, where do you come from, and where are you going? What is your native land? In one single flow of words, without a pause for breath, but their fingers continued to weave hats as steadily as if they were automatic contrivances. We were told that in all the history of the town, only one boy had been too stupid to learn to weave. He was now the priest of a neighboring hamlet. End of Chapter 5, Part 1 Recorded by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 5, Part 2 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 5, Part 2 Down the Andes to Quito. Some make a regular business of it and weave several hats a week, as many as one commune a day. Only the rare victim of an artistic temperament prides himself on putting his best efforts, and from two weeks to a month of work, into an article of fine weave to receive a small fortune of eight or ten dollars in one windfall. It is in keeping with Latin American character that only a very few choose this extended effort, instead of the short, ready-money task of weaving comunes. The government telegraph operator of San Pablo, who probably averages a dozen messages a week, had a record of one hat a day, six hats a week, the year round. That was probably at least double the average output for very few worked with any such marked industry. The overwhelming majority are amateur weavers, making one hat a week merely as an avocation in the interstices of more regular occupations of cooking, planting, shopkeeping, school teaching, and loafing. The boy in need of spending money, the village sport who plans a celebration, the Indian, whose iron-lined stomach craves a draught of the fiery caña, the pious old woman fearful of losing the goodwill of a cura, 
all fall to and weave a hat in time for the Saturday market. Had they not these desires, unimportant though they may be, those in far-off lands who wear such headdress would pay more dearly for a scarcer article. The more thrifty and ambitious began to braid next week's hat on the way home from the market. By Sunday noon the hut is rare in all the land around, in which at least one Panama has not begun to come into being. By Monday even the liquor-soaked have begun to see the necessity of getting busy on penalty of suffering a dry weekend. The result is that the traveler can almost tell the day of the week by the stage of development of the hat he meets along the route. The center of the Nariño hat industry is Pasto. Not that its inhabitants are weavers, but here orders are received from the outside world and distributed among the towns of the province. Thus, Jesus Diaz, local agent of San Pablo, receives one morning a telegram worded, Suspend 12-15, start 11-13. The figures refer to centimeters of brim and crown, the only variation of style being in the comparative width of these. Castores are made for the American trade. Parejos, equals, of which brim and crown are of the same width, go to Spain. The ratonera, a very narrow brim, finds its market in Havana. The weavers of San Pablo can seldom be induced to make the wide-brimmed hats for women, since these can be sold only in the United States and the market is very uncertain. Because there, a woman confided to us, the style is always changing, as if they do not know their own minds. Unless they can be sold in our own land, these broad-brimmed hats are worthless, for the women of Nariño were only what we would consider men's styles. Those worn in San Pablo are of square top, ugly form, roughly woven, as if each consigned to his own head those so carelessly made that they cannot be sold. His telegram received, Jesus sends his sub-agents out through the hamlets with the new specifications, here and there to prepay something on the new order. For, from hand to mouth, do many of the weavers live, that they are frequently unable to buy the materials for the next hat without the agent's advance. The straw for one hat costs from one to forty cents, depending on the finesse. The high price of the better grades is chiefly due to the long labor involved in the weaving, with, of course, the usual heavy middleman profits between maker and ultimate consumer. The daily hat of the telegraph operator brought him from ninety cents to a dollar. The final purchaser in the United States would pay four or five dollars for it. The name Panama is unknown in Nariño, in connection with hats. None were ever made on the isthmus. They took the name by which we know them because Panama was long the chief distributing center. To their makers they are known simply as hats or, if it is necessary, to specify as sombreros de paja, straw hats, or sombreros de pieza. The best hats in all Colombia were said to be made in La Union, a little town lying in plain sight on a sloping hillside to the east, but in spite of their patriotism, many admitted that the best on earth are those of Hipihapa, made in Manabi, Ecuador. An old woman of La Union had won many prizes and awards in national and even international expositions, not merely for her hats, which sold for a hundred fuertes here, and for a hundred dollars in Europe or the United States, but for aprons and other garments woven of the same straw. The people of San Pablo complained that the Japanese, especially of the island of Formosa, were capturing much of the world's trade with a clever imitation of Colombian hats, very fine and light, 
but of an inferior straw that has little durability. Dawn the next morning found us clattering away down the cobblestones of San Pablo, the gigantic key protruding from its swan-shaped hole until Santiago, the barber, saw fit to awake from his dreams of future glory. At the top of a range beyond, we met the first pastusos, solemn-faced horsemen in winter garments and heavy ruanas of army blue, on the further slope and the rich uplands beyond. There were many Indian hamlets, each thatched house in a little field of its own. The golden browned grain of our homeland, the almost forgotten wheat, began to appear in patches on the hillside, with little fenced threshing floors of trodden earth, round and round, which the peasants chased their unharnessed horses. Every family has its patch of wheat, corn, or potatoes, according to the altitude. Among the latter were many species unfamiliar to us of the north, some with red, pink, or purple blossoms, whole acres of one color, for we were nearing the original home of the potato. In his own slow way, the Andean Indian still cultivates, as in the days of the Incas, many varieties unknown to the world at large, among others one shaped like the double-jointed peanuts of baseball fame, almost liquid inside. Higher still grew quinoa, Somewhat like our burdock in appearance, the top full of seeds not unlike the lentil, a palatable grain which for some strange reason has never been carried to other parts of the world. Under progressive farmers and modern methods, the region of Pasto could be the richest agricultural section of Colombia. But the Indian clings tenaciously to the ways of his ancestors though in this autonomous department he is a free or community owner and lives far more comfortably than do the estate laborers to the north. An American farmer would gasp at the laborious methods in vogue in the Colombian wheat field. At harvest time, the phases of the moon being propitious, the saints and ancestral gods placated, Men, women, and children wander out to the fields to cut the grain, stalk by stalk, tie it into bundles as leisurely as if life were ten thousand years long, and, with a sheep or two on their backs, toil away over the hills to their huts. There it is threshed by hand or under the hooves of animals. The chaff is separated by tossing the grain into the air with wicker woven shovels after which the wheat is spread out on a mat in the sun for days, turning over frequently and carried into the house by night. Once dry, it is ground by hand under a stone roller, beaten into flour, and baked over a faggot fire in crude adobe ovens of beehive shape. Small wonder the two soggy little loaves of bread a woman raked out from one of these, and which I went on, tossing from hand to hand, cost twice what a real loaf would cost in the United States. A valley with a decided tip to the south drew us swiftly on as only easy-going can, after steep and toilsome trails, and the afternoon was still young when we halted at San Jose, twenty-two miles from the barber's door. Here it made much cold, and we were warned that it would make even more so in Pasto. But native information on this point is seldom of much value to the traveler. In the Andes, climate varies not by season, but by location or altitude, and very few of the country people have any notion why one town differs in temperature from another. Accustomed all their lives to the fixed climate of their birthplace, they consider bitter cold or they on calor atroz, of atrocious heat, a neighboring hamlet where the mercury really falls but a few degrees lower or rises a bit higher. They accept the variation with the same passive indifference that governs their lives, from mother's back to the grave, their Catholic training stifling the query, why? The fact remains, 
the reason? Sabe Dios, por qué? It was September 13th, the first anniversary of the beginning of my Latin American journey, when we swung on our packs again. In spite of our resolutions, the proximity of a city had the usual effect of increasing our ordinarily leisurely gait. Sunrise overtook us, striding down the great San Bernardo Valley, a vast, well-inhabited gorge cultivated far up the mountain sides. Sugarcane mottled the landscape here and there with its Nile green. Every hut had its trapiche, a crude crusher with wooden rollers operated by oxen, or a still cruder one run by hand. Bananas were plentiful. Oranges lay rotting in thousands along the way. As the sun rose higher, the pastuso arrieros and horsemen threw the sides of their ruanas back over their shoulders, disclosing the bright red lining. Once it had crossed the river at the bottom of the valley, the road, and it was a real road now, speaking well of the industry of Nariño province, swung round and round the toothpick flanks of the mountain wall, rising ever higher for many miles, yet so gradually that we were scarcely conscious of climbing. Here at last we found ourselves in the Andes as the imagination had pictured them, dry, mammoth, treeless, repulsive, wholly infertile mountains, piled irregularly into the blue heavens on every hand. Under our feet the road suddenly began a buck-and-swing shuffle, and leaving it to its vagaries we scrambled and slid, particularly hay in its smooth-bottomed moccasins, down toward the Huanambu River, to the pass where General Nariño fought one of the great battles of the War of Independence. Two hours beyond, we came out on the nose of a cliff with a sheer fall of thousands of feet, which we took care not to take, affording a view of the country we had crossed for days past, the trail of forty-eight hours before climbing away into the sky at what seemed but a rifle shot away. At Boasco, a woman agreed to prepare food if I would give her an advance, sufficient to buy the necessary ingredients. When Hayes arrived, we sat down to a dinner so plentiful that we rose again with difficulty. Life is like that in the Andes. The traveler must feed to bursting when the opportunity offers, and starve at times without complaint. We had already done a reasonable day's tramping, but the nearness of Pasto overcame our better judgment. A few miles out, a group of pastusos, almost full Caucasian blood, rode by me with silent disdain. Evidently they disapproved of our mode of travel. Just beyond, the road broke up into many faint paths across a meadow the stony old trail of colonial days toiling up the face of the mountain to the right. I drew an arrow in the sand, lest Hayes, lost in some reverie, should fail to note the shod feet by which we tracked each other so easily in a world where all who walk go barefoot. A mile or two across the meadow I fell in with an excellent new highway, well engineered, that took to scalloping in and out along the flank of an enormous range, with a steady rise that never for an instant ceased as long as the day lasted. Here and there a clear, cold stream trickled from the still unhealed mountainside, piled into the skies above me. The visible world was wholly uninhabited now, with cold, bleak winds sweeping across the vast panorama of ranges below and above while ahead great patches of mist half concealed the dense bearded forests through which the road climbed doggedly. In these solitary Berruecos ranges, General Sucre was but one of many who had been murdered by brigands or conspirators, and every turn of the lonely road offered splendid ambush. 
Indeed, it seems strange that Colombia had proved so free from highway violence with no other policing outside the capital than in the larger villages, an occasional mild-eyed youth in one piece of uniform carrying a chain twister or a homemade nightstick. Toward nightfall, a horseman overtook me. Six weeks on the road had left me in excellent condition, and in spite of the miles and my legs, his animal could barely hold my pace. For a long time we mounted almost side by side, a new stretch of solitary highway staring us in the face at every turn, cold night settling down in utter solitude. It had grown wholly dark when we reached the summit, damp with the breath of the forest, an arctic wind sweeping across it with dense black night and a suggestion of vast mountain depths on all sides. The silent, gloomy Pastuso was evidently suspicious of my intentions and refused to ride ahead. Nor was I too sure of him. The dislike of having an unknown traveler behind me had persisted since my tramp through Mexico, but there was no other choice than to take the lead. On the further side the road was poorer, with a sharp grade and hundreds of fine chances to sprain an ankle. Colombians do not travel by night when they can avoid it, and we met not a sign of life. The stony road descended so swiftly that I had difficulty in judging its pitch, and a constant struggle to keep from falling in my face. Suddenly, at a chaos of paths, rocks, and jagged holes, as of some earthquake, I cross an unseen but noisy stream by a sagging log, and leaving the cautious horseman behind, saw him no more. On and on the rough and broken world dropped before me, with never a moment of respite for my aching thighs. I was concluding that I had lost the way entirely, when suddenly there burst upon me all the electric lights of Pasto. Actually electric lights, forty-two of them, as I could count from my point of vantage, each of what would have been sixteen candle power had each had some fourteen candles to help out. I slipped on my coat in anticipation of entering a hot bed of civilization, for was not Pasto the largest city between Bogota and Quito? I have ever been overhopeful. A city it was, to be sure, in the South American sense, but travelers, other than those of the mule driver class, come rarely to Pasto, and those who do arrive decorously by day and seek the home of friends. I had been given the name of the Hotel Central. The first passerby directed me to it, but added the information that they no longer assisted, that is, gave meals. Um, but they have rooms? No, they never did have rooms. They were only a hotel. Words have strange meanings in the far interior of South America. All that was left me was the posada, an ancient, dark, and gloomy one-story building around a patio, full of the scent and noises of mules and horses, and of arrieros wrapped in their blankets. Even the corner policeman advised me to keep the room offered me and be thankful. It was fortunate that Hayes had not arrived, for both of us could scarcely have crowded into the damp, earthy-smelling dungeon to say nothing of occupying the plank bed. Evidently he had found lodging somewhere along the way. During the day I had laid forty-two miles behind him, yet so fresh had I arrived that I went out for a stroll before retiring to pass a night almost as cold as in Bogota, dressed in every rag I owned, with two adobe bricks as a pillow, and as covering against the bitter cold that crept in, even through the closed door, the privilege of hugging myself. I had taken my coffee and wandered the streets of Pasto for an hour next morning 
when I suddenly sighted Hays, accompanied by a ruana-clad native. Usually as immaculate as conditions permitted, he was now unwashed, unshaven, bedraggled, drawn of features, and generally disreputable, with a sheepish look that turned to relief at the sight of me. He had a sad story to tell. Lost in some dream, he had overlooked my arrow in the sand, and had taken the old stony road over the Barroecos range. It was a shorter route in miles, and had the doubtful advantage of leading him past the very spot at which Sucre was assassinated. But the now abandoned trail of colonial days was in such condition that he had several times come near breaking a leg, if not his neck. Limping at last into town, Late at night, he had wandered the streets for some time in vain, when two natives asked if he was looking for lodging. Congratulating himself on his good fortune, he fell into step with them. A square or two further on, one of the pair disclosed a policeman's nightstick hanging from his arm. Hayes excused himself and turned away, only to be halted with the information that the law of Pasto required that any stranger arriving after eight at night be taken to the police station. The ex-corporal of the zone, accustomed for years to order his subordinates to lock up other men, was appalled at the notion of being himself locked up. His affronted dignity favored the pair with some of the most expressive Castilian to be found within the covers of Ramsey. How in vain! At the station the lieutenant who rose from a troubled sleep with a towel around his head, was courtesy itself, explaining that Pasto would not dream of subjecting so distinguished a foreigner to arrest. But as the night was late and the streets cold, they were doing him the favor of lodging him, not in jail, but in the police barracks. Looked at in that light, and at that hour, the affair assumed a new aspect. Hayes voiced his thanks and slipped from under his pack. A policeman led him to the squad room, gave him a reed mat spread on the floor beside the score already asleep, and covered him with one of the red and blue ruanas of pasto. On such terms I would gladly have spent the night under arrest myself. At midnight there had rushed into the room all the policemen on duty in town. Each dragged his relief to his feet and at once dived into the vacated bed, leaving Pasto for a half hour at the mercy of the lawless. At dawn, the order to muster was sounded. The policemen each and all turned over for another nap, and only rose when the querulous little chief of police came in to give the order in person, even then after considerable argument. Hayes had started to take his leave, but was called back to give his pedigree. The government paper was in my hands. The chief apologized for the necessity, but put him in charge of the ruana detective until he could examine the documents in question. We planned to spend several days in Pasto, but our efforts to get better lodgings did not meet with rosy success. We were once even on the point of renting a two-story house on the corner of the plaza, only to find that Though it had room enough to accommodate a score of persons, it was furnished simply and exclusively with the wooden-floored bedsteads indigenous to the Andes. Meanwhile, the bridal chamber of the posada was vacated, and we fell heirs to it, at nine cents a day each. The capital of Colombia's southernmost department, claiming a population of 16,000, sits in the capacious lap of the extinct pasto volcano, seeming, in spite of its 14,000 feet elevation, a mere hill, for the city itself is more lofty than Bogota. By no means so backward and fanatical a mountain town as described by its rivals to the north, it proved the most lively and progressive place we chanced upon between the Calca and Ecuador. A highway links it with the outside world by way of Tuqueres and Barbacosas, thence by boat, to the island port of Tumaco, 
on the Pacific. Yet there remains much provincialism and a stout clinging to the ways and the medieval faith of colonial days. With few exceptions, the entire population kneels in the street when any high churchman moves abroad. In one of the many overgrown churches is a glorified letterbox with a sign exhorting the faithful to write to San Jose, reputed to have his dwelling place near the town, requests for those favors they wish granted, and enclosing something for Jose's coin box. Once a week the letters are removed by a monk, and the worldly offering, having been extracted, are burned by the statue of the saint. Wheel traffic, of course, is unknown in Pasto. Virtually everything of importance comes from the sea on muleback. The most ambitious native handicraft we found was the making of tiples, crude guitars of red cedar and white pine. At first sight, Pasto has the aspect of a mighty mart of trade. Every street is lined from suburb to suburb by the wide-open doorways of shallow shops crammed with wares incessantly duplicated. To all appearances, there are more sellers than buyers. Pride in Hidalgo blood, however diluted, is evidently so widespread that no one works who can in any way avoid it all preferring to sit behind a counter in the hope of selling ten cents worth of something a day to earn as many dollars in some productive labor at the risk of soiling their fingers. Most numerous are the food shops, run chiefly by women, who find ample time between clients to do their housekeeping in a Colombian way. An inventory of one display, sloping from sidewalk to ceiling, is a description of all. Large, irregular bricks of salt, pinkish in color, and rectangular blocks of the muddy brown first product of the sugar cane form the basis of every heap. Next in order are cones of half-refined sugar, a variety of homemade sweets, long slabs of yellow soap from which is cut whatever amount the purchaser desires, baskets of small potatoes of shelled corn, and quinoa. Then there are oranges and bananas of several varieties, plantains, mangoes, strings of onions, heaps of one, two, and four cent loaves of wheat bread, or pan de queso, a mixture of flour and grated cheese, the largest of which barely attains the size of a respectable American biscuit, an abundance of canned goods, largely from the United States, invariably forms the top of the pyramid. These imported wares seem to have little sale among the natives, being kept in stock, apparently, in the fond hope of the arrival of stray gringos, exuding wealth at every pore. To the townsmen, indeed, the prices are almost prohibitive. A can of salmon filled with pale and ancient carp and decorated coloring matter, cost 65 cents. A five-cent box of American crackers was valued at 36 cents. Tabacos, as the black stogie of local make and consumption is called, a few iron-heavy cups and saucers, odds and ends of gaudy dishes, and small edibles and trinkets fill in the interstices of every display. Almost as numerous are the hawkers of strong drink, likewise women, who fall back on their sewing between customers. Competition is livelier in this line and price is correspondingly lower. A bottle of Milwaukee beer sold at 40 cents. Countless cloth shops with bottles of cheap grade and every color of the rainbow piled high in the doorways, boticas, or dingy little drug stores of breathtaking prices, and establishments offering everything that can by any stretch of the imagination be rated hardware, appear to be the chief male pastimes. Like so many towns of the Andes, Pasto does not seem to indulge in any form of intellectual recreation unless the art of conversation so diligently practiced can be rated such. 
there is not a bookstore in town. In a few shops are piled, among other wares, stacks of religious volumes and Catholic propaganda, including school books, dealing chiefly with the lives of the saints, but nothing more. It is a changeless town. There were once plenty of medios, and earlier still, cuartillos, we were informed, but these small pieces had all been given in alms to the church. The smallest coin still in circulation is the real. The word centavo disappears at the department boundary. He who buys a lump of sugar or a salt rock must take home a needle, an onion, or a banana in change. At the post office, where the real is accepted at something less than in the public markets, the purchaser may take his change in stamps, though the bastuso custom seems to be to give it to the clerk as a tip. High as it lies, Pasto is but two days' mule back from the great montaña, the hot lands and the beginning of the Amazon system. Just out beyond the cold mountain lakes of La Laguna comes a quick descent to Caquetá and the great jungles of eastern South America. Hence we saw on the streets of Pasto not merely the now familiar civilized Indians of the highlands, plodding behind his no more stolid bulls laden with the produce of his chacras, but also no small number of wild men from the wilderness. These have a free, happy, independent air in marked contrast to the manner of the dismal mountain Indian. None of the cautious, laborious, canny attitude toward life of those subject to the environment of high altitudes. They appear to hold the domesticated Indian in great scorn and mix far more freely with the other classes of the population. Dressed in what could easily be mistaken for the running pants of an athlete, their marvelously developed bronze legs are bare in any weather. A light ruana covered their shoulders. A few wear a gray wool skull cap. Most of them, only their matted, thick black hair, cut short across the neck in Dutch doll fashion. There were always several women in each group, but one must look sharply to make sure of the sex, dressed identically like their male companions, bare legs, haircut, and all. We took leave of Pasta four days after our arrival. That night, Hayes having his usual luck in winning the single wooden bench, I slept on a hairy cowhide on the earth floor of an Indian hut beside the Anca Smayu, or Blue River, about the northern limit of the Inca Empire at its height, and all night long guinea pigs kept running over me, squeaking their incessant treble grunt, gnawing at anything that seemed edible. Beside the llama and perhaps the alco, a mute dog that is said to have been exterminated by the hungry conquistadores, the only domestic animal of the Andes at the time of the conquest, were these lively little rodents, so absurdly misnamed in English, since they are neither of the porcine family nor known in Guinea, being indigenous to South America. The Spaniards, more reasonably, call them conejos de India, rabbits of India. To the natives, they were and still are known as qui, the origin of which term is evident to anyone who has listened to their grunting squeak through an endless Andean night. In pre-conquest days, the llama, being too valuable an animal to eat, even had the herds not been the personal property of the Inca, the cui probably constituted the only meat except wild game of the Indian's scanty diet. Today, every hut in the Andean highlands is overrun by them. The gente decente facetiously assert that the Indians keep them for two purposes, to eat and as a means of learning the art of multiplication. Next day the road was all but impassable, or we should have reached the Piales on the frontier that evening. Not that it was a bad road, as roads go in the Andes, but rain had fallen most of the night, 
and we skated down each slope in constant expectation of a mud bath to claw our way almost on hands and knees to the succeeding summit. Once we tobogganed thousands of feet clear through a town in which we had planned to eat, literally unable to stop, until we brought up against a luckily placed boulder on the edge of a stream in a roaring gorge far below. At Iles, where Hayes, hurrying on in quest of cigarettes, which he detested only next to smokelessness, for once arrived before me. I found dinner already preparing and my companion burdened with the key to a lodging. A tinsmith had left off work for the afternoon that we might have undisputed possession of his shop, stocked with a few ordinary articles of tinware, but given over chiefly to the fabrication of tin saints. Strange to say, once they had been sanctified by the priest, the results of his labors were as sacred to the tinsmith as to his fellow townsmen. Iles was just finishing a huge new church. The only implements of the workmen were shovels, for the whole building was of native mud, even to the roof tiles. The entire Indian population, male and female, impressed into service by the padre, trotted in constant procession from the spot where the clay was mixed with mountain grass and trampled with bare feet, carrying on their heads tiles filled with the material, the women bearing also their babies slung on their backs. The free labor system of the Incas, inherited by the conquistadores, is still in vogue in the isolated towns of the Andes, the taskmaster of today being the village cura. As we neared the frontier, population grew less and less frequent, and there were long stretches without an inhabitant. In the afternoon we turned aside from the royal highway to visit the Virgen de las Lajas, the most famous shrine in Colombia. To it come pilgrims from all the republic, from Ecuador and even further afield, to be cured of their ills. On the way down to it, we fell in with an old man driving an ass and heard the simple story of the founding of the sacred city. Centuries ago, the Virgin had appeared here and given a small child a statue of herself. They send this straight from heaven because it has a real flesh and blood face that bleeds if it is pricked or a hair is pulled out. Then she had ordered the bishop of Riobamba to build a chapel in the living rock of the mountain on the side of the apparition. Our informant was vociferous in his assertion that the Virgin daily cured victims of lameness, blindness, barrenness, and a hundred other ailments, but he offered no explanation of the fact that, though he had lived in Las Lajas all his life, he was almost sightless from ophthalmia. The village stacked up the sheer wall of a gorge in the far depths of which roared a small but powerful stream, had about it that something peculiar to all sacred cities, an intangible hint of unknown danger, perhaps from fanaticism, of ignorance, something of the sadness that comes upon the traveler at such evidences of the gullibility of mankind. Several posadas de peregrinos, crude copies of the hospices of Jerusalem, and many little shops and stalls like those of Pure, town of the Juggernaut, furnish pilgrims with lodging, food, blessed trinkets, and tons of English candles to burn before the miraculous image. Ragged boys left off their top spinning to beg una limosita little alms for the Virgin. As we descended through the town and went down by the sharpest zigzags to the white four-story temple with its twin towers hanging on the edge of the rocky gorge like encrusted foam of the waterfall that pitched into it. Though they make long journeys to implore her favor, the pilgrims have not reverence enough for their Virgin to reform their unspeakable personal habits, and every story of the holy edifice was an offense to the eyes and nose. 
The worker of miracles was the usual placid faced doll in rich vestments and gleaming jewels, or more likely paste imitations of those which the monks kept safely locked away in their vaults, behind a thick glass screen against which sad-eyed Indians flattened their noses in supplication. The rolling hills of Ecuador lay close before us when we strode into the Pialas, the last town of Colombia, and the coldest place we had known since our last northern winter. At this rate, the equator would prove ice-bound. The place was said to have much commerce with the neighboring republic, but the only sign we saw of it were a few troops of shivering donkeys. A mere five miles separates the Pialas from the frontier, and we had soon left behind the land of liberty and order, and entered that of the equator. The road, crawling dizzily along the face of a death-dealing precipice, descends to a collection of huts called Rumichaca, Quichua for rock bridge, which it is, indeed, for the boundary river, Carchi, races under a huge natural arch across which the Camino Real passes without a tremor. To our surprise, there were no frontier formalities whatever. Ecuador was not even represented. The two Colombian customs officials, diffident, slow-witted, but kindly pastusos, asserted that no duties were collected on goods passing between the two countries unless they were of foreign origin. Their task was merely to keep accounts of whatever passed the boundary. For what purpose was not apparent, unless it was to provide a sinecure for political henchmen. An hour later we were surprising the Ecuadorians lolling about the bare, sanded plaza of Tulcan. Only a lone telegraph wire had followed us over the frontier, yet the two countries blended into each other so completely that an uninformed traveler would not have guessed that he had crossed an international boundary. In the cuartel were housed a half hundred soldiers, rather insolent fellows, despite their Indian blood, their gaily colored rawness, giving to Khan a needed touch of color, engaged in the rather passive occupation of protecting their little wedge-shaped country from the pressures of the larger one above. By the time I had lessened our burden of silver by changing it into bills of the country, Hayes had fallen in with the jefe politico, the commander-in-chief of all the canton who bade us make our home in his bachelor parlor as long as we chose to remain. The room was the most magnificent we had seen since Bogota, with long solemn rows of upholstered chairs, straight-backed and dignified, framed family portraits that would not have gladdened an artist's heart, and two long but sadly narrow sofas covered with a horsehair cloth that after weeks on the planks and trodden earth floors of Colombia seemed elusive luxury personified. The Hefe bade us keep our hats on and left us with the Quito newspapers of a week back, our first touch with the outside world in some time. I suspected that Tulcan's chief dignitary had not treated us so regally out of mere kindness of heart. The suspicion was duly verified. We had stretched out on our elusive couches, and Hayes was already asleep, or feigning it most successfully, when the jefe arrived from a merry evening with his aides, and drew me into a conversation that promised to have no end. Under the guise of giving me information, he set himself to finding out, inquirily by indirection, what might our real motive be in entering Ecuador by the back door, unannounced though he never for a moment suggested his suspicions openly. It was a late hour before he gave any evidence of being convinced that there was nothing sinister and perilous to the welfare of his country behind our simple story. Then he grew confidential and announced that, as men who had, 
and might again be wandering in foreign parts, we were sure to run across two miscreants on whom he would like to lay his hands. One was Desiderio van Quathem of Belgium, described as a ferrotype photographer and a sleight-of-hand performer of no mean ability. He had married a cousin of the Jefe and borrowed a thousand sucres of our host to start a magic lantern show, only to disappear a week later, leaving his wife, but not the thousand sucres, behind. The impression left by the Jefe's complaint was that if he had reversed the process, there would have been no hard feeling. We were asked to keep an eye out also for one Francisco Fabra, boasting himself a Frenchman who had written from Ashcord, Akron, Ohio, proposing marriage to one of the Jefe's sisters, but who had dropped out of sight upon receipt of her photograph. No se debe burlarse así de las mujeres. No man should play such jests on a woman, cried the jefe fiercely. Had we not fallen in next morning with two Indians likewise bound, I am not sure we should ever have reached San Gabriel. We were soon engaged in an utterly unpopulated series of paramos, lofty mountain tops swept by icy winds, covered only with tufts of yellow bunch grass and myriads of phylaonis, clumps of mullen-like leaves on a palm-like stem from six inches to two feet high that peered at us through the mist like shivering, diffident mountain children. Our companions assured us that the plant was thus known because of its resemblance to a priest in his pulpit and that the leaves were highly efficacious against headache. There was also the acupaya, a kind of wild pineapple with sword-like leaves that gave it the appearance that forms of cactus known as Spanish bayonet, the heart of which, resembling a large onion or a small cabbage, is sold as food in the markets of the region. Then for a long way the trail led through moss-grown forests reeking in mud, which we could only pass by jumping from bog to bog and clinging to trees along the way. San Gabriel sits conspicuously and apparently unashamed on the summit of an Andean knoll, its streets falling away into the valley on every side. In the outskirts we came upon a game new to both of us. In the irregular fields that formed the plaza before a bulking mud church, a half a hundred barefoot Indian men and boys, each in warana of distinctive gay color reaching to the knees, were pursuing a sphere about half the size of a football. Each player had bound on his right hand, like the cesta of the Spanish pelota player, a large round instrument of rawhide, of the form of a flat snare drum or double-headed banjo. The rules of the game were evidently similar to handball or tennis. Hoping for some suggestion of aboriginal originality, I asked a player what the game was called. Pelota, senor, he answered laconically. I might almost have guessed as much. And that, I persisted, pointing to the banjo-shaped instrument. Guante, glove, he replied. A really bright man might have guessed that also. Evidently the tongue of the Incas had left little trace in San Gabriel. Suddenly the bell of the whitewashed church wang. The players piled their gloves hastily in the form of a cross, and every living person in the plaza, male or female, snatched off their hats, poured into the place of worship, from which arose some weird species of music, as we pushed on into the town. A letter from the Jefe of Tulcan gave us the entree to the parlor of one of his relatives. The fortnightly mail had just arrived, and Don Manuel was dictating letters to his daughter, who wrote slowly and painfully in a schoolgirl hand, dipping an ancient steel pen into a medieval inkwell between each word. 
When we returned at dark from a dingy little shop in which supper consisted chiefly of quimbolos, a kind of corn pudding wrapped in corn husks, we found Don Manuel, his wife, and four daughters all gathered in a family conference over the letter, each offering suggestions not as to its subject matter, but on the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's, a controversy which raged long and vociferously. Then there came marching into the room a huge mattress, under which, on close inspection, we made out the feet of an Indian boy, and the family announced that we were going to visit a pariente, a polite subterfuge to withdraw and leave us free to go to bed. The parlor was typical of the best room of well-to-do rural South Americans. A forest of chairs in shrouds and a chaos of gaudy bric-a-brac cluttered a chamber musty with little use. On the walls were framed portraits of the pudgy family ancestors back to the days of ruffles and powdered wigs, all draped with mourning crepe. The family library consisted of barely a half a dozen books, all of the general style of Tomas a Kempis, Imitacion de Cristo, except for a copy of an agricultural journal in Spanish, published in Buffalo. There are three routes from San Gabriel to Ibarra. To our surprise, we learned that all of them, far from following the high plateau, descended again to the hot country, for the valley of the Chota cuts a mighty slash entirely across Ecuador, a bit north of the Imbabura volcano. The Indians told us that the road was Pedroso. It was the most exact information we ever had from men of their race. Anything more stony would be more difficult to imagine. During all the afternoon there was not a moment in which we were not descending swiftly, our thigh muscles, set with the tautness of brake rods by an ever more stone-strewn road that curved in and out along the flanks of a barren range, forming loops as perfect as the written M of an expert in penmanship. On our left, an enormous gash in the earth, dreary, desert brown, with no other vegetation than a cactus, strangely enough called Mexico in this region. On our right, so close, it all but grazed our elbows, the tawny shale mountainside seeming to rise and grow as we descended. Where the cold winds of the highlands turned tepid, Indians disappeared. For a long space there was no sign of man. With every turn of the road the heat grew more tropical. A green spot appeared almost directly beneath us, hazy as a crumpled green rag with an indistinct light shining behind us. Then two negroes passed, the first we had seen since leaving the Calca. The road pitched headlong down the slope, donkeys and more negroes appeared, and the green patch developed into fields of sugar cane. Beyond them, by a wooden roofed bridge, we crossed the Chota River and found ourselves at sunset in the Caserio de la Chota. Tropical huts of reed and thatch, quite unlike the thick-walled adobe dwellings of the highlands, even in form, lay scattered along the further bank. The entire population was jet black in color, the life of the place as different from the plateau above as if we had suddenly been transported to another continent. Boisterous laughter broke often on the thickening dust. Above the chattering tongues, resounded frequently the screams of an exploded jest or a sudden quarrel. A piccaninny bawled lustily, startling us into the realization that we had never yet heard an Indian baby cry. The insolence of these descendants of the slaves once imported in large number for the sugar plantations of Ecuador, who in the half-century since the abolition of slavery had drifted into this tropical valley, to bask in the sun, was in striking contrast to the obsequiousness of the Andean Indian. Beside the two rows of straw and reed shacks of the Negroes stood a government building of stone and mud, one end of which was the telegraph office. In it the operator, 
who had left two days before to visit some relatives for a few hours, had locked two kids that bleated incessantly. The open portion of the building was a shambles. Thirty-two miles from the top to the bottom of the Andes had left our feet no fit standing place, even after soaking them in the choca. Yet we hesitated long before attempting to clear a space to lie down. Luckily, I still had a candle end in my pack. In a far corner, some energetic traveler had built a cot of reeds, laid across two sticks, but it had long since rotted to uselessness. Rumor had it that the negroes of Chota were skilled assassins, and the demeanor of the hamlet was by no means reassuring. We laid our weapons beside us on the stone floor, but dared not close the door for fear of drowning in our own sweat. All night through I woke frequently with the sensation of someone creeping in upon us, but dawn broke without any definite proof that the peril had been anything worse than the offspring of an overheated imagination. It would be task enough to climb from Chota to Ibarra on the strength of a hearty meal. To make it from a lazy negro village where not even a swallow of coffee was to be had approached torture. Hour after hour we toiled upward through a choking desert of sand and broken stone, pitched at the angle of a steep stairway. There runs a story of the Chota suggestive of the barrier it represents to modern progress. Archer Harmon, the American who lifted the railway of Guayaquil to the plains of Quito, strolling along the streets of the Ecuadorian capital one day, chanced to meet M. Blank, one of his American engineers. M. Blank, he said, shifting his cigar to the other cheek, Get out of here tomorrow morning and see what the chances are for a railroad to Bogota. The engineer sallied forth the next day on muleback with such equipment, or lack thereof, as can be had in Quito in a hurry. Three months later, he rode back into the city of the equator. Well, you're back, eh? said his chief. What it cost us to run her through the Chota Valley? About seventy miles of six percent grade in shale, replied the engineer. Hm, <laughs> said Harmon. There won't be any railroad to Bogota. Which is one of the many reasons why the nebulous Pan American Railway still exists only in the minds of inexperienced dreamers. Hours up, we begun to pass groups of meek, well built Indians easily distinguishable by their costume from the tribes to the north. They spoke a guttural yet sibilant language that could be none other than Quechua, the ancient tongue of the Incas, and I took occasion to test the vocabulary we had gleaned by putting an unnecessary question. Maipi nyan ibarra ta? To which the oldest of the group replied at once in fluent, though accented, Spanish, without the shadow of a smile. Si, sí, senor, this is the road to Ibarra. Derechito, straight ahead. Before noon, we were sharing a gallon of chicha at the top of the range, several world-famous volcanoes thrusting their white heads through the clouds about us. Ibarra and her fertile green slopes were plainly visible. A dozen villages dotted the far-reaching landscape, and the two roads to Quito wound away over the opposite flanks of cloud-capped Imbabura, towering into the sky beyond and cutting off half the southern horizon. Below us spread the famous Yagorcocha, the Lake of Blood. At the height of his power, Hyana Kipak, 13th Inca, had pushed his conquests over the equator, where the Caranquis, a warlike tribe of the valley before us, revolted. The army sent against them exterminated the Caranqui warriors and threw their bodies in the lake, turning its waters blood red, according to the legend, 
and giving it the name it bears to this day. Its shores were white with encrusted salt, and like so many lakes of the Andean highlands, so completely surrounded by reedy swamps that we were forced to abandon the swim we had promised ourselves before entering the principal city of Ecuador, north of the capital. Ibarra is a still and dignified old town of some 12,000 inhabitants, founded in 1606 under the Spanish viceroy from which it took its name, as a residence for the white men of the region between Pasto and Quito, on the site of the old Indian village of Caranqui. In spite of the extreme fertility of the surrounding valley and its peerless climate, many of its houses stood empty, and several buildings of colonial days were still the ruins the great earthquakes of many years ago had left them. The keeper of the little eating house that actually and publicly announced itself abandoned to us her own quarters, densely furnished with photographs frail chairs, tables, sofas, cane lounge, and an immense canopied bed, to say nothing of the extraordinary luxury of a newspaper only two days old. To offset the pleasure of the first real bed in weeks, however, the town kept us awake most of the night with a local fiesta. We had been so lacking in foresight as to arrive on the day sacred to the Vergen de las Mercedes. The celebration began early in the afternoon. An endless train of Indians in a bedlam of colors trooped across the town under great bundles of dry brush gathered far away in the hills, a haughty chief on horseback riding up and down the line, giving his orders in sputtering Quichua. Men, women, and children deposited their loads on the bare plaza before a weather-tarnished old church, and ambled away for more. Five immense heaps had been laid out in the form of a cross when a priest sallied forth to sprinkle them with holy water. In the thickening dust the entire town gathered amid a deafening din of battered church bells, the explosion of thousands of homemade fireworks and cannon crackers, the blare of a tireless band, and the howling of the population in its swarming curs. The brush cross was lighted by a priest in rich vestments and a pandemonium that may have been pleasing to the sleepless virgin raged the whole night through. The driftwood of the festival in the form of chicha victims sprawled on their backs in the streets and gutters littered the town when we set out to climb the frozen equator at Cayambe. A wide highway strode up through the Indian town of Caranqui, birthplace of Atahualpa, best loved son of Hiana Chipac and of Pakcha, daughter of the conquered Skiri, who once ruled the territory of the Quitos, and away due southward over the left shoulder of Imabura. For the first miles it was so crowded with Indians in crude red blankets, heavy gray felt hats, and bare legs that it seemed the migration of some tribe from another world. All sides stepped like Hindu coolies, and even the women touched their hats to us as they passed, greeting us sometimes in Spanish, but more often in Quechua. To the west rose the snow-topped peak of Cotacache, sharp as a dog's tooth, and the view of Ibarra and her fertile valley opened up below and behind us like an unfolding map. Then a ridge wiped out town and jogging Indians and left us only the gaunt, spreading mountain world to look upon. Thirty miles lay behind us when we entered Cayambe, a drowsy, tumble-down little place of no great size, the chill of the blue ice fields capping the great volcano of the same name that bulks into the heavens close beside it, sweeping through the dreary street unhampered. Next day, a long and tiresome eight leagues led across a desolate and parched country, fissured by enormous earthquake cracks. But for the discovery of a new drink, Huarango 
of unknown concoction, we might have stumbled across the sand-blown equator in far worse state than those who first pass it within the realms of Father Neptune. A drought had fallen upon the region so long since that even the cactus had given up in despair. All day long, Cayambe stood forth clear and blue over our left shoulders, and far off to the hazy southwest the horizon was walled by a vast range, the highest point of which was evidently Pichincha, at the foot of which lay the end of our present journey. With our goal so near at hand, we found it difficult to hold ourselves overnight in the semi-tropical oasis of Gayalambamba, the sandy streets of which were half paved with the stones of alligator pears. By daylight we had descended to the river and begun the unbroken climb of more than 5,000 feet to the top of the succeeding range. A wide highway now led due west between cactus hedges through a country so desert dry that both stock and people seemed to be choking, and the fear came upon us that Quito, too, would be suffering such a famine of thirst that our plan to take up temporary residence there would turn to disappointment. Another steep, tongue-parching climb brought to view all Pichincha and its surrounding world, yet nowhere was there any sign of Quito. The highway swung south, rising and falling gently here and there between dry fields, fenced with cactus or mud walls, a town tucked away in the wrinkle of the range beside us. In a shelter at the roadside, an Indian woman selling steaming soup with a bit of meat and tiny potatoes in it served us in a single earthenware plate with wooden spoons as impassively as she did her own people. Further on, groups of aborigines were burning off over brush fires the bristles of slaughtered pigs that lay in batches of a half dozen split open along the road edge. A carriage passed, and the first we had seen in weeks. Then an automobile, a man in European clothes, wearing shoes, yet actually walking, a clean child of well-to-do parents. A motley crowd, chiefly Indians in gaudy ponchos, came and went. Large buildings grew up on either side of us, the highway passing through green groves of eucalyptus pungent with the smell of Australian gum, took on the name of 18th of September, though it was really the 26th, and all at once Quito in its May-like afternoon burst out before us in its mountain hollow, a great grassy mound cutting off the horizon on the south. Fifty-seven days had passed since we had walked out of the central plaza of Bogota, during fifteen of which we had done no walking. Our pedometer reported the distance thence 844 miles, and we had each spent a dollar for each day of the journey. Hayes had set out weighing 180, and I 160. We arrived weighing 160 and 161 respectively. We may not have presented quite so bedraggled an appearance as the remnant of Gonzalo Pizarro's band on their return from the wilderness of the Amazon, but we were certainly no fit subjects for a drawing room. End of chapter 5, part 2, recorded by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 6, Part 1 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 6, Part 1 The City of the Equator. I settled down for months in Quito. Not only were my canal zone experiences to be written, but I had long since planned to become a bona fide resident of a typical small South American capital. A letter of introduction won me quarters in the home of Señor Don Francisco Rañez V, 
in the calle Flores, while Hayes hung up his hat in even more sumptuous surroundings around the corner. Oh, but not so fast. Not even whole-hearted Don Panchito would have received me in the state of sartorial dilapidation of our arrival. The people of Quito are somewhat less rigid disciples of Beau Brummel than those of Bogota, but they are still far from negligent in dress. Most of the clothes indispensable to our entrance into the ranks of the gente decente had been mailed in Gerardo. The rest had been turned over to the American drummer in Cali. The first shock Quito had in store for us was the information that no parcel of any shape or description had come from Colombia in months. The second was that the discovery that the traveling man had not arrived. It was hard to realize that we had outwalked all the established means of transportation in this equatorial land. An unavoidable round of the shops wiped out the remnant of my savings as a policeman and brought me down again to the letter of credit that had lain fallow more than a half year. Except for tailor-made suits, the cost of replenishing a wardrobe was startling. Ready-made clothing for men is rare in the cities of the Andes, and it is far more economical to be fitted to order in one of the sastrerias that abound in almost every street. Dingy little rooms, their fronts, all doorway, in which sit anemic half-breed youths sewing languidly, yet incessantly, now and then carrying the charcoal-filled goose out into the street to blow out the ashes, as dependent on the passing throng for inspiration as the craftsmen of Damascus. As in the more northern capital, the chief line of demarcation between the gente and the pueblo of Quito is the white collar naturally the tendency is to make it as wide and distinct as possible i had canvassed the entire city before i found my customary brand of neckwear at four times its american price only to discover that the lowest collar in stock was designed for some species of human giraffe you misunderstand me i protested i did not ask for a cuff this is a collar, senor, cried the shopkeeper. Something lower, please. But this is a very low collar. It is so low no one in Quito will wear it. And we are not importing any more of this brand. In the matter of shoes, I found at last a Massachusetts product that might have served. But when I had beaten the dealer down to about twice the American price, a seven was found to be the largest size in stock. The merchant seemed on the verge of tears. Why, senor, he gasped, gazing resentfully at the offending member, there is not a foot in Quito as large as that shoe. He did not mean exactly what he said, but it was natural that he should have had in mind only the minority of Quiteños who wear shoes. These squeeze their feet into articles of effeminate toothpick shape for custom's sake, as they force their necks into collars that come little short of hanging, and have their trousers made sailor fashion that their feet may look still more ladylike. One cannot, of course, pose as an aristocrat on the broad hoofs of an Indian. In the end, I was forced to submit to Botas de Hule, an imitation patent leather shoe made in Guayaquil. Hayes concluded that with a general overhauling he could pass muster until our bundles arrived, but on one point immediate renewal was unavoidable. He paused in the doorway of one of the little sewing dens to ask, Can you make me a pair of trousers by Saturday night? In spite of having pillowed for weeks on Ramsey, Hayes never could remember that Castilian trousers come singly. Un par, senor? cried the tailor. 
Ah, no, that is impossible. So soon I can make you a trouser by then, but not two of them. Then, while you are wearing the one, I can perhaps make the other, if the senor is in much haste. Oh, all right, said Hayes, suddenly recalling that trousers are, I mean is, singular in Spanish. Go ahead. I'll try and get along with one over Sunday. The error persisted, however. It was not three days later that he was halted at the door of his lodgings by a whining beggar. Una caridad, caballero. Have you not perhaps some old clothes to give a poor unfortunate? Sure, said the generous ex-corporal of police. I'll bring you down a pair of trousers. He did so, whereupon the beggar growled angrily. But you said a pair. Where's the other one? Few continual dwellings are equipped with bathrooms. I halted a passerby to inquire for a public casa de baños and was directed to the foot of the calle Rocafuerte. Hot baths? I queried, suspiciously. Certainly, senor, he answered haughtily. If you go there any morning, about ten, when the sun is shining, you will find them quite caliente. A crumbling old adobe gate marked Baños de Milagro gave entrance to an aged two-story building of the same material. Passing through this, I was astonished to find spread out before me what looked like an immense outdoor swimming pool. It was illusion. Nearer approach showed a broad sheet of water barely six inches deep, a half acre of it warming in the sun. I suddenly recalled that the same word serves in Spanish for all degrees of temperature, from hot to lukewarm. Around the basin were many little adobe dens, in the center of each a stone basin some four feet deep, with steps leading down into it. The fee was a mere real, five cents. For the streams that course down the face of Pichincha are abundant. An Indian scrubbed out the pool with a broom fashioned from a bundle of faggots and turned it full of water so clear that I could have read a newspaper at the bottom. But the heating apparatus was not particularly effective. When the icy mountain water had filled the stone basin, cold as only a shaded spot at this altitude can be, the uninured gringo could only grit his teeth, clutch desperately at his sixty-cent bar of imported English soap, and plunge in, and quickly out again. One such experience was enough to explain why Quito shows so decided an aversion to the bath. My residence in the city was all but nipped in the bud by a mere matter of red tape. Again, the shock was administered at the post office. When I presented the registry slips for the package of notes on which my proposed volume depended, they were all there, sure enough, the seal still unbroken. But as I opened them for customs inspection, the startled employees cried out in horrified chorus, Senor, it is against the law to send manuscript by mail in Ecuador. These were mailed in the United States, where it is not against the law. No importa. It is illegal for them to write in the Ecuadorian mail. They will have to be confiscated by the government. What can the government do with them? I asked innocently. Burn them, of course, replied the clerk. Luckily, the laws of Ecuador are not so inexorable and incorruptible as those of some other lands, but I passed a far from pleasant hour before I discovered that saving fact. Just where the line is drawn between manuscrito and mere letters, I was never able to learn. At any rate, the sender of the offending notes is still wanted, I believe, to serve a year in the penitentiary of Quito. I had not been three days in the city of the equator when I began to feel the necessity for exercise. The best families lead a very sedentary and physically idle existence, virtually spending their lives at the bottom of a hole in the ground, for such 
the central plaza and few adjoining squares about which it is customary to stroll might be called. Yet there are innumerable views and picturesque corners to reward him who will climb out, and climb he must, for the city lies in a fold of the skirts of Pinchincha, out of which almost every street mounts more or less steeply. The main plaza is the heart of Ecuador. In its center, instead of the handsome brass fountain of Stevenson's day, rises a tall, showy monument topped by a bronze victory or liberty or some other exotic bird, while at its base cringes an allegorical Spanish lion with a look of pained disgust on its face and an arrow through his liver. Much of the square is floored with cement, blinding to the eyes under the equatorial sun and only mildly relieved by staid and too carefully tended plots where violets, pansies, yellow poppies, and many a flower known only to the region bloom perennially. Its diagonal walks see most of Quito pass at least once a day, but neither Indians nor the ragged classes pause to sit on its grass-green benches, nor may anyone carrying a bundle pass its gate, unless the guard chances to be doing something other than his appointed duty. On the east, the square is flanked by the two-story government palace, housing the presidency, the ministry, both houses of Congress, the custom house, Ecuador's main post office, and considerable else, yet finding room for several cubbyhole shops under its portico. To the south, sliding on, rather than facing the square, its towers barely rising above the roof, is the low cathedral in which are the tombs of both Sucre and his reputed assassin Flores, the Washington of Ecuador. The third and fourth sides are flanked by the archbishop's palace and the municipality, both with portales, arcades beneath which are dozens of little den-like shops and filled from pillar to pillar with hawkers and their no less motley wares. Every street of the city is roughly cobbled, with a row of flagstone along its center for Indian carriers and four-footed beasts of burden, and on either side a narrow, slanting, slab-stone walk on which the pedestrian, whose appearance suggests the lower social standing, is expected to yield passage. Rambling over a rolling, at times almost hilly site, every street is due sooner or later to run off into the air on a hillside or to fade suddenly away in a noisome lane. Quito has no residential section. Its chiefly two-story buildings are, with rare exceptions, constructed of mud blocks on frames of chacuarquero, the light, pithy stalk of the giant cactus with roofs of the familiar dull red tiles. Whitewash and paint of many colors strive in vain to conceal this plebeian material and many a facade is gay with ornamentation. Well-to-do people, who are commonly the owners of the building they dwell in, occupy the second floor. The lower story of the city is the business section. That portion of the house facing the street is almost certain to be given over from one to several shops, the patio serving as a yard for the loading and unloading of pack animals, while the bare adobe cells opening on it house the family servants and Indian retainers. To dwell almost anywhere in Quito is to live in the upper air of a combination of slums and business houses, and wherever the wealth or boasted aristocracy of a family, it is certain to come into daily contact with the unwashed gente del pueblo, that inhabits its lower regions and performs its menial tasks. There are shops enough in Quito, to all appearances, to supply the demands, if not the needs, of all the million and a half inhabitants of Ecuador. These are, for the most part, small, one-room dungeons without windows, flush with a sidewalk, with no other front than the door that stands wide open during business hours 
and presents at other times their blank faces ornamented with several enormous padlocks. The Quiteno puts no trust in the small locks of modern days. Many a shop, the entire stock of which is not worth a hundred dollars, is protected not only by bolts and bars within, but by half a dozen of those huge and clumsy contrivances that the rest of the world used in the Middle Ages. To shut up shop is a real task in Quito, of which the lugging home of the enormous keys is by no means the least burdensome. Naturally, if a real burglar cared to take the trouble to journey to Quito, he would find far less difficulty at his trade than in a city ostensibly less secure. Besides the establishments of hundreds of men who would rather wear a white collar than work, there are innumerable little holes in the wall run by women of the people, in conjunction with their scanty household duties where chicha and stronger drinks and the few foodstuffs of the Indians and the poorer classes are displayed, and sometimes sold, though there are barely customers enough to go around. Clothing stores, or more exactly, cloth shops, are perhaps most numerous, countless useless duplications of the selfsame stock with hundreds of bolts of as many different weaves piled high in the open doorways. Every merchant, however meager his supplies, announces himself an importer and exporter. And after morning mass, manto-wrapped women wander for hours from shop to shop, haggling for a fancy difference of a half cent in some purchase, which in the end is more apt than not to be abandoned. Business is petty at best, its ethics low, and the native Quiteno is a weak competitor of the foreigners that swarm in the city. Italians, especially the wily Neapolitan, and Turks, as the ubiquitous Syrians are called in all South America, capture much of the trade. A foreigner remains a foreigner in Ecuador for the country has but weak powers of assimilation. A unique note into the life of Quito are the propriedad signs. Revolution with its accompanying looting is ever imminent. The native shopkeepers are frankly at the mercy of the looters, who only too often are the government itself. But the foreigner despoiled of his wares can always lodge a complaint with his home government. Reparations may follow and even the punishment of the looters is conceivable. To warn these of their peril and to induce sober thought in times of anarchy, the foreign merchant paints on his shop front a huge flag of his country, similar to that used by neutral steamers in wartime, with surcharged words conveying the same information to those unacquainted with the colors. Thus, the German's place of business is distinguished with a Black, propriedad, white, alemana, red. Within a few blocks of the main plaza may be noted the following propriedades. Española, Francesca, Alemana, Belgia, Danesa, Inglesa, Italiana, Hollandesa, Sueca, Chilena, Colombiana, Peruana, Venzolana, Turca, and one or two more. The stars and stripes and the words Propriedad Americana appear only once on the door of a small export house. Apparently everyone is entitled to three guesses on the population of Quito. The estimates range from fifty to a hundred thousand, with the truth probably somewhere near the 75,000 attributed to it in Stevenson's day. Its tendency of late years has been to overflow its banks. The suburb Huarico climbs a considerable way up the skirts of the Pinchincha, and the huts of Indians have scrambled well up the flanks of the other enclosing ridges. Though more in touch with the outside world than Bogota, it has much the same atmosphere of a world apart a peaceful, restful little sphere 
supplied with a few modern conveniences of a crude, breakdown often sort, but with little of the complicated life of twentieth century cities. It is a splendid place to play at life, to lie fallow and catch up with oneself, with nothing more exciting to stir up existence than the semi-weekly concert in the Plaza Mayor. A score of carriages rattle over its cobbled streets. The rails of a tramway line had been laid years before our arrival, but the cars had not yet been ordered. Somewhere there may be a finer climate, but it would scarcely be worth while going far to look for it. Standing at a height which, in the temperate zone, would be covered by eternal snows, the city is sheltered by the surrounding ranges from the bitter chill that descends so often upon less lofty Bogota. In the Colombian capital, we were always suffering more or less from cold in our waking hours, except at midday. In Quito, it was possible to sit comfortably on a plaza bench at midnight. With all the stages of nature, from planting through blossoms, fruit and harvest, existing side by side, its days are like the best half-dozen culled from a northern May. There is a popular saying that it rains thirteen months a year in Quito, but this is slander. During my long stay there were, to be sure, few days when it did not rain, but the shower came almost always at a more or less fixed hour of the afternoon, and the resident soon learned to make his plans accordingly. The rain seemed heavier than it was in reality, for tin spouts pour water noisily out into the cobbled streets, the wide projecting eaves protecting the sidewalks. Now and then came a day heavy with massed clouds. Far more often, all but an hour or so, was brilliant with sunshine. Yet an American school ma'am, accustomed to tell her pupils that the people of Quito all dress in white because it lies in the equator, would be startled to see what attention even a woman in light-colored garb attracts in its streets. On rare occasions a man in white cotton passed through the overcoated plaza during the evening concert, but this meant only that the tri-weekly train from Guayaquil had arrived. We met, too, an American drummer, more noted for his ability as a mixer than for his knowledge of geography, who had arrived with a carefully chosen wardrobe of white linen suits, and proved a godsend to the local tailors. Incidentally, he had come down to introduce American plumbing in Ecuador, but that is another and still sadder story. The truth is that moderate winter clothing is never out of place in the city of the equator. Even at noon, with one shadow, a round disk underfoot, and the sun glaring to the eyes and burning the skin, in this thin upland air, a leisurely climb up one of the longest streets brought no memories of the tropics. As in all high altitudes, there is a marked difference between sunshine and shade. The first greeting in a Quiteño house is sure to be, Cúbrese usted, put on your hat. And however impolite it may seem to the newcomer, none but the unwise will disregard the suggestion. Only when one has become acclimated to the room may one uncover with impunity, for to catch cold in Quito is a serious matter, and the road from a cold to pneumonia is short and swift in this thin air. Thanks to the altitude, it is the common experience of newcomers to be either unduly exhilarated or sunk in the depths of despondency. There is not a chimney in Quito, and no breath of smoke is ever known to smudge her transparent equatorial sky. Factories in the modern sense are unknown. Cooking is the same simple operation as in the rural districts of the Andes. The Quiteño knows artificial heat, if at all only by hearsay. I chanced to be in the reception room of the Minister of Foreign Affairs one afternoon when a newly appointed Argentine ambassador dropped in for his first informal call. 
In the course of the polished small talk that ensued, the diplomat mentioned a new law in Buenos Aires requiring the heating of public buildings during certain months of the year. The minister, an unusually well-educated man for Ecuador, stared a moment with puzzled expression, then leaning forward with undiplomatic eagerness, replied, Why, I suppose you would have to have some kind of artificial heat in those cold countries. From the center of the city itself, not one of the snow-clad volcanoes that encircle it like tents of a besieging army are visible, but a climb to the rim of the basin in any direction leads to some point of vantage overlooking all Quito and its surroundings. Of a score of far-reaching views, that is perhaps most striking from the summit of the Panacillo, the little loaf that bottles up the town on the south is well named. It resembles nothing so much as a fat biscuit, lush green in its covering of perpetual spring. Antiquarians have never agreed whether the Panacillo is a natural hill or partly or wholly built by man. Geologically it is out of place, for all the rest of the region is rocky and broken, and nowhere else in the vicinity has nature constructed any symmetrical thing. Some have it that an already existing hill was rounded off before the conquest as a pedestal for the Temple of the Sun, which tradition asserts adorned the summit long before the coming of the Incas. If it is entirely man-built, the construction of the pyramids was an afternoon sport in comparison. Somehow the imagination likes to picture thousands of Indians of both sexes and all ages jogging like lines of tropical ants up and down the sacred mound with baskets of earth on their uncomplaining backs, as they still trot today through the streets of Quito under loads of every description. A road runs round and round the Panacillo, making two full revolutions in so leisurely and dignified a manner that it would seem almost level, did not the city below open out more and more with each step forward. At the summit, across which sweeps a never-failing wind from the south, is a view worth many times such a climb. All Quito lies huddled in its pocket below, like the body of a dull red spider with its legs cut off at varying lengths. The city is clearly visible in every detail, from the very roof tiles of its houses to the gay-colored ponchos of the Indians, crawling like minute specks across its squares and along its ditch-like streets. Along the earth wrinkle at the base of Pichincha's long ridge are glimpses of small villages and countless little green fields standing edge up on the flank of the range, seem so close at hand to be within touch. Here the early riser may watch the birth of clouds. At sunrise the Andes stand out sharp and clear as if the sky had been carefully swept during the night. Then a tiny patch of mist detaches itself, here and there, from the damp flanks of Pichincha. Streaks of steel-gray clouds begin to rise under the warming sun, like a curtain drawn from the bottom. Soon the entire ridge is steaming from end to end, and before one's very eyes come into being and float away across the world those masses of clouds that greet the late riser full-grown. In the transparent air of the highlands, the eye embraces far more than the city. The surrounding world, being above the tree line, is bare of any vegetation other than the brown bunch grass, as would be the city and its environs also, but for the thousands of eucalyptus trees imported in the days of Garcia Moreno. Swinging round the circle, one catches sight of a dozen famous volcanoes, all more or less capped with snow. Almost due north rises the glacier-clad bulk of Cayambe. Squatted squarely on the equator, perhaps forty miles away, yet seeming just over the ridge beyond the city. Near it, jagged Cotacache pierces the blue heavens. Further around comes Antisana, 
than Sincolagua, the giant that not many years ago blew its head off in a fit of rage. To the east stands Pasocha, followed by Rumanaue, the stony-eyed of the same name as the Indian Quiteno general who continued the war against the Spaniards after the capture of Atahualpa. Over its shoulder peers the tip of Cotapaxi. Little Corazon comes next, with Yiniza striving in vain to hide behind it until finally the eye has swung back to the broad flank of Pinchincha, up which clamber Indian huts like captive turtles striving to escape from their enclosing basin. Above them two ragged rocks and lava peaks, often streaked with snow, the Ruku and Huawa, man and baby. Pichincha, invisible from the city itself, stands forth close at hand against the chill steel blue of the upland sky. Pichincha is rated as a dead volcano, having given no signs of life since 1660, but the early history of Quito is strewn with its ashes and destruction. Quiteños are much given to bewailing their triste landscape, yet few of her canvases has nature painted with so masterly a hand. Three weeks after our arrival, Hayes burst in upon me one morning with the information that the bundles we had mailed in Hirado had come. Well on in the afternoon, the post office officials saw fit to lay them before us. A ragged boy cut the strings and spread out the contents for customs inspection. This over, we were preparing to carry them off when we were halted by the grunt of an official deep in some long arithmetical process at a nearby desk. By and by he rose and pushed toward each of us a long list of figures. Mercancias merchandise, 8,500 grams. Derechos, duty, thereon, at two dollars a kilogram, seventeen dollars. Mas, one hundred percent, plus one hundred percent, seventeen dollars. Defensia Nacional, one seventy. A forro, one fifty seven. Muyaje, wharfage, two twenty three. Bodega, storage, ninety three. Brokerage, two thirty. Timbre, stamp. Fifteen, total forty-two dollars and eighty-eight cents. These are personal belongings, chiefly clothing, all more or less worn. I began, scenting a long controversy. Through, senor. You surely do not ask us to pay duty on personal baggage. Travelers arrive at Guayaquil every week with several trunks and pay no duty. Only that is baggage, which the traveler personally brings in with him. The charges are forty-two dollars eighty-eight cents for each, senores, since the parcels are of the same weight. But you can see for yourself that they are marked value seven dollars. The law goes by weight only, senor. Why the hundred percent addition? The new law requires all duties to be levied twice. And this third item? For the upkeep of the National Army and Navy. Well, what is this aforro? That is the freight from Panama. But the postage was prepaid from Hirado to Quito. One dollar. Doesn't Ecuador belong to the Postal Union? Naturally, senor but by a special treaty with the United States parcel post packages pay freight across the isthmus and from Panama to here. And this millage, the landing charges in the port of Guayaquil. Bodega is for warehouse storage charges. But the bundles came through in a mail bag without so much as entering a warehouse. Those are fixed charges, 
irrespective of special conditions. The brokerage covers my fee here in the office, and the stamp is that which you see on the document here. The total charges are $42.88. Keep em, growled Hayes, turning away. Make a present of em to your president, or dress up one of your statues of liberty. Naturally, he spoke in English, for we still plan to live some time in Quito. As we reached the door, a word from the official caused us to turn back. He was up to his ears in another set of figures. We can call it cotton instead of clothing, he said, presenting a new list. Then the charges will only be twelve dollars twenty-five cents. Make it old clothing, suggested Hayes. The law mentions clothing without qualifications, replied the official, with the patient courtesy that is the chief virtue of his race. The bundles do not weigh that anyway, I persisted. Most of it is in the wrapping. The law specifies bulk, not net weight. Keep them with our compliments, growled Hayes, turning away. I tell you what you can do, senores, suggested the official. Go buy a stamped sheet of government paper at thirty cents and write the director of posts. Why can't we write him on ordinary paper? It would not be legal. Go buy a thirty-cent stamped paper and put a ten-cent stamp on it. What's that for? For the upkeep of the National Army. Write the director of post reclaiming the duty you have paid. After we have paid it, cried Hayes. Hardly. I have had too much experience with Latin American governments. In the end, we bought the stamped paper and wrote the director, leaving the letter with the official who promised to forward it to his chief. Tomorrow. As the bundles contained some rather indispensable odds and ends, and because I wished to investigate Ecuadorian government processes to the bottom, I followed the matter up. Next day we called twice at the post office, and finally late in the afternoon signed a blank request to be given the packages duty-free without which, it appeared, the matter could not be officially considered. Two days later, we were informed that a junta had been ordered to meet and pass on the case, there being no precedent for action. A week passed. The junta showed no ability to get together. I took up the quest again, and spent an afternoon in gaining admittance to the sanctum of the director of posts. He was courtesy itself. But the gist of his remarks was, That is not baggage which comes in by mail. It is only legally so when it crosses the frontier with its owner. However, if you wish, you might call on the Minister of Public Instruction, who happens to be also at present time acting Minister of the Interior, to which department the matter refers, and ask to have the bundles passed as baggage. I spent the better part of two days in the ante-room of the ministry, a sumptuous pink and blue adobe chamber with a score of bullet holes in the walls, mementos of the latest request of the populace for the resignation of the president, only to learn. The law mentions no difference between old and new clothing, between fresh and soiled linen, all clothing entering Ecuador, except as baggage, pays the same duty. Hence, I see no way you can avoid it. I did not succeed in getting the matter before Congress, officially at least, though I only missed taking it up with the President through an oversight of one of his aides. In the end, I paid the six dollars and twenty-five cents, to which, by some strange manipulation, the post office official had reduced the charges and carried the object of controversy home to Calle Flores. These small countries of tropical America remind one less of nations than of groups of polite bandits who have taken possession of a few mountains and valleys that they may levy tribute on whoever falls into their hands. All of them have imitated larger powers by enacting a protective tariff, 
without even the scant excuse that there has been bloated into a reason for it in other lands, for here there is no industry to protect. Here it is not the lobbies of large financial interests that are back of the movement, but the politicians who constitute the government. The tariffs are for revenue only, largely for the pockets of the politicians themselves. We of more powerful nations hardly realize what it means to live in so small a country as Ecuador, until it is brought home by some such incident as hearing the entire Congress debating several hours on the question of whether two new electric light bulbs shall or shall not be placed in front of the government palace. Religiously, Quito is still in the Middle Ages. Looked down upon from any point of vantage, it has the aspect of an ecclesiastical capital. It would scarcely be an exaggeration to say that half the city is taken up by the church. Besides its many bulking temples and innumerable chapels, enormous sections of the town are swallowed up within the confines of convents and monasteries. The largest is San Francisco, reputed the most extensive in America. The Franciscans got in on the ground floor in Quito. The ink with which the city was founded was barely dry when three monks of that order arrived afoot and breathless from Guayaquil to be given an immense grant of land running far up the flanks of Pinchincha. The great stone cloisters were a century in building, a veritable Chinese wall of bricks backed by clustered hovels of the poor enclosing what would have been six city blocks, and the holdings of the order in haciendas and other rich properties spread far and wide over Ecuador. During the eruption of Pinchincha in 1575, the Franciscans won the perennial worship of the masses by the simple method of raising aloft the hostia and commanding the flow of lava to cease, and continuing to hold it aloft until the command was obeyed. Today, they still loll under such withered laurels. Two youths of Quito's best families accompanied me to San Francisco. A monk in brown greeted my companions as befitted their high rank and potential power of beneficence, yet with an undercurrent of insincerity and of dislike for these sons of liberals, which he was unable wholly to conceal. We passed through several flowery patios, musical with fountains and surrounded by pillared arcades, off which opened large vaulted chambers to an Elysian orchard under the trees of which a score of well-fed, well-slept monks strolled in pastoral contentment far from the hubbub and cares of the modern world. Cigarette butts littered the floor of a kiosk in the center. Scarcely a face was to be seen in which the signs of frequent debauch could not plainly be read. The walls and ceilings of the adjoining church were so covered with gold that the imagination harked back to the ransom of Atahualpa. My companions whispered that an American had recently offered fifteen thousand dollars for the privilege of removing what remained of the genuine metal, promising to regild the church so expertly that the transaction would never be detected. The offer had been considered, but declined when some suspicion of the deal reached the public ear. The monks were still open to similar propositions, however. Over the door of a monastery hung an old painting of Maria Dolorosa by a famous Spanish artist. One of my companions, himself a painter of some ability, offered a tempting sum for permission to replace the dusty old thing with a brand new copy, and the impression left by a deal of murmuring and pantomime was that the offer would eventually be accepted. When we asked permission to climb to the tower for a view of the town, however, the monk gave us a quick sidelong glance and regretted that the Father Superior no longer permitted it. My companions exchanged winks, but found no opportunity to enlighten me until we had taken our ceremonious leave. Once outside, I learned, to my astonishment, 
that not merely foreigners resent having each night's sleep broken up into a series of detached naps by the unearthly din of Quito's church bells. A few months before, several young men of the well-to-do class had formed a conspiracy to taste the unknown luxury of one night of unbroken slumber, gaining admission on various pretexts to all the church towers of the city, the conspirators had stolen the badajos, clappers, I believe we call them in English, and got rid of them so effectively that few were ever discovered. The priests were distracted, until their faithful henchmen of the masses had replaced the pilfered property with pieces of railroad iron. Since then the church towers had been closed to the educated youth of the city. Not far from San Francisco rises the florid facade of La Campania. The Jesuits reached the present capital of Ecuador a bit later than many of their competitors, but they quickly overcame the handicap. They established the first boticias, or drug stores, and brooked no competition. Besides enormous tracts of the most fertile land in the colony, they were granted a monopoly of cattle breeding, and being free from taxes and the necessity of paying the king's share, and holding the Indians in virtual slavery at less than a nominal wage, most of which returned to their coffers in the form of church tithes and levies, they easily choked private competition and soon outdistanced in wealth even the Franciscans. Their expulsion from Spanish soil greatly reduced their power in holdings. Today, what was once a part of their monastery is occupied by the university and the national library, but they are still scarcely cramped for space. An Alsatian Jesuit, of an aesthetical cast of countenance in striking contrast to his Ecuadorian brothers, led me fearlessly even into the belfry. He was a plain-spoken man, for all his astuteness, or perhaps by reason of it, and openly bewailed the immorality of the native friars and what he called the silly superstitions of the people. The dormitories of the boarding school within the monastery were divided into small cells by low wooden partitions covered with chicken wire, like the ten-cent lodging houses of Chicago. Before I had time, to put a question, the Alsatian explained, In these countries we must keep the boys locked in their own rooms at night for morality's sake. It is more than unusual in Latin America, but at least one enterprising pupil found it possible to work his way to the colegio of the Jesuit fathers of Quito. His fame was still green among the gilded youths of the city. By the rules of the institution, each student is required to go to confession once a week. The enterprising lad had long relieved his comrades of the unpleasant formality by impersonating each in turn before the perforated disc, at the equivalent of fifty cents a head. Merced, Corazon, Buen Pastor, San Augustin, Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, Carmen Antigua, Carmen Moderno, San Juan, to name all the orders that occupy huge spaces within the city of Quito would be like writing an ecclesiastical directory. Down at the end of the Calle Flores, the Dominicans dwell in a monastery little less extensive than that of the Franciscans. Their wealth may be surmised from the fact that in colonial days they held the monopoly of supplying all liquor used in divine worship throughout the colony. In the center of Plaza Santo Domingo is a statue of Sucre, companion of Bolivar in the wars of Spanish-American independence, a splendid bronze of an imaginary Hercules that should be set up in some gymnasium as a model, concerning which there runs a tale suggestive of local conditions. Soon after its erection, an Italian living far up the mountainside above the suburb of Huarico lost his pig. He tried every known means of recovering the animal, prayed to every available saint with any reputation for miracles, 
squandered his meager substance in burning candles before every shrine in Quito, and purchased many a priestly prayer. All in vain. The pig was not to be found. At length, a continuo, whether a wag or a sincere believer is not reported, whispered to the distracted Indian that the most powerful saint of all was the new one in the Plaza Santo Domingo. The credulous fellow lost no time on his way to the square, where he knelt with a lighted candle on either side of him before the pedestal of the hero of Ayacucho. When he looked up from his first invocation, he noted that the statue was pointing to the battlefield on which its original defeated the Spaniards, far up the slope of Pinchincha, which chanced also to be the location of the Indian's hut. He hurried homeward, and sure enough, found the pig in a hollow not far from his dwelling. Since then, St. Sucre has had a great vogue with the Indian populace of Quito. It would be out of place to enumerate the many proofs from personal experiences to matters of common knowledge, from national literature to frequent notorious scandals of the moral laxity of the Quiteno priesthood. Whatever they may be elsewhere, celibacy and the confessional are undeniably ill-chosen institutions for a race of Ecuadorian caliber. The non-Catholic would not dream of berating the churchman in any such terms as those which frequently fall from the lips of educated men of Quito. More than once I have heard a devout Quintena mother bewail the fact that she dare not send her daughter to confession, though convinced that the ceremony was requisite to the saving of her soul. One looks in vain for any connection whatever between religion and morality in this typical Andean capital. The sanctimonious old beatas, wrapped in their black mantos, who haunt the churches and accompany every religious procession with tears of hysterical ecstasy coursing down their cheeks, are not infrequently procurers and go-betweens of the human vultures that dwell in, as well as out of, the monasteries. The street walkers of Quito are almost all fervent mass goers. Scores of the same faces that peer invitingly out upon the passer-by at night may be seen next morning kneeling on the pavement of the cathedral or walking on their knees around the entire circle of plaster saints reciting a prayer formula before each. Nor is this hypocrisy. These victims see no incongruity between the evening's doings and the morning's occupation. To the masses, religion is a mixture of idol worship and the performance of fixed ceremonies, wholly divorced from their personal actions. The sins of daily life are wiped out by a quarter hour in the confessional, absolution is granted for the payment of a fee, and the performance of a set devotion. The brain cells where real morality might find a foothold are packed with absurd catechisms that leave no room for it, and of religion there remains nothing but unthinking costumbre and unreasoning fanaticism. Quito has been called the most fanatical town of South America. Among a score like it, the present archbishop tells the following story in his History of Ecuador. About two hundred years ago, someone broke into one of the churches and stole the sacred wafers, together with the gold ciborium in which they were kept. A few days later, the stolen property was found lying in the refuse of a ditch. Amid great weeping, a procession of the entire population bore the sacred emblem back to the church. For weeks, the whole town dressed in deepest mourning. The audencia gave all its attention and the police force all its efforts to running down those vile traitors, bestial swine, and venial sinners, as the gentle archbishop calls them, leaving little misdemeanors like robbery and murder to look after themselves. Not a clue was uncovered. At length, a famous Jesuit of the time preached a sermon that lashed the populace into such fervor 
that the congregation poured forth into the streets, beating themselves with chains and scourges, most of them men and women naked to the waist, I am quoting the archbishop, in a procession and religious fury that lasted from eight at night until two in the morning. A scapegoat was imperative. The officers of the audiencia, in peril of being themselves forced to assume that role, redoubled their efforts, and at length found some distance south of the city three Indians and a half-caste, who were reputed to have confessed to the nefarious crime. The four miscreants were brought back to the city, kicked about the streets by the populace, trussed up in chains in the church, while the priest preached a four-hour sermon on the most atrocious crime in the history of Quito, and were finally hanged, drawn, and quartered, and hung up, still dripping with blood, in sixteen parts of the town. The priests and their followers dug up a pot full of earth where the holy wafers had been found, and deposited it in a heavy vase of solid gold that is still one of the precious relics of the cathedral. Then they caused to be erected over the spot the chapel of Jerusalem, where it stands to this day. And, adds the archbishop, no feel faithful one will deny that they meet their just fate for so vile and unprecedented a sacrilege. Ah, but that was two centuries ago. True. But permit me to bring the fanaticism of Quito up to date. Less than a year before our arrival, the perennial struggle between the liberals and conservatives, the latter the church party, had broken out again in revolution. A queer-looking little man, with a white goatee sprouting from a mild-tempered chin, and wearing habitually a hat that would have been the envy of a slapstick comedian, had for years been president of Ecuador. He had stolen unusually little for a Latin American president, and had not allowed his friends to steal more than the average. Moreover, he had done the country much service, among other things, having induced an American to complete the railroad from the coast to Quito. Also, he had curtailed some of the unbridled graft of the church, and strangely enough, the church had resented that species of reform, and had turned the power of the conservatives against him. To be sure, the queer little man had objected to surrendering his office to a newly elected incumbent, but that is a common South American peccadillo. When the populace rose and drove him out, he went down to the coast and gathered an army of his fellow costeños. But luck had deserted him. After a few battles, he was captured, together with several sons, nephews, and henchmen. The conservatives were triumphant. The government ordered the captives to be sent up to Quito. The general in command at Guayaquil protested that such action was unsafe until the fury of the populace evaporated. The government assured him the danger was visionary and repeated the order. A special train was made up and set out on the long climb to the plateau. That was on a Saturday. Next morning a priest, noted for his virulent eloquence, preached a sermon that lashed the church-going masses into fury. At noon word came that the train had arrived, and the prisoners hurried by automobile to Panoptico, the wheel-shaped penitentiary up on the lower flanks of Pichincha. The populace quickly gathered. The bullet holes through the false stone walls of the dismal little mud cells in the narrow corners of which the prisoners crouched were still fresh when we wandered through the place months later. Among the most fanatical of the mob were the police, and those whose duty it was to guard the prison. In the excitement, some two-score prisoners escaped and joined the rioters. The little ex-president and his companions, dead or dying, were stripped naked, ropes were tied to their ankles, and they were dragged for hours to the cobbled streets of Quito, the frenzied populace raising echoes of the surrounding ranges with shouts of, Long live the church! Viva la Virgen Maria! I have two photographs taken by Don Jesus, 
nephew of my host, from the window of what was later my own room, as the bodies of the former president and his eldest son were passing. They showed a throng made up exclusively of cholos, those of mixed blood, who constitute the bulk of Quito's population. Not a white collar of the gente decente or the broad felt hat of an Indian is to be seen. On through the entire length of the city the barbaric procession continued. Near the plaza San Blas, a swarm of the lowest women in town descended with knives from their hovels and carried off gruesome mementos of the orgy. At length the mob reached the Edo, a broad green playground of Quito, where they hacked in pieces the bodies of the victims with machetes and whatever implement came to hand. Some carried to their huts as souvenirs the heads of the ex-president and his sons, from which they were recovered with difficulty only after the frenzy had died down and had been slept off. The rest was piled in heaps and burned. Such were los arrasteres, the draggings, to which the educated Quiteno refers, if at all, in shamed undertones. Quito is not so light of complexion as Bogota. Not merely is her percentage of Indian blood higher, but even those of unmixed European ancestry have a sallow or olive tint, and little of the color in their cheeks frequent in the more rigorous capital of Colombia. Negroes are unknown as residents. There is a careful gradation in caste, yet chiefly a void in place of what in other lands would be a middle class. The population is divided rather sharply between those brutalized from carrying ox loads on their backs and those who remain soft and effeminate from careful avoidance of any muscular exertion. For even the cholo is economically either Indian or white, depending on his wealth or occupation. To carry even a small package through the streets is to jeopardize one's standing as a member of the upper class. Don't hurry, a frock-tailed Catenio told me in all seriousness one day. People will think you are a copado, busy, that is, with vulgar work. It is customary to raise one's hat to every male acquaintance of your own class or above, to pause and shake hands with everyone considered your equal, to ask him how he has amanecido, donned, to inquire after his family individually, and to shake hands again before parting, and that as often as you meet him, though it be every half hour during the day. Americans who have lived long in South America have the hand-shaking habit chronically, the greeting or more exactly the acknowledgment of the greeting of one's inferior varies from a patronizing heartiness to the corner tailor to a half-audible grunt to an Indian. The latter is always addressed in the tu form, because, as one of my Beau Brummel acquaintances put it, there is no reason whatever to show any respect to the Indian. During several months' acquaintance I found no great reason to show any to the speaker, but that, perhaps, is beside the point. How wholly lacking the place is in genuine democracy is frequently illustrated. I was strolling in the Plaza Mayor one day, for instance, with the grandson of the Washington of Ecuador, a youth of American school training and of unusually high standards, when he stepped on the flagging surrounding the central monument. The cholo policeman on guard hesitated, but finally screwed up unusual courage and informed the youth in a courteous, not to say humble manner, that he had been ordered not to let anyone walk on the flagging. The descendant of Ecuador's founder turned a brilliant red, as if his noble house had been vilely insulted, then so white that his blonde hair seemed to become dark brown. He strode across to the officer, who was considerably larger than he, caught him by the coat, and all but jerked him off his feet. The policeman abjectly apologized. The best people of Quito do not realize that it is not the individual policeman, their inferior, giving them orders, 
but lawful and orderly society speaking through him. As in the days of Stevenson's travels, a century ago, the principal occupation of persons of rank is visiting their estates, particularly at harvest time. By far the greater portion of the year they spend in town, however, leaving their haciendas in charge of mayordomos, little acquainted with modern agricultural methods. The city has so few recreative attractions that it is hard for a man of education to avoid a more or less studious life, be it only as a pastime. Yet Quito does not even aspire to rival Bogota as the Athens of South America. Ecuador is not without her literature, but it has come from other towns more frequently than from the capital. The game of politics, not without its perils, engrosses the attention of many. Then, as in most Latin American countries, not a few dissipate their energies in the pursuit of pleasure of a rather specific kind. So assiduously does the average quiteno devote himself to this from early youth, that it is not strange that an old man of the sente class is rarely seen. There is considerable provincialism even among the best educated classes. I heard often such questions as, What is a sleigh? When is summer? The story is well vouched for that a congressman asked a colleague just back from abroad, can the man get to Europe in three weeks on a good mule? The women of the well-dressed class in Quito are less given to the display of mustaches than those of Bogota. Not a few are distinctly attractive, particularly in early youth. In later life, too many suggest in their features some years of a rather harrowing existence. Outspoken quiteños lay this condition at the door of the priests and friars, but mere economic pressure probably plays at least as considerable a part. The upkeep of so many enormous ecclesiastical institutions cannot but drain the resources of so stagnant a city. Wealth does not abound, and feminine opportunity to earn a livelihood is narrowly restricted. It is not strange, then, if more than one family still rated in the gente decente class remains with no other barrier against starvation than the youthful freshness of its daughters. In most parts of the world, a glance suffices to distinguish a woman of public life from her respected sisters. In Quito, it is not so easy. Indeed, there seems to be no hard and fast line between the two classes. Certain undercurrents suggest a tacit admission that some families have only one means of tiding over their existence until a lucky turn of politics or of the lottery wheel sets them on their feet again. Then, if the girl's career has not been too public, she may be bestowed on a husband of a somewhat lower social level. Let me not leave the impression of a general laxity among the women of Quito. The sheltered daughters of the most responsible classes are models of modesty and domesticity, but he who dwells any length of time in the city would be blind to overlook certain facts, be they the result of an impoverished society or more directly fostered by those ecclesiastical elements to whom the embittered men of higher rank charge them. Thus far I have said little of the, if not most numerous, at least most conspicuous class in Quito, the Indian. Ignoring the very considerable number in whose veins runs a greater or less percentage of aboriginal blood, those in whom it is still without admixture make up perhaps forty percent of the population and give the city most of its color. There is not a house in town, from the bright yellow three-story adobe dwelling of the president, down without its Indians, family servants, and burden bearers, huddled in the mud cells about the cobbled patio of the lower story, or homeless wretches who lie by night in any unoccupied corner and pick up a precarious existence by day in competition with donkeys and pack animals. Their earth-floored kennels form the tassel ends of almost every street. They scatter out along all the highways 
and dot the flanks of every range and mountain spur in the vicinity. If they have changed since the conquest, it is for the worse. In habits and condition, they vary scarcely at all from those of the dreary Andean villages through which we had passed. Theirs is a purely animal existence. They have not the faintest notion of any line between filth and cleanliness, avoiding only that which is obviously poison, by an instinct common to the lower animals. I have seen them drink water I am sure a thirsty horse would not touch, and that despite the fact that fresh water was to be had a few yards away. They literally never wash so much as a finger, except on some occasion as a church fiesta, when they may pause at a pool or mud hole on the edge of town to scrub their feet with a stone. They speak a debauched dialect of Quichua, the tongue of the Incas, mixed with some words of the conquered Caras, though all understand Spanish, or at least the Indian Spanish spoken in Quito. Many consider the Andean Indian a debased Mongolian type, a theory not without its basis in his features. In a curious old book of the National Library of Ecuador, the History of the Kingdom of Quito, written in 1789, the Jesuit Padre Velasco takes up the question of the origin of the Indians and settles it, at least to his own satisfaction. To begin with, the Church has declared the inhabitants of the New World rational, that is, descended from Adam and Eve. That point being disposed of, it follows that the men and animals who were found in America must be descendants of those who emerged from Noah's Ark. For does not the Bible say that all the world was covered with water? Even granted for the sake of argument, continues the razor-minded Padre, that the mountains of South America protruded a bit above the surface of those waters. Is it conceivable that man could live for months on the highest peaks, eating snow, drinking snow, and sleeping in snow? Could he even have stood up for nearly a year on those pyramids of snow and ice? I give it up. Ask some polar explorer. What then remains of the argument of those who still cling to the autochthonous heresy? Obviously, there is no other recourse than to admit that the ancestors of the race found their way to America by the Bering Strait, or across the Pacific, from the shores of Asia. End of chapter 6, part 1. Recorded by Elliot Swanson.